The Damned Thing by Ambrose Bierce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Casey. The Damned Thing by Ambrose Bierce. By the light of a tallow candle which had been placed on one end of a rough table, a man was reading something written in a book. It was an old account book greatly worn, and the writing was not apparently very legible, for the man sometimes held the page close to the flame of the candle to get a stronger light upon it. The shadow of the book would then throw into obscurity a half of the room, darkening a number of faces and figures, for besides the reader eight other men were present. Seven of them sat against the rough log walls, silent and motionless, and, the room being small, not very far from the table. By extending an arm, any one of them could have touched the eighth man, who lay on the table, face upward, partly covered by a sheet, his arms at his sides. He was dead. The man with the book was not reading aloud, and no one spoke. All seemed to be waiting for something to occur, the dead man only with, without expectation. From the blank darkness outside came in, through the aperture that served for a window, all the ever unfamiliar noises of the night in the wilderness. The long, nameless note of a distant coyote, the stilly, pulsing thrill of tireless insects and trees, strange cries of night birds, so different from those of the birds of the day, the drone of great blundering beetles, and all that mysterious chorus of small sounds that always seem to have been but half heard when they have suddenly ceased, as if conscious of indiscretion. But nothing of all this was noted in that company. Its members were not overmuch addicted to idle interest in matters of no practical importance. That was obvious in every line of their rugged faces, obvious even in the dim light of the single candle. They were evidently men of the vicinity, farmers and woodmen. The person reading was a trifle different. One would have said of him that he was of the world, worldly, albeit there was that in his attire which attested a certain fellowship with the organisms of his environment. His coat would hardly have passed muster in San Francisco. His footgear was not of urban origin, and the hat that lay by him on the floor, who was the only one uncovered, was such that if one had considered it as an article of mere personal adornment, he would have missed its meaning. In countenance, the man was rather prepossessing, with just a hint of sternness though that he may have assumed or cultivated as appropriate to one in authority, for he was a coroner. It was by virtue of his office that he would, had possession of the book in which he was reading. It had been found among the dead man's effects in his cabin, where the inquest was now taking place. When the coroner had finished reading, he put the book into his breast pocket. At that moment the door was pushed open and a young man entered. He, clearly, was not of mountain birth and breeding. He was clad as those who dwell in cities. His clothing was dusty, however, as from travel. He had, in fact, been riding hard to attend the inquest. The coroner nodded. No one else greeted him. "'We've waited for you,' said the coroner. "'It is necessary to have done with this business tonight.' The young man smiled. "'I'm sorry to have kept you,' he said. "'I went away not to evade your summons, but to post to my newspaper an account of what I suppose I am called back to relate.' The coroner smiled. The account that you posted to your newspaper, he said, differs probably from that which you will give here under oath. That, replied the other, rather hotly and with visible flush, is as you choose. I used manifold paper and have a copy of what, was, what I sent. It was not written as news, for it is incredible, but as fiction. It may go as part of my testimony under oath. But you say it is incredible. That is nothing to you, sir, if I also swear that it is true. The coroner was apparently not greatly affected by the young man's manifest resentment. He was silent for some moments, his eyes upon the floor. The men about the sides of the cabin talked in whispers, but seldom withdrew their gaze from the face of the corpse. Presently the coroner lifted his eyes and said, We will resume the inquest. The men removed their hats. The witness was sworn. What is your name? the coroner asked. William Harker, age, 27. You knew the deceased, Hugh Morgan? Yes. You were with him when he died. Near him. How did that happen, your presence, I mean? I was visiting him at this place to shoot and fish. A part of my purpose, however, was to study him, 
in his odd, solitary way of life. He seemed a good model for a character in fiction. I sometimes write stories. I sometimes read them. Thank you. Stories in general, not yours. Some of the jurors laughed. Against a somber background, humor shows highlights. Soldiers in the intervals of battle laugh easily, and it... The death chamber conquers by surprise. Relate the circumstances of this man's death, said the coroner. You may use any notes or memoranda that you please. The witness understood. Pulling a manuscript from his breast pocket, he held it near the candle, and turning the leaves until he found the passage that he wanted, began to read. The sun had hardly risen when we left the house. We were looking for quail, each with a shotgun, but we only had one dog. Morgan said that our best ground was beyond a certain ridge that he pointed out, and we crossed it by a trail through the chaparral. On the other side was comparatively level ground, thickly covered with wild oats. As we emerged from the chaparral, Morgan was but a few yards in advance. Suddenly heard, at a little distance to our right and partly in front, a noise as of some animal thrashing about in the bushes, which we could see were violently agitated. We've startled a deer, I said. I wish I had brought a rifle. Morgan, who had stopped and was intently watching the agitated chaparral, said nothing, but had cocked both barrels of his gun and was holding it in readiness to aim. I thought him a trifle excited, which surprised me, for he had a reputation for exceptional coolness, even in moments of sudden and imminent peril. Oh, come, I said. You're not going to fill up a deer with quail shot, are you? Still, he did not reply but catching a sight of his face as he turned it slightly toward me, I was struck by the pallor of it. Then I understood that we had serious business at hand, and my first conjecture was that we had jumped a grizzly. I advanced to Morgan's side, cocking my piece as I moved. The bushes were now quiet, and the sounds had ceased, but Morgan was as attentive to the place as before. "'What is it? What the devil is it?' I asked. "'That damned thing,' he replied, without turning his head. His voice was husky and unnatural. He trembled visibly. I was about to speak further when I observed the wild oats near the place of the disturbance moving in the most inexplicable way. I can hardly describe it. It seemed as if stirred by a streak of wind, which not only bent it, but pressed it down, crushed it so that it did not rise, and this movement was slowly prolonging itself directly toward us. Nothing that I had ever seen had affected me so strangely as this unfamiliar and unaccountable phenomenon yet I am unable to recall any sense of fear. I remember, and tell it here because singularly enough I re recollected it then, that once, in looking carelessly out an open window, I momentarily mistook a small tree close at hand for one of a group of larger trees at a little distance away. It looked the same size as the others, but being more distinctly and sharply defined in mass and detail, seemed out of harmony with them. It was a mere falsification of the law of aerial perspective, but it startled, almost terrified me. We so rely on orderly operation of familiar natural laws that any seeming suspension of them is noted as a menace to our safety, a warning of unthinkable calamity. So now the apparently causeless movement of the herbage and the slow, undeviating approach of the line of disturbance were distinctly disquieting. My companion appeared actually frightened and I could hardly credit my senses when I saw him suddenly throw his gun to his shoulders and fire both barrels at the agitated grass. Before the smoke of the discharge had cleared away, I heard a loud, savage cry, a scream like that of a wild animal, and flinging his gun upon the ground, Morgan sprang away and ran swiftly from the spot. At the same instant, I was thrown violently to the ground by the impact of something unseen in the smoke, some soft, heavy substance that seemed thrown against me with great force. Before I could get upon my feet and recover my gun, which seemed to have been struck from my hands, I heard Morgan crying out, as if in mortal agony, and mingling with his cries were such hoarse, savage sounds as one hears from fighting dogs. Inexpressibly terrified, I struggled to my feet and looked in the direction of Morgan's retreat, and may heaven and mercy spare me from another sight like that. At a distance of less than thirty yards was my friend, down upon one knee, his head thrown back at a frightful angle hatless, his long hair in disorder, and his whole body in violent movement from side to side, backward and forward. His right arm was lifted and seemed to lack the hand. At least, I could see none. The other arm was invisible. At times, as my memory now reports this extraordinary scene, I could discern but a part of his body. It was as if he had been partly blotted out, 
I cannot otherwise express it. Then a shifting of his position would bring it all into view again. All this must have occurred within a few seconds. Yet in that time Morgan assumed all the postures of a determined wrestler vanquished by superior weight and strength. I saw nothing but him, and him not always distinctly. During the entire incident his shouts and curses were heard as though through an enveloping uproar of such sounds of rage and fury as I had never heard from the throat of a man or brute. For a moment only I stood resolutely, then, throwing down my gun, I ran toward my friend's assistance. I had a vague belief that he was suffering from a fit or some form of convulsion. Before I could reach his side he was down and quiet. All sounds had ceased, but with a feeling of such terror as even these awful events had not inspired, I now saw the same mysterious movement of the wild oats prolonging itself from the trampled area about the prostrate man toward the edge of a wood. It was only when it had reached the wood that I was able to withdraw my eyes and look upon my companion. He was dead. The coroner rose from his seat and stood beside the dead man. Lifting the edge of the sheet, he pulled it away, exposing the entire body, altogether naked, and showing in the candlelight a clay-like yellow. It had, however, broad maculation of bluish black, obviously caused by extravasated blood from contusions. The chest and sides looked as if they had been beaten with a bludgeon. There were dreadful lacerations. The skin was torn in strips and shreds. The coroner moved round to the end of the table and undid a silk handkerchief, which had been passed under the chin and knotted on the top of the head. When the handkerchief was drawn away, it exposed what had been the throat. Some of the jurors who had risen to get a better view repented their curiosity and turned away their faces. Witness Harker went to the open window and leaned across the sill, faint and sick. Dropping the handkerchief upon the dead man's neck, the coroner stepped to an angle of the room, and from a pile of clothing produced one garment after another, each of which he held up for a moment for inspection. All were torn and stiff with blood. The jurors did not make a closer inspection. They seemed rather uninterested. They had, in truth, seen all this before, the only thing that was new to them being Harker's testimony. Gentlemen, the coroner said, we have no more evidence, I think. Your duty has already been explained to you. If there is nothing you wish to ask, you may go outside and consider your verdict. The foreman rose, a tall, bearded man of sixty, coarsely clad. I should like to ask one question, Mr. Coroner, he said. What asylum did this year last witness escape from? Mr. Harker, said the coroner gravely and tranquilly, from what asylum did you last escape? Harker flushed crimson again, but said nothing, and the seven jurors rose and solemnly filed out of the cabin. "'If you have done insulting me, sir,' said Harker, as soon as he and the officer were left alone with the dead man, "'I suppose I am at liberty to leave.' "'Yes.' Harker started to leave, but paused, with his hand on the door-latch. The habit of his profession was strong in him, stronger than his sense of personal dignity. He turned about and said, "'The book that you have there.' I recognize it as Morgan's diary. You seem greatly interested in it. You read it while I was testifying. May I see it? The public would like. The book will cut no figure in this matter, replied the official, slipping it into his coat pocket. All the entries in it were made before the writer's death. As Harker passed out of the house, the jury re-entered and stood about the table on which the now-covered corpse showed under the sheet with sharp definition. The foreman seated himself near the candle, produced from his breast pocket a pencil and scrap of paper, and wrote, rather laboriously, the following verdict, which, with various degrees of effort, all signed. We, the jury, do find that the remains come to their death at the hands of a mountain lion, but some of us thinks all the same they had fits. In the diary of the late Hugh Morgan are certain interesting entries, having, possibly, a scientific value as suggestions. At the inquest upon his body, the book was not put into evidence, Possibly the coroner thought it not worth while to confuse the jury. The date of the first entries mentioned cannot be ascertained. The upper left part of the leaf is torn away. The part of the entry remaining is as follows. Quote, would run in a half circle, keeping his head turned always toward the center, and again he would stand still, barking furiously. At last he ran away into the brush as fast as he could go. I thought at first that he had gone mad, but upon returning to the house found no alteration in his manner than that was obviously due to fear of punishment. Quote, Can a dog see with his nose? Do odors impress some olfactory center with images of the thing emitting them? 
quote, September 2nd. Looking at the stars last night as they rose above the crest of the ridge east of the house, I observed them successively disappear from left to right. Each was eclipsed but an instant, and only a few at the same time, but along the entire length of the ridge, all that were within a degree or two of the crest were blotted out. It was as if something had passed along between them and me, but I could not see it, and the stars were not thick enough to define its outline. Ugh, I don't like this. End quote. Several weeks' entries are missing, three leaves being torn from the book. September 27th. It has been about here again. I find evidences of its presence every day. I watched again all of last night in the same cover, gun in hand, double charged with buckshot. In the morning the fresh footprints were there as before. Yet I would have sworn that I did not sleep. Indeed, I hardly sleep at all. It is terrible, insupportable. If these amazing experiences are real, I shall go mad. If they are fanciful, I am mad already. October 3. I shall not go. It shall not drive me away. No, this is my house, my land. God hates a coward. October 5. I can stand it no longer. I have invited Harker to pass a few weeks with me. He has a level head. I can judge from his manner if he thinks me mad. October 7. I have the solution to the problem. It came to me last night suddenly as if by revelation. How simple. How terribly simple. There are sounds that we cannot hear. At either end of the scale are notes that stir no chord of that imperfect instrument, the human ear. They are too high or too grave. I have observed a flock of black birds occupying an entire treetop, the tops of several trees, and all in full song. Suddenly, in a moment, at absolutely the same instant, all spring into the air and fly away. How? They could not all see one another. The whole treetops intervened. At no point could a leader have been visible to all. There must have been a signal of warning or command, high and shrill above the din, but by me unheard. I have observed, too, the simultaneously fight when all were silent, among not only blackbirds but other birds, quail, for example, widely separated by bushes, even on opposite sides of a hill. It is known to seamen that a school of whales basking or sporting on the surface of the ocean miles apart, with the convexity of the earth between them, will sometimes dive at the same instant all gone out of the sight in a moment. The signal has been sounded, too grave for the ear of the sailor at the masthead and his comrades on the deck, who nevertheless feel its vibrations in the ship as the stones of the cathedral are stirred by the bass of the organ. As with sound, so with colors. At each end of the solar spectrum the chemist can detect the presence of what are known as actinic rays. They represent colors, integral colors of the composition of light, which we are unable to discern. The human eye is an imperfect instrument. Its range is but a few octaves of the real chromatic scale. I'm not mad. There are colors that we cannot see. And God help me, the damned thing is of such a color. End of The Damned Thing Recording by Tim Casey Modesto, California The Cuckoo Clock by Wesley Barefoot This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Casey The Cuckoo Clock by Wesley Barefoot You know a murderer preys on your household, lives with you, depends on you, and you have no defense. Death wore the seeming of a battered Chevrolet. The child's scream and the screech of rubber on concrete knifed through two seconds of time before snapping, like a celery stalk of sound, into aching silence. The silence of limbo called into being for the space of a slow heartbeat. Then the thud of running feet, the rising hubbub of many voices. Give her air! Keep back! Don't try to move her! Somebody call an ambulance! Yeah, and somebody call a cop, too! I couldn't help it. It was the driver of the ramshackle Chevy. She fell off the curb right in front of me. Honest to God, it wasn't my fault. Got to report these things anyway, said the gray-haired man beside him. No cause to worry if you aren't to blame. Probably no brakes, said a heavily accented voice, and another spoke as if on cue. Probably no insurance either. Let me through. Oh, please, 
The woman's voice was on the edge of hysteria. She came through the crowd like an automaton. Not seeing the people, she shoved aside and elbowed. D.O.A., said the woman heavily, her face no longer twisted with shock, and she was almost pretty again. D.O.A., dead on arrival it means. Oh, Jim, I never knew they said that. Suddenly there were tears in her blue eyes. There had been many tears now. Take it easy, Jean Hun. Jim Blair hoisted his lank six feet out of the old rocker and crossed the room, running a nervous hand through his cornshuck hair. She's only thirty, he thought, and I'm three years older. That's awfully young to have bred three kids and lost them. He took her in his arms. I know how tough it is. It's bad for me and probably worse for you. But at least we're sure they'll never be bomb fodder, and we still have Joanna. She twisted away from him, her voice suddenly bitter. Don't give me that Pollyanna stuff, Jim. Goody, goody, only a broken leg. It might have been your back. There's no use trying to whitewash it. Our kids, our own kids, all gone, dead. She began to sob. I wish I were too. Jean, Jean, I don't care. I mean it. Everything bad has happened since Joanna came to live with us. Darling, you can't blame the child for a series of accidents. I know, she raised her tear-stained face. But after all, Michael drowned, then Steve falling off the water tower. Now it's Marion. Her fingers gripped his arm tightly. Jim, each of them was playing alone with Joanna when it happened. Accidents, just accidents, he said. It wasn't like Jean, this talk. Almost, his mind shied away from the word and circled back, almost paranoid. But Jean was stable, rational, always had been. Still, maybe a little chat with Dr. Holland would be a good idea. Breakdowns do happen. They both turned at the slamming of the screen door. Then came the patter of childish feet on the kitchen linoleum, and Joanna burst into the room. Mommy, I want to play with Marion. Why can't I play with Marion? Jean put her arm around the girl's thin shoulder. Darling, you won't be able to play with Marion for... for quite a while. You mustn't worry about it now. Mommy! She looked just like she was asleep. Then they came and took her away, her lips trembled. I'm frightened, Mommy. Jim looked down at the dark eyes, misted now, the straight brown hair and the little snub nose with the dusting of freckles. She's all we have left, poor kid, and not even ours, really. Helen's baby. He looked up as the battered cuckoo clock on the mantel clicked warningly. Time for little girls to be in bed, Joanna. Run along now like a good girl and get washed. Even as he spoke, the miniature doors flew open, and the character of a bird popped out, shrilly announcing the hour. It cuckooed eight times, then bounced back inside. Joanna watched, entranced. Bedtime, darling, said Jean gently. School tomorrow, remember? And don't forget to brush your teeth. I won't. Good night, Mommy. Good night, Daddy. She turned up her face to be kissed, smiled at them, and was gone. They listened to her footsteps on the stairs. Jim... I'm sorry about the things I said. Jean's voice was hesitant, a little ashamed. It is hard, though. You know it is. Jim, aren't you listening? After all, you don't have to watch the clock now. Her smile was labored at the joke. He smiled back. I think I'll take a walk, honey. Some fresh air would do me good. Jim, don't go. I'd rather not be alone just now. Well, he looked at her, keeping his expression blank. All right, dear. How about some coffee? I could stand another cup. And he thought, tomorrow I'll go talk to Dr. Holland. Tomorrow. Let me get this straight, Jim. Holland's pudgy face was sober, his eyes serious. He started out by thinking Jane was showing paranoid tendency, and offhand I'm inclined to agree with you. Overnight you changed your mind and began thinking maybe, just maybe, she might be right. Honestly, don't you suspect your own reasons for such a quick switch? Sure I do, Bob, Blair said worriedly. Do you think I haven't beaten my brains over it? I know the idea is monstrous, but just suppose there was a branch of humanity, if you could call it human, living off us unsuspected, a branch that knows how to eliminate competition almost by instinct. Now hold on a minute, Jim. 
You've taken Jean's reaction to this last death, plus a random association with a cuckoo clock, and here you are with a perfectly wild hypothesis. You've always been rational and analytical, old man. Surely you can realize that a perfectly normal urge to rationalize Jean's conclusions is making you concur with them against your better judgment. Bob! I'm not through, Jim. Just consider how fantastic the whole idea is. Because of a series of accidents, you can't accuse a child of planned murder. Nor can you further hypothesize that all orphans are changelings, imbued with an instinct to polish off their foster siblings. Not all orphans, Bob. Not planned murder, either. Take it easy. Just some of them. A few of them. Different. Growing up, placing their young with well-to-do families somehow, and then dropping off unobtrusively out of the picture. And the young growing up, and always the natural children dying off in one way or another. The changeling inherits and the process is repeated, step by step. Can you say it's impossible? Do you know it's impossible? I wouldn't say impossible, Jim, but I would say that your thesis has a remarkably low index of probability. Why don't others suspect, besides you? Jim spread his hands hopelessly. I don't know, maybe they do. Maybe these creatures, if they do exist, have some means of protection we don't know about. You need more than maybes, Jim. What about Joanna Simmons' mother? According to your theory, she should have been well off. Was she? No, she wasn't, Jim admitted reluctantly. She came here and took a job with my outfit, said she was divorced and had lived in New York. Then she quit to take a position in California, and we agreed to board Joanna till she got settled. Warrenburg was the town. She was killed there quite horribly in a terrible auto accident. Have you any reasons for suspecting skullduggery? Honestly, Jim, or for labeling her one of your human, um, cuckoos? Only my hunch. We had a newspaper clipping and a letter from the coroner. We even sent money for her funeral, but those co things could have been faked, Bob. Give me some evidence that they were faked, and I'll be happy to re-inspect re your views. Holland levered his avoirdupois out of his chair. In the meantime, relax. Take a trip if you can. Try not to worry. Jim grinned humorlessly. Mustn't let myself get excited, eh? Okay, Bob. But if I get a hold of any evidence that I think you might accept, I'll be back. The last laugh and all that. Pending developments, you take it easy, too. Don't let yourself get overworked. Stay out of the sun. So long now. So long, Jim. It was cool in the Warrenburg City Hall, though outside the streets were sizzling. Sorry, Mr. Blair, said the stout motherly woman with the horn-rimmed glasses. We've no record of a Helen Simmons, nothing whatever. She closed the file with resolute finality. Jim stared at her. Are you sure? There must be something. Mightn't there be a special file for accident cases? She was here in Warrenburg. She died here. The woman thinned her lips, shook her head. If we had any information, it'd be right where I looked. There isn't a thing. Have you tried her last address? Maybe they could tell you something. We can't. I'll try that next. Thanks a lot. Sorry we couldn't help you. He went out slowly. 872 Maple was a rambling frame house, dozing on a wide flower-bordered lot. There was nothing sleepy about the diminutive woman who opened the door to Jim's knock. Snapping black eyes peered at him from a maze of wrinkles. A veined hand moved swiftly to smooth down the white hair that framed her face. Looking for someone, young man? Just information, Mrs. Collins. And it's Miss. Don't give out information about guests. You a bill collector? No, Miss Collins. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to check up on an old friend I lost track of. Helen Simmons. She lived at this address for a while. Sure did. Well, come on in, mind you. I usually don't do this, Mr. Blair. Without any fanfare, a bill changed hands. Mr. Blair, well, I can't tell you much. Try that green chair for size. What do you want to know? Jim studied the toe of his right shoe. His eyes were veiled. Heard she was hurt and hard up, and I was worried. My wife and I were friends with hers back east. Hurt? Hard up? Humph. Not likely. Spending all our time driving that English car around. Taking trips. Not saying she didn't mind her manners, though. Did she have any close friends? She was chummy with Edith Walton, the girl that works for Doc Mandel. He's the county coroner in his spare time. No, man. Didn't fool around at all, I'd have known. Behind Jim's stony eyes, the pattern took clearer form. 
as if a mosaic approached completion, a mosaic of carefully planned events that totaled horror. He shivered as the outline of his hunch filled in. Helen? What creature were these? Helen, not dead, not poor, carefully planting ostensible proof of her death and going on to a new role, a new life, in London or Paris or Rome, a free, untrammeled life, and her child, if child was the word, in his home, repeating the pattern, eliminating competition as her mother had undoubtedly done. The competition, his and Jean's children, changeling, changeling, no, not that, incubus. Rabbits on your grave, Mr. Blair? He looked up slowly. Sorry, I was just wondering, did Miss Simmons have a job while she was here? No, she didn't. One thing she did do was rent a place. Used to be Bland's Hardware. Paid a month's rent, too. Said some friends of hers were planning to open a mortuary. Seemed like a funny way for people to do business. But then, no affair of mine. Funny? No, not funny at all, but icily, eerily logic. There had to be an undertaking parlor where he could send the funeral expenses. He wondered if Helen had laughed when she opened the letter. Everyone. His or her own undertaker. And then the carefully cultivated friend in the coroner's office. For stationary. He got to his feet. Thanks a lot, Miss Collins. You've been a great deal of help. He almost smiled as he asked. I don't suppose she left a forwarding address. The old head shook decisively. Not a thing. Just packed and left one Monday morning. All the loose ends tied up tight on a Monday morning. Nothing to cause suspicion, nothing to worry about. Only a woman's almost paranoid hysteria and a glance at a clock. Not very much to unmask. Incubus. And what could he do? What could he do? Start talking and land in an institution? Well, there was one thing. Thanks again, Miss Collins. He went out. Swanson didn't look like the general conception of a small-time newspaper man. One knew instinctively that his beard wouldn't have been tobacco-stained, even if he'd cared to grow one. And he didn't have a bottle of bourbon in the file marked miscellaneous. Or if he did, he didn't bring it out. That never came from my paper, he said precisely. He handed the clipping back to Jim. We don't use that type, for one thing. For another, Miss Simmons, as far as I know, wasn't killed here or anywhere else. You knew her? I knew of her. Never met her. What about this report of her death? Swanson shrugged, tented manicured fingers. It's a hoax. Any job printing shop with linotype could do it. In all likelihood, it was some place in San Francisco. That's closest. It would be very difficult to check. His curiosity was showing. I see. Well, thanks for your time and trouble, Mr. Swanson. Not at all. Sorry I couldn't be of more help. One thing to do, one thing that must be done. Motors over the mountains, and riding with them, the, the numb resolve. Motors over the salt pans, the wheat lands, the corn belt. The stewardess stops again. Coffee, sir? A sandwich, perhaps? I beg your... Oh, no thanks. She watches him covertly, uneasily, longing for the end of the run. Motors in the night, and the dull determination, growing, strengthening. The airport, baggage the ancient taxi with the piston slap, and at last the dark, familiar street. Jim, you're back! Oh, Jim, darling, next time they send you west, I'm going too, I am. Okay, Jean, sure, why not? What's the matter, dear? Oh, you're tired, of course. I should have known. Sit down, Jim, let me get you a drink. In a minute, Jean. Do it now, now, now! Where's Joanna? She's in bed, hours ago. Jim, has something? Nothing, dear. I just want to look in on her and freshen up a bit, of course. Jim? He smoothed away the worried frown with his forefinger. In a minute, dear. She smiled uncertainly. Hurry back, Jim. The stairs unwind irrevocably, slow motion in a nightmare. The bedroom door opens. The hall light dim on the bed and the child's face, incubus in the half-dark. For a moment, Jim remembered, wondering, somewhere, sometime, what strange powers of protection might be implicit in such a creature. As the thought came into his mind, Joanna stirred. She opened her eyes and looked at him. He took one step toward the bed. The little girl eyes, over their dusting of freckles, slitted. Then they opened wide, came two glowing golden lakes that grew and grew. There was a feeling of a great soundless explosion in his mind waves of cool burning in his brain. 
turning and bubbling in every unknown corner, every cranny, here and there a cell, or a group of cells, blanked out, the complex molecules reverting, becoming new again, ready for fresh punch marks, synapses shorted with soundless cold fire and waited in timeless stasis for rechanneling. The waves frothed, became ripples, were gone. He stood unmoving. What was it he was supposed to do? Let's see. Tuck Joanna's blanket around her, but she was covered up snugly, sleeping soundly, too, and for a few seconds he thought she was awake. And Jean was waiting downstairs. Jean, and a cool drink. Oh, yes, stop in the bathroom. The stairs wind up again. It is good to be with one's family, relaxed in the well-known chair, not a worry in the world. He sat there, his mind at ease, not caring much about anything. He didn't even look up when the clock on the mantel whirred, and the ridiculous bird popped out of its nest to herald a new day. End of The Cuckoo Clock by Wesley Barefoot Recording by Timothy Casey Modesto, California The Phantom Army Seen in France by Herewood Carrington this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Phantom Army Seen in France by Herewood Carrington History abounds in cases showing the apparent intrusion of spiritual help in time of trouble, and in the annals of military history these accounts are not lacking. On several occasions the crusaders thought that they saw angelic hosts fighting for them, phantom horsemen charging the enemy, when their own utter destruction seemed imminent. In the wars between the English and the Scots several such cases were cited, and the Napoleonic Wars also furnished examples, but the most striking evidence of this character, because of the newest, and supported apparently by a good deal of first-hand and sincere testimony, is that afforded by the phantom armies seen in France during the retreat of the British army from Mons, the field of Argincourt. Cut off by overwhelming numbers and all but annihilated, the British army fought desperately, but the 80,000 were opposed by 300,000 Germans. Backed by terrific fire of artillery, and when indeed in a critical position, they were only saved, as we know, by the heroism of a small force of men, a rear guard, who were practically wiped out in consequence. At the most critical moment came what appeared to be angelic assistance. The tide of battle seemed to be stemmed by supernatural means. In a letter written by a soldier who actually witnessed these startling events, quoted by the Honourable Mrs. St. John Mildmay, North American Review, August 1915, the following graphic account is given. Our soldier writes, the men joked at the shells and found many funny names for them and had bets about them and greeted them with musical songs as they screamed in the terrific cannonade. The climax seemed to have been reached, but a seven times heated hell of the enemy's onslaught fell upon them, rending brother from brother. At that very moment they saw from their trenches a tremendous host moving against their lines. Five hundred of the thousand who had been detailed to fight the rearguard action, remained, and as far as they could see the German infantry was pressing on against them, column by column, a grey world of men, ten thousand of them, as it appeared afterwards. There was no hope at all. Some of them shook hands. One man improvised a new version of the battle song Tipperary, ending, and we shan't get there, and all went on firing steadily. The enemy dropped line after line, while a few machine guns did their best. Everyone knew it was of no use. The dead grey bodies lay in companies and battalions, but others came on and on, swarming and advancing from beyond and beyond. World without end, amen, said one of the British soldiers with some irreverence, as he took aim and fired. Then he remembered a vegetarian restaurant in London, where he had once or twice eaten queer dishes of cutlets made of lentils and nuts that pretended to be steaks. On all the plates in this restaurant a figure of St. George was printed in blue with the motto, Ad sit Anglis Sanctus Georgius, may St. George be a present help to England. 
The soldier happened to know Latin and other useless things, so now, as he fired at the grey advancing mass three hundred yards away, he uttered the pious vegetarian motto. He went on firing to the end, till at last Bill, on his right, had to clout him cheerfully on the head to make him stop, pointing out as he did so that the king's ammunition cost money and was not likely to be wasted. For as the Latin scholar uttered his invocation, he felt something between a shudder and an electric shock pass through his body. The roar of the battle died down in his ears to a gentle murmur, and instead of it, he says, he heard a great voice louder than a thunder peal crying, Array! Array! His heart grew hot as a burning coal, then it grew cold as ice within him, for it seemed to him a tumult of voices answered to the summons. He heard, or seemed to hear, thousands shouting, St. George! St. George! Ha, me sire! Ha, sweet saint, grant us good deliverance! St. George for Mary England! Haro, haro! Monsignor St. George, succour us! Ha, St. George, a low bow and a strong bow! Knight of heaven, aid us! As the soldier heard the voices, he saw before him, beyond the trench, a long line of shapes with a shining about them. They were like men who drew the bow, and with another great shout the cloud of arrows flew singing through the air toward the German host. The other men in the trenches were firing all the while, they had no hope, but they aimed just as if they had been shooting at Bisley. Suddenly one of these lifted up his voice in plain English. God help us, he bellowed to the man next to him. But we're bloomin' marvels. Look at those grey gentlemen. Look at them. They're not going down in dozens or hundreds. It's thousands it is. Look, look, there is a regiment gone while I'm talking to ye. Shut it, the other soldier bellowed, taking aim. What are ye talking about? But he gulped with astonishment even as he spoke, for indeed the grey men were falling by the thousands. The English could hear the guttural scream of their revolvers as they shot, and line after line crashed to the earth. All the while the Latin-bred soldier heard the cry, Haro, haro, Monsignor, dear Saint, quick to our aid, St. George, help us. The singing arrows darkened the air, the hordes melted before them. More machine guns, Bill yelled to Tom. Don't hear them, Tom yelled back, but thank God anyway that they have got it in the neck. In fact, there were ten thousand dead German soldiers left before that salient of the English army, and consequently no Sedan. In Germany, the general staff decided that the English must have employed turpentine shells, as no wounds were discernible on the bodies of the dead soldiers. But the man who knew what nuts tasted like when they called themselves steak, knew also that St George had bought his Argentcourt bowmen to help the English. Such accounts have been confirmed by others. Thus, Miss Phyllis Campbell, writing in the Occult Review, October 1915, says... I tremble, now that it is safely passed, to look back on the terrible week that brought the Allies to Vitry le Francois. We had not had our clothes off for the whole week, because no sooner had we reached home, too weary to undress or to eat, and fallen on our beds, than the chug-chug of the Commandant's car would sound into the silence of the deserted street, and the horn would imperatively summon us back to duty, because, in addition to our duties, as ambulance auxiliaire, we were interpreters to the post, now at this moment diminished to half a dozen. Returning at 4.30 in the morning, we stood at the end of the platform watching the train call through the blue-green mist of the forest into the clearing, and draw up with the first wounded from Vitry le Francois. It was packed with dead and dying and badly wounded. For a time we forgot our weariness in a race against time, removing the dead and dying and attending to those in need. I was bandaging a man's shattered arm with the majeure instructing me while he stitched a horrible gap in his head. When Madame Diar, the heroic president of the post, came and replaced me. There is an English in the fifth wagon, she said. He wants something, I think a holy picture. The idea of an English soldier wanting a holy picture struck me even in that atmosphere of blood and misery, as something to smile at. But I hurried away. The English was a Lancashire Fusilier. He was propped in a corner, his left arm tied up in a peasant woman's handkerchief and his head newly bandaged. He should have been in a state of collapse from loss of blood, for his tattered uniform was soaked and caked in blood, 
and his face paper white under the dirt of conflict. He looked at me with bright, courageous eyes and asked for a picture or a medal. He didn't care which, of St George. I asked him if he was Catholic. No, he was Wesleyan Methodist, and he wanted a picture or a medal of St George, because he had seen him on a white horse leading the British at Vitry le Francois when the Allies turned. There was a FRA man wounded in the leg sitting beside him on the floor. He saw my look of amazement and hastened in. It's true, sister, he said. We all saw it. First there was a sort of yellow mist-like sort of rising before the Germans, as they came on top of the hill. Come on like a solid wall, they did, springing out of the earth, just solid, no end to them. I just give up. No use fighting the whole German race, thinks I. It's all up with us. The next minute comes this funny cloud of light, and when it clears off, there's a tall man with yellow hair and golden armour on a white horse, holding his sword up, and his mouth open as if he's saying, Come on, boys, I'll put the kibosh on these devils. Sort of, this is my picnic expression. Then before you could say knife, the Germans had turned, and we were after them, fighting like ninety. Where was this, I asked, but neither of them could tell. They had marched fighting a rearguard action from Mons till St George, and appeared through the haze of light and turned the enemy. They both knew it was St George. Hadn't they seen him with a sword on every quid they ever seen? The Frenchies had seen him too. Asked them, but they said it was St Michael. Much additional testimony of a like nature might be given, and it has been collected by students of physical research. If the spiritual world ever intervenes in matters mundane, it assuredly did so on this occasion, and it could hardly have chosen a more opportune time. Could the aspiring thoughts of dead and dying, and those still living and fighting for the country, have drawn St George to earth to aid in again redeeming his country from foreign foe? Could a simple hallucination have been so widespread and so prevalent, or might there not have been some spiritual energy behind the visions thus seen, stimulating them and inspiring and encouraging the stricken soldiers? We cannot say. We only know what the soldiers themselves say, and we also know the undoubted effects upon the enemy, for on both occasions were the Germans repulsed with terrible slaughter. Perhaps the vision of St George led our soldiers into a closer touch and rapport with the consciousness of some high intelligence, or the veil separating the two worlds was rent, as so often appears to be the case of apparitions and visions of this nature. End of The Phantom Armies Seen in France by Herewood Carrington Recorded by Brian Stapley, Dunedin, New Zealand The Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe Read by Morgan Scorpion This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal the redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness, and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stains upon the body, and especially upon the face of the victim, were the pest ban which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. And the whole seizure, progress and termination of the disease, were the incidents of half an hour. But the Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court, and with these retired to the deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the Prince's own eccentric yet august taste. A strong and lofty wall girdled it in, this wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress or egress to the sudden impulses of despair or of frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned. With such precautions, the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. 
In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons, there were improvisatori, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within. Without was the Red Death. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion, and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade. But first, let me tell of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven, an imperial suite. In many palaces, however, such suites form a long and straight vista, while the folding doors slide back nearly to the walls on either hand, so that the view of the whole extent is scarcely impeded. Here the case was very different, as might have been expected from the Duke's love of the bazaar. The apartments were so irregularly disposed that the vision embraced but little more than one at a time. There was a sharp turn at every twenty or thirty yards, and at each turn a novel effect. To the right and left, in the middle of each wall, a tall and narrow Gothic window looked out upon a closed corridor which pursued the windings of the suite. These windows were of stained glass, whose colour varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened. That at the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and here the panes were purple. The third was green throughout, and so were the casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, the sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and hue. But in this chamber only the colour of the windows failed to correspond with the decorations. The panes here were scarlet, a deep blood colour. Now in no one of the seven apartments was there any lamp or candelabrum, amid the profusion of golden ornaments that lay scattered to and fro or depended from the roof. There was no light of any kind emanating from lamp or candle within the suite of chambers. But in the corridors that followed the suite, there stood, opposite to each window, a heavy tripod, bearing a brazier of fire that projected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly illumined the room. And thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. But in the western or black chamber, the effect of the firelight that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme, and produced so wild a look upon the countenance of those who entered, that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. It was in this apartment also that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony. Its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang and when the minute hand made the circuit of the face, and the hour was to be stricken, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that, at each lapse of an hour, the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance, to hearken to the sound. And thus the waltzers perforce ceased their evolutions, and there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company, and while the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale, and the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows, as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled, as if at their own nervousness and folly, and made whispering vows, each to the other, that the next chiming of the clock should produce in them no similar emotion, and then, after the lapse of sixty minutes, which embrace three thousand and six hundred seconds of the time that flies, there came yet another chiming of the clock, and then were the same disconcert and tremulousness and meditation as before. But in spite of these things, it was a gay and magnificent revel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for colours and effects. He disregarded the decor of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery, 
and his conceptions glowed with barbaric lustre. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. It was necessary to hear and see and touch him, to be sure that he was not. He had directed, in great part, the movable embellishments of the seven chambers upon occasion of this great fate, and it was his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. There were much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm, much of what has been seen since in Hernani. There were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delicious fancies such as the madman fashions. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. To and fro in the seven chambers there stalked, in fact, a multitude of dreams, and these, the dreams, writhed in and about, taking hue from the rooms, and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. And anon, there strikes the ebony clock which stands in the hall of the velvet. And then for a moment all is still, and all is silent save the voice of the clock. The dreams are stiff frozen as they stand. But the echoes of the chime die away. They have endured but an instant, and a light, half-subdued laughter floats after them as they depart. And now again... The music swells, and the dreams live, and rise to and fro more merrily than ever, taking hue from the many tinted windows through which stream the rays from the tripods. But to the chamber which lies most westwardly of the seven, there are now none of the maskers who venture, for the night is waning away, and there flows a ruddier light through the blood-coloured panes, and the blackness of the sable drapery appalls, and to him whose foot falls upon the sable carpet, there comes from the near clock of ebony a muffled peal, more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches their ears, who indulge in the more remote gaieties of the other apartments. But these other apartments were densely crowded, and in them beat feverishly the heart of life, and the revel went whirlingly on, until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things, as before. But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock, and thus it happened, perhaps, that more of thought crept, with more of time, into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who revelled. And thus, too, it happened, perhaps, that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumour of this new presence having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz or murmur, expressive of disapprobation and surprise, then finally of terror, of horror, and of disgust. In an assembly of phantasms such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have excited such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited, but the figure in question had out-heroded Herod, and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched without emotion. Even with the utterly lost, to whom life and death are equally jests, there are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company, indeed, seemed now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt, and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet... All this might have been endured, if not approved, by the mad revellers around. But the mummer had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with all the features of the face, was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. When the eyes of Prince Prospero fell upon this spectral image, which, with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers. He was seen to be convulsed in the first moment with a strong shudder, either of terror or distaste. 
but in the next his brow reddened with rage. "'Who dares?' he demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him. "'Who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements.' It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the Prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue room where stood the Prince, with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of this group in the direction of the intruder, who at the moment was also near at hand and now, with deliberate and stately step, made closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mummer had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth hand to seize him, so that, unimpeded, he passed within a yard of the prince's person, and while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centres of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly but with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first, through the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet, ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger, and had approached, in rapid impetuosity, to within three or four feet of the retreating figure, when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry, and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet, upon which, instantly afterwards, fell prostrate in death the Prince Prospero. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revellers at once threw themselves into the black apartment, and, seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and corpse-like mask which they handled with so violent a rudeness, untenanted by any tangible form. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revellers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay, and the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness, and decay, and the Red Death held a limitable dominion over all. End of The Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe Three at a Table by W. W. Jacobs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Three at a Table by W. W. Jacobs Talk in the coffee room had been of ghosts and apparitions, and nearly everybody present had contributed his mite to the stock of information upon a hazy and somewhat threadbare subject. Opinions ranged from rank incredulity to childlike faith, one believer going so far as to denounce unbelief as impious, with a reference to the Witch of Endor, which was somewhat marred by being complicated in an inexplicable fashion by the story of Jonah. Talking of Jonah, he said solemnly, with a happy disregard of the fact that he had declined to answer several eager questions put to him on the subject. Look at the strange tales sailors tell us. I wouldn't advise you to believe all of those, said a bluff, clean-shaven man who had been listening without speaking much. You see, when a sailor gets ashore, he's expected to have something to tell and his friends would be rather disappointed if he had not. It's a well-known fact, interrupted the first speaker, Flinty, that sailors are very prone to see visions. They are, said the other dryly. They generally see them in pairs, and the shock to the nervous system frequently causes headache in the morning. 
You never saw anything yourself, suggested an unbeliever. Man and boy, said the other. I've been at sea thirty years, and the only unpleasant incident of that kind occurred in a quiet English countryside. And that, said another man. I was a young man at the time, said the narrator, drawing at his pipe and glancing good-humouredly at the company. I had just come back from China, and my own people being away, I went down into the country to invite myself to stay with an uncle. When I got down to the place, I found it closed, and the family in the south of France. But as they were due back in a couple of days, I decided to put up at the Royal George, a very decent inn, and await their return. First day I passed well enough, but in the evening the dullness of the rambling old place in which I was the only visitor began to weigh upon my spirits, and the next morning, after a late breakfast, I set out with the intention of having a brisk day's walk. I started off in excellent spirits, for the day was bright and frosty, with a powdering of snow on the iron-bound roads and nipped hedges, and the country had to me all the charm of novelty. It was certainly flat, but there was plenty of timber, and the villages through which I passed were old and picturesque. I lunched luxuriously on bread and cheese and beer in the bar of a small inn, and resolved to go a little further before turning back. When at length I found that I had gone far enough, I turned up a lane at right angles to the road I was passing, and resolved to find my way back by another route. It is a long lane that has no turning, but this had several, each of which had turnings of its own, which generally led, as I found, by trying two or three of them into the open marshes. Then, tired of lanes, I resolved to rely upon the small compass which hung from my watch chain and go across country home. I got well into the marshes when a white fog, which had been for some time hovering around the edge of the ditches, began gradually to spread. There was no escaping it, but by aid of my compass I was saved from making a circular tour and fell instead into frozen ditches or stumbled over roots in the grass. I kept my course, however, until at four o'clock, when night was coming rapidly up to lend a hand to the fog, I was fain to confess myself lost. The compass was now no good to me, and I wandered about miserably, occasionally giving a shout on the chance of being heard by some passing shepherd or farmhand. At length, by great good luck, I found my feet on a rough road driven through the marshes, and by walking slowly and tapping with my stick managed to keep to it. I had followed it for some distance when I heard footsteps approaching me. We stopped as we met, and the new arrival, a sturdy-looking countryman, hearing of my plight, walked back with me for nearly a mile, and putting me onto a road, gave me minute instructions how to reach a village some three miles distance. I was so tired that three miles sounded like ten, and besides that, a little way off from the road, I saw dimly a lighted window. I pointed it out, but my companion shuddered and looked around him uneasily. You won't get no good there, he said hastily. Why not? I asked. There's a something there, sir, he replied. What tis, I don't know. But the little un belonging to a gamekeeper, as used to live in these parts, see it, and it was never much good afterward. Some say it's a poor mad thing, others say it's a kind of animal, but whatever it is, it ain't good to see. Well, I'll keep on then, I said. Good night. He went back whistling cheerily until his footsteps died away in the distance, and I followed the road he had indicated until it divided into three, any one of which, to a stranger, might be said to lead straight on. I was now cold and tired. Having half made up my mind, I walked slowly back towards the house. At first, all I could see of it was the little pitch of light at the window. I made for that until it disappeared suddenly, and I found myself walking into a tall hedge. I felt my way round this until I came to a small gate, and opening it cautiously, walked, not without some little nervousness, up a long path which led to the door. There was no light and no sound from within. Half repenting of my temerity, I shortened my stick and knocked lightly upon the door. I waited a couple of minutes and then knocked again, and my stick was still beating the door when it opened suddenly and a tall, bony old woman holding a candle confronted me. What do you want? she demanded gruffly. I've lost my way, I said civilly. I want to get to Asheville. Don't know it, said the old woman. She was about to close the door when a man emerged from a room at the side of the hall and came towards us, an old man of great height and breadth of shoulder. 
Asheville is fifteen miles distance, he said slowly. If you will direct me to the nearest village, I shall be grateful, I remarked. He made no reply, but exchanged a quick, furtive glance with the woman. She made a gesture of dissent. The nearest place is three miles off, he said, turning to me and apparently trying to soften a naturally harsh voice. If you will give me the pleasure of your company, I will make you as comfortable as I can. I hesitated. They were certainly a queer-looking couple, and the gloomy hall with the shadows thrown by the candle looked hardly more inviting than the darkness outside. You are very kind, I murmured irresolutely. But, come in, he said quickly. Shut the door, Anne. Almost before I knew it, I was standing inside, and the old woman, muttering to herself, had closed the door behind me. With a queer sensation of being trapped, I followed my host into the room, and taking the proffered chair, warmed my frozen fingers at the fire. Dinner will soon be ready, said the old man, regarding me closely. If you will excuse me, I bowed, and he left the room. A minute afterward I heard voices, his and the old woman's, and I fancied a third. Before I had finished my inspection of the room, he returned, and regarded me with the same strange look I had noticed before. There will be three of us at dinner, he said at length, we two and my son. I bowed again, and secretly hoped that that look didn't run in the family. I suppose you don't mind dining in the dark, he said abruptly. Not at all, I replied, hiding my surprise as well as I could, but really I'm afraid I'm intruding. If you'll allow me, he waved his huge gaunt hands. We're not going to lose you now we've got you, he said with a dry laugh. It's seldom we have company, and now we've got you we'll keep you. My son's eyes are bad, and he can't stand the light. Ah, here is Annie. As he spoke, the old woman entered, and eyeing me stealthily, began to lay the cloth, while my host, taking a chair the other side of the hearth, sat looking silently into the fire. The table set, the old woman brought in a pair of fowls ready carved in a dish, and placing three chairs, left the room. The old man hesitated a moment, and then rising from his chair, placed a large screen in front of the fire, and slowly extinguished the candles blind man's holiday he said with clumsy jocosity and groping his way to the door opened it somebody came back into the room with him and in a slow uncertain fashion took a seat at the table and the strangest voice i have ever heard broke a silence which was fast becoming oppressive a cold night it said slowly i replied in the affirmative and light or no light fell to with an appetite which had only been sharpened by the snack in the middle of the day it was somewhat difficult eating in the dark, and it was evident from the behaviour of my invisible companions that they were as unused to dining under such circumstances as I was. We ate in silence until the old woman blundered into the room with some sweets and put them with a crash upon the table. Are you a stranger about here? inquired the curious voice again. I replied in the affirmative and murmured something about my luck in stumbling upon such a good dinner. Stumbling is a very good word for it, said the voice grimly. You have forgotten the port, father. So I have, said the old man, rising. It's a bottle of the celebrated. Today twill get it myself. He felt his way to the door, and closing it behind him, left me alone with my unseen neighbour. There was something so strange about the whole business that I must confess to more than a slight feeling of uneasiness. My host seemed to be absent a long time. I heard the man opposite lay down his fork and spoon, and I half fancied I could see a pair of wild eyes shining through the gloom like a cat's. With a growing sense of uneasiness, I pushed my chair back. It caught the hearth rug, and in my efforts to disentangle it, the screen fell over with a crash, and in the flickering light of the fire, I saw the face of the creature opposite. With a sharp catch of my breath, I left my chair and stood with clenched fists beside it. Man or beast, which was it? The flame leapt up and then went out, and in the mere red glow of the fire it looked more devilish than before. For a few moments we regarded each other in silence. Then the door opened and the old man returned. He stood aghast as he saw the warm firelight, and then approaching the table mechanically put down a couple of bottles. I beg your pardon, said I, reassured by his presence but I have accidentally overturned the screen. Allow me to replace it. No, said the other man gently. Let it be. We have had enough of the dark. I'll give you a light. He struck a match and slowly lit the candles. Then I saw the man opposite had but the remnant of a face, 
a gaunt wolfish face in which one unquenched eye, the sole remaining feature, still glittered. I was greatly moved, some suspicion of the truth occurring to me. My son was injured some years ago in a burning house, said the old man. Since then we have lived a very retired life. When you came to the door, we, his voice trembled, that is, my son, I thought, said the son simply, that it would be better for me not to come to the dinner table. But it happens to be my birthday, and my father would not hear of my dining alone. So we hit upon this foolish plan of dining in the dark. I'm sorry I startled you. I am sorry, said I, as I reached across the table and gripped his hand, that I am such a fool, but it was only in the dark that you startled me. From a faint tinge on the old man's cheek, and a certain pleasant softening of the poor solitary eye in front of me, I secretly congratulated myself upon the last remark. We never see a friend, said the old man apologetically, and the temptation to have company was too much for us. Besides, I don't know what else you could have done. Nothing else half so good, I'm sure, said I. Come, said my host, with almost a sprightly air. Now we know each other, draw your chairs to the fire, and let's keep this birthday in proper fashion. He drew a small table to the fire for the glasses and produced a box of cigars, and placing a chair for the old servant, sternly bade her sit down and drink. If the talk was not sparkling, it did not lack for vivacity, and we were soon as merry a party as I have ever seen. The night wore on so rapidly that we could hardly believe our ears when in a lull in the conversation a clock on the hall struck twelve. A last toast before we retire, said my host, pitching the end of a cigar into the fire and turning to the small table. We had drunk several before this, but there was something impressive in the old man's manner as he rose and took up his glass. His tall figure seemed to get taller, and his voice rang as he gazed proudly at his disfigured son. The health of the children my boy saved, he said, and drained his glass at a draught. End of Three at a Table, recorded by Brian Stapley, Dunedin, New Zealand. The Fiend by an Unknown Author This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fiend by an Unknown Author in a certain country there lived an old couple who had a daughter called Marusha. In their village it was customary to celebrate the feast of St. Andrew the First called. The girls used to assemble in some cottage, bake pampushki, and enjoy themselves for a whole week, or even longer. Well, the girls met together once when this festival arrived, and brewed and baked what was wanted. In the evening came the lads, with the music, bringing liquor with them, and dancing and revelry commenced. All the girls danced well, but Marusha was the best of all. After a while there came into the cottage such a fine fellow. Mary, come up, regular blood and milk, and smartly and richly dressed. Hail, fair maiden, says he. Hail, good youth, say they. You're merry-making. Be so good as to join us. Thereupon he pulled out of his pocket a purse full of gold, ordered liquor, nuts, gingerbread. All was ready in a trice, and he began treating the lads and lasses, giving each a share. Then he took to dancing. Why, it was a treat to look at him. Marusha struck his fancy more than anyone else, so he stuck close to her. Time came for going home. Marusha, says he, come and see me off. She went to see him off. Marusha, sweetheart, says he, would you like me to marry you? If you like to marry me, I will gladly marry you. But where do you come from? From such and such a place. I am a clerk at a merchant's. Then they bade each other farewell and separated. When Marusha got home, her mother asked, Well, daughter, have you enjoyed yourself? Yes, mother, but I have something pleasant to tell you besides. There was a lad there from the neighbourhood, good-looking, with lots of money, and he promised to marry me. Hark ye, Marusha, when you go to where the girls are tomorrow, take a ball of thread with you. Make a noose in it and, when you are going to see him off, throw it over one of his buttons, and quietly unroll the ball. Then, by means of the thread, you will be able to find out where he lives. Next day Marusha went to the gathering and took the ball of thread with her. The youth came again. Good evening, Marusha, said he. Good evening, said she. 
games began and dances. Even more than before did he stick to Marusha. Not a step would he budge from her. The time came for going home. Come and see me off, Marusha, says the stranger. She went out into the street, and while she was taking leave of him, she quietly dropped the noose over one of his buttons. He went his way, but she remained where she was, unrolling the ball. When she had unrolled the whole of it, she ran after the thread to find out where her betrothed lived. At first the thread followed the road, then it stretched across hedges and ditches, and led Marusha towards the church, and right up to the porch. Marusha tried the door. It was locked. She went round the church, found a ladder, set it against the window, and climbed up to see what was going on inside. Having got into the church, she looked and saw her betrothed standing beside a grave and devouring a dead body, for a corpse had been left for that night in the church. She wanted to get down the ladder quietly, but her fright prevented her from taking proper heed, and she made a little noise. Then she ran home, almost beside herself, fancying all the time she was being pursued. She was all but dead before she got in. Next morning her mother asked her, Well, Marusha, did you see the youth? I saw him, mother, she replied, but what else she had seen she did not tell. In the morning Marusha was sitting, considering whether she would go to the gathering or not. Go, said her mother, amuse yourself while you're young. So she went to the gathering. The fiend was there already. Games, fun, dancing began anew. The girls knew nothing of what had happened. When they began to separate and go homewards, Come, Marusha, says the evil one, see me off. She was afraid and didn't stir. Then all the other girls opened out upon her. What are you thinking about? Have you grown so bashful, forsooth? Go and see the good lad off. There was no help for it. Out she went, not knowing what would come of it. As soon as they got into the street, he began questioning her. You were in the church last night? No. And saw what I was doing there? No. Very well. Tomorrow your father will die. Having said this, he disappeared. Marusha returned home, grave and sad. When she woke up in the morning, her father lay dead. They wept and wailed over him, and laid him in the coffin. In the evening her mother went off to the priests, but Marusha remained at home. At last she became afraid of being alone in the house. Suppose I go to my friends, she thought. So she went and found the evil one there. Good evening, Marusha. Why aren't you merry? asked the girls. How can I be merry? My father is dead. Oh, poor thing. They all grieve for her. Even the accursed one himself grieved, just as if it hadn't all been his own doing. By and by they began to say farewell and going home. Marusha, says he, see me off. She didn't want to. What are you thinking of, child, insist the girls? What are you afraid of? Go and see him off. So she went to see him off. They passed out into the street. Tell me, Marusha, says he, were you in the church? No. Did you see what I was doing? No. Very well. Tomorrow your mother will die. He spoke and disappeared. Marusha returned home sadder than ever. The night went by. Next morning, when she awoke, her mother lay dead. She cried all day long, but when the sun set and it grew dark around, Marusha became afraid of being left alone, so she went to her companions. Why, whatever's the matter with you? You're clean out of countenance, says the girls. How am I likely to be cheerful? Yesterday my father died, today my mother. Poor thing, poor unhappy girl, they all exclaimed sympathisingly. Well, the time came to say goodbye. See me off, Marusha, said the fiend. So she went out to see him off. Tell me, were you in the church? No. And saw what I was doing? No. Very well, tomorrow evening you will die yourself. Marusha spent the night with her friends. In the morning she got up and considered what she should do. She bethought herself that she had a grandmother, an old, very old woman, who had become blind from length of years. Suppose I go and ask her advice, she said, and then went off to her grandmother's. Good day, Granny, says she. Good day, Granddaughter. What news is there with you? How are your father and mother? They are dead, Granny, replied the girl, and then told her all that had happened. The old woman listened and said, Oh dear me, my poor unhappy child, go quickly to the priest and ask him this favour, 
that if you die, your body shall not be taken out of the house through the doorway, but that the ground shall be dug away from under the threshold, and that you shall be dragged out through that opening, and also beg that you may be buried at a crossway, at a spot where four roads meet. Marusha went to the priest, wept bitterly, and made him promise to do everything according to her grandmother's instructions. Then she returned home, bought a coffin, lay down in it, and straight away expired. Well, they told the priest, and he buried, first her father and mother, and then Marusha herself. Her body was passed underneath the threshold, and buried at a crossway. Soon afterwards, a senior's son happened to be driving past Marusha's grave. On that grave he saw growing a wondrous flower, such a one as he had never seen before. Send the young senior to his servant. Go and pluck up that flower by the roots. We will take it home and put it in a flower pot. Perhaps it will blossom there. Well, they dug up the flower, took it home, and put it in a glazed flower pot and set it in a window. The flower began to grow larger and more beautiful. One night the servant hadn't gone to sleep somehow, and he happened to be looking at the window when he saw a wondrous thing take place. All of a sudden the flower began to tremble, then it fell from its stem to the ground and turned into a lovely maiden. The flower was beautiful, but the maiden was more beautiful still. She wandered from room to room, got herself various things to eat and drink, ate and drank, then stamped upon the ground and became a flower as before, mounted to the window and resumed her place upon the stem. Next day the servant told the young senior of the wonders which he had seen during the night. Ah, brother, said the youth, why didn't you wake me? Tonight we'll both keep watch together. The night came. They slept not, but watched. Exactly at twelve o'clock the blossom began to shake, flew from place to place, and then fell to the ground, and the beautiful maiden appeared, got herself things to eat and drink, and sat down to supper. The young senior rushed forward and seized her by her white hands. Impossible was it for him sufficiently to look at her, to gaze on her beauty. Next morning he said to his father and mother, Please allow me to get married. I found myself a bride. His parents gave their consent. As for Marusha, she said, Only on this condition will I marry you, that for four years I need not go to church. Very good, said he. Well, they were married, and they lived together one year, two years, and had a son. But one day they had visitors at their house who enjoyed themselves and drank and began bragging about their wives. This one's wife was handsome, that one's was handsomer still. You may say what you like, says the host, but a handsomer wife than mine does not exist in the whole world. Handsome, yes, replied the guest, but a heathen. How so? Why, she never goes to church. Her husband found these observations distasteful. He waited till Sunday, and then told his wife to get dressed for church. I don't care what you may say, says he. Go and get ready directly. Well, they got ready and went to church. The husband went in didn't see anything particular, but when she looked round, there was the fiend sitting at a window. Ha! Here you are at last, he cried. Remember old times? Were you in the church that night? No. And did you see what I was doing? No. Very well, tomorrow both your husband and your son will die. Marusha rushed straight out of the church and away to her grandmother. The old woman gave her two files the one full of holy water, the other of the water of life, and told her what she was to do. Next day, both Marusha's husband and her son died. Then the fiend came flying to her and asked, Tell me, were you at the church? I was. And did you see what I was doing? You were eating a corpse. She spoke and splashed the holy water over him. In a moment he turned into mere dust and ashes, which blew to the winds. Afterwards, she sprinkled her husband and her boy with the water of life. Straight away they revived, and from that time forward they knew neither sorrow nor separation, but they all lived together long and happily. End of The Fiend The Murder Hole by Anonymous This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Taryn Maximilian Defoe. The Murder Hole by Anonymous. About three hundred years ago, on the estate of Lord Catullus, between Ayrshire and Galloway, lay a great moor, unrelieved by any trees or vegetation. It was rumoured that unwary travellers had been intercepted and murdered there, and that no investigation ever revealed what had happened to them. People living in a nearby hamlet believed that in the dead of night they sometimes heard a sudden cry of anguish, and a shepherd who had lost his way once declared that he had seen three mysterious figures struggling together until one of them, with a frightful scream, sank suddenly into the earth. So terrifying was this place that at last no one remained there, except one old woman and her two sons, who were too poor to flee, as their neighbors had done. Travelers occasionally begged a night's lodging at their cottage, rather than continue their journey across the moor in darkness, and even by day, no one traveled that way except in companies of at least two or three people. One stormy November night, a peddler boy was overtaken by darkness on the moor. Terrified by the solitude, he repeated to himself the promises of Scripture, and so struggled toward the old cottage which he had visited the year before, in a large company of travellers, and where he felt assured of a welcome. Its light guided him from afar, and he knocked at the door, but at first received no answer. He then peered through a window, and saw that the occupants were all at their accustomed occupations. The old woman was scrubbing the floor, and strewing it with sand. Her two sons seemed to be thrusting something large and heavy into a great chest, which they then hastily locked. There was an air of haste about all of this which puzzled the waiting boy outside. He tapped lightly on the window, and they all started up with consternation on their faces, and one of the men suddenly darted out at the door, seized the boy roughly by the shoulder, and dragged him inside. He said, trying to laugh, I'm only the poor peddler who visited you last year. Are you alone? cried the old woman in a harsh, deep voice. Alone here, and alone in the whole world replied the boy sadly. Then you are welcome, said one of the men with a sneer. Their words filled the boy with alarm, and the confusion and desolation of the formerly neat and orderly cottage seemed to show signs of recent violence. The curtains had been torn down from the bed to which he was shown, and though he begged for a light to burn until he fell asleep, his terror kept him long awake. In the middle of the night, he was awakened by a single cry of distress. He sat up and listened, but it was not repeated. And he would have lain down to sleep again, but suddenly his eye fell on a stream of blood, slowly trickling under the door of his room. In terror he sprang to the door, and through a chink he saw that the victim outside was only a goat. But just then he overheard the voices of the two men, and their words transfixed him with horror. I wish all the throats we cut were as easy, said one. Did you ever hear such a noise as the old gentleman made last night? Ah, the murder hole's the thing for me, said the other. One plunge and the fellow's dead, and buried in a moment. How do you mean to dispatch the lad in there? asked the old woman in a harsh whisper, and one of the men silently drew his bloody knife across his throat to answer. The terrified boy crept to his window and managed to let himself down without a sound. But as he stood, wondering which way to turn, a dreadful cry rang out. The boy has escaped! Let loose the bloodhound! He ran for his life, blindly, but all too soon he heard the dreadful baying of the hound and the voices of the men in pursuit. Suddenly he stumbled and fell on a heap of rough stones which cut him in every limb, so that his blood poured over the stones. He staggered to his feet and ran on. The hound was so near that he could almost feel its breath on his back. But suddenly it smelled the blood on the stones, and thinking the chase at an end, it lay down and refused to go farther after the same scent. The boy fled on and on till morning, and when at last he reached a village, his pitiable state and his fearful story roused such wrath that three gibbets were at once set upon the moor, and before night the three villains had been captured and had confessed their guilt. The bones of their victims were later discovered and with great difficulty.
brought up from the dreadful hole with its narrow aperture into which they had been thrust. End of The Murder Hole Recorded by Taran Maximilian Defoe in Los Angeles, California September 23rd, 2010The Levite and His Concubine Judges 19 from the King James Bible This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Mills The Levite and His Concubine And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim, who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem Judah. And his concubine played the whore against him, and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem Judah, and was there four whole months. And her husband arose, and went after her, to speak friendly unto her, and to bring her again, having his servant with him, and a couple of asses. And she brought him into her father's house, and when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. And his father-in-law, the damsel's father, retained him, and he abode with him three days, so they did eat and drink, and lodged there. And it came to pass on the fourth day, when they arose early in the morning, that he rose up to depart. And the damsel's father said unto his son-in-law, Comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. And they sat down, and did eat and drink, both of them together. But the damsel's father had said unto the man, Be content, I pray thee, and tarry all night, and let thine heart be merry. And when the man rose up to depart, his father-in-law urged him. Therefore he lodged there again. And he arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart, and the damsel's father said, Comfort thine heart, I pray thee. And they tarried until afternoon, and they did eat, both of them. And when the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine, and his servant, his father-in-law, the damsel's father, said unto him, Behold, now the day draweth toward evening, I pray you tarry all night. Behold, the day groweth to an end. Lodge here, that thine heart may be merry, and to-morrow get you early on your way that thou mayest go home. But the man would not tarry that night, and he rose up and departed, and came over against Jebus, which is Jerusalem. And there were with him two asses saddled, his concubine also was with him. And when they were by Jebus, the day was far spent, and the servant said unto his master, Come, I pray thee, and let us turn into this city of the Jebusites, and lodge in it. And his master said unto him, we will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah. And he said unto his servant, Come, and let us draw near to one of these places to lodge all night, in Gibeah, or in Rama. And they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down upon them when they were by Gibeah, which belongeth to Benjamin. And they turned aside thither to go in and to lodge in Gibeah, and when he went in, he sat him down in a street of the city, for there was no man that took them into his house to lodging. And behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field at even, which was also of Mount Ephraim, and he sojourned in Gebeah, but the men of the place were Benjamites. And when he had lifted up his eyes, he saw a wayfaring man in the street of the city, and the old man said, Whither goest thou, and whence comest thou? And he said unto him, We are passing from Bethlehem Judah toward the side of Mount Ephraim, from thence am I. And I went to Bethlehem Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord, and there is no man that receiveth me to house. Yet there is both straw and provender for our asses, and there is bread and wine also for me, and for thy handmaid, and for the young man which is with thy servants. There is no want of any thing. And the old man said, Peace be with thee. Howsoever, let all thy wants lie upon me. Only lodge not in the street. So he brought him into his house, 
and gave provender unto the asses, and they washed their feet, and did eat and drink. Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about, and beat at the door, and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thine house, that we may know him. And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them, and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly. Seeing that this man is come into mine house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. But the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine, and brought her forth unto them. And they knew her, and abused her all the night until the morning. And when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day, and fell down at the door of the man's house where her lord was, till it was light. And her lord rose up in the morning, and opened the doors of the house, and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman his concubine was fallen down at the door of the house, and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up, and let us be going. But none answered. Then the man took her up upon an ass, and the man rose up, and gat him unto his place. And when he was come into his house, he took a knife, and laid hold on his concubine, and divided her, together with her bones, into twelve pieces, and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. And it was so, that all that saw it said, There was no such deed done nor seen, from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt, unto this day. Consider of it, take advice, and speak your minds. End of The Levite and His Concubine Buried Alive From Jesse, the Mormon's Daughter By Parsi B. St. John This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Om123 Buried Alive From Jesse, the Mormon's Daughter By Percy B. St. John The harem system, where eighty wives or more lived under one roof or divan, the parent abode had not, at the time of which we speak, been introduced. Mormonism, in its open defiance of the world, was not the hideous thing it is now, shameless, reckless, vile, beyond power of description. But even in its early days, when polygamy was restricted to two, or at most three wives, it was revolting enough. A man may here keep a wife and concubine under the same roof, in the shape of a governess, or servant, or companion. But the woman knows it not, or even if she suspects it, and for her own dignity's sake, or the happiness of her children, declines to make a scandal of it. At least she avows it not. Let us enter Dow's Creek, and see the picture it represents. It was a village of about thirty houses and tents, built without much regularity, but the doors always looking towards a common centre. There was always an affectation of Arcadian and patriarchal simplicity about the Mormons, which seems as suitable as might be with a congregated mass of London pickpockets and streetwalkers. In the centre were held the games, 
chancing, wrestling, running, and such like. There were several empty houses, which had belonged to Mormons, who had been forwarded to the upper settlement as they were ready. It was now eight o'clock. Once again the altar of the false prophet had been erected to go through the blasphemous mockery of a marriage. All the chiefs of the Mormon camp were assembled, and all the most contented of the women. Walter de Vere was dressed out in a brave array. He had contrived to carve his drunken propensities for once, and stood on one side of the altar calm, collected, but very pale. Sarah Falding was ghastly. Everybody whispered that they had never seen so unheardly beautiful a pair. Both had a strange gleam in their eyes, which was to a keen observer perfectly satanic. Nobody could make out to see them, whether they were being united by great hate or very great love. They stood about two feet asunder. One of the Mormon elders took up the prayer book and began to reach his impressive form of solemnization of matrimony. He turned to Walter de Vere and asked him the usual question. Yes, was the reply. Wilt thou, continued the impostor priest, have this man to be thy wedded husband, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy state of matrimony? Wilt thou obey him and serve him, love, honor, and keep him in sickness and in health? and forsaking all others keep thee only unto him so long as ye both shall live no had a thunderbolt fallen in among them it could not have caused greater sensation than this single monosyllable but miss balding cried walter de vere paler still with rage what is the meaning you will not have him, asked the astonished priest. False and outcast minister of God, she said, do you think I, the daughter of a real servant of the Lord, would wait a forger and thief who has already dragged two wretched beings into the mire? Walter de Vere fell back as if stunned. The blow was so fearfully sudden, the charge so unexpected, terrible, yet true. Who has been calmenting me? he cried, amidst the suppressed jeers of his companions. They had all paid their bets. His discomfiture was amusing. But there were serious interests at stake. And to this it behoved them all first to look. No one here has said a word about you except in your favour, replied Sarah, standing cool, collected, and firm amid the excited mob. But what I say I know to be true, Mr. Walter de Vere, alias Mr. William Hicks, for whose apprehension I saw many bills about when I was last in England. By heaven, Solomon! cried Devere, alias Hicks, savagely. Whether you like it or not, you shall be my wife. No one shall brave me with impunity. Proceed, said one of the elders. You dare not, cried Sarah. You dare not violate the liberty of a poor woman. I will not wait this man. Say or do what you will. Proceed, said the same nasal voice. The ceremony proceeded. Sarah's two friends, Lydia and Amy, covering their faces with their hands and weeping. Two strong men held Sarah by the wrists, and had the reckless audacity to announce to the assembly that Sarah had said yes. The villain had money, which, on an occasion like the present, he used freely to lavish on his comrades. 
Then Sarah was taken to a tent by four women. Lydia and Amy were sternly told to stop where they were. You had better mind what you are at, said Lydia, with a curl of the lip which startled William Hicks. Why? Two hours ago, a mounted messenger started to alarm her friends at the settlement, replied Lydia with a triumphant smile. Damn! shouted several of the Mormons. Who went? said Harry sternly. You are angry. If you knew all, you would not be. Miss Paulding was an old and dear friend, answered Lydia. It matters not, said the young man coldly. The laws of the saints must be obeyed. What mean you? And those who aid and abet traitors must be punished, he continued. Who was the messenger? Jesse. By the foul find, cried William Hicks, that girl will, will be the ruin of us. Phineas Bristow, an elder who hitherto had not said one word, groaned aloud. Let all the women return to their houses, said the elder, who had officiated as priest. The saints will enter into deliberation. The women shuddered and obeyed. There was something in the tone of the man which terrified them. William Hicks hastened to the nuptial tent, turned out the women, and remained alone with his so-called wife. She was seated on a box. But, dearest lady, he began in husky and constrained tones, what is the meaning of this change? Silence After all that passed this morning, he continued, in his old seductive tones, surely you cannot forgive all that was understood. You are a Mormon. Well, answer me. I do, for convenience sake, take that name in order to travel with the tribe. You have two other wives. Well, according to the ideas of the saint I have, but in my own idea, I have only one wife, and that is you, my own dear darling. You are William Hicks, the forger and ambassador, the man who would, if caught, suffer at the old bailey, she continued. Woman, beware, he cried, advancing closer to her, his eyes flashing, half with fury, half with passionate desire. Back! she said. As she spoke, she rose, and showed a sharp knife, which hitherto she had counseled up her sleeve. But William Hicks was nothing daunted by this display. Aha! My Lady Macbeth, this acting will not do. Put down that knife, my dainty wife, or it will be the worse for you. Worse for you, fellow! Use that word again, he said, with sullen and lowering brow, and you will repent it the longest day you live. Would you strike me, coward? cried the exacerbated girl. A cold gleam of concentrated fury shot through his eyes, as, with a cry of frantic rage, he flew at her. She drew back, and cold and firm stepped right at him. He fell to the ground weltering in his blood, after giving one despairing cry for help. Murder! Help! In they poured, to find her standing calm, resolute form, with the bloody knife held high above her head. Men, women, boys came rushing, and were scared by the sight before them. A man approached Hicks, while Shara, without the slightest hesitation, allowed herself to be disarmed. Is he dead? she whispered. I know not, murderers, but dead or living, you shall die the death, cried one of the elders. Anything better than his paramour, she replied. Bind her. Let all leave but elders, continued the speaker. Remove the wounded man to his own wagon. 
after some little difficulty and hesitation this order was obeyed and sarah remained in the tent with the twelve elders a brief conference was held in low hushed whispers and then sarah was seized blindfolded gagged and taken out into the open air she felt herself placed upon a horse the clatter of other horses' hoofs could be heard around her. And then she was hurried away at a rapid rate. Presently they halted. They were in a dreary kind of dell, overshadowed by tall and wavy pine trees. They ungagged her, took off the bandage from her eyes, without untying her hands, and seated her on the grass. Two lanterns were placed upon the ground about seven feet apart. Then a pickaxe and two shovels were produced, and three men, casting off their coats, began to dig. Anyone could see at once that they were digging a grave. Sarah shuddered. It was her dust to die in her unrepented scene. She had acted in self-defense, but her hands were red with blood. It seemed a kind of retribution that she too should perish by a violent death. The idea of past happy days came over her, and the thought forced itself upon her that she had been a wicked and ungrateful girl. Her uncle's character now appeared in a clear and vivid light, the light of truth and reason. How could she have so misjudged him? But these ideas availed her no longer. She was in the hands of man, actuated by wild feelings of revenge. She knew that she was going to die. It was strange, but she looked on at the preparations with a strange, odd, wild kind of curiosity. They were digging a mere hole in the earth. But then what a hole! Not one spoke to her, reproached her, or alluded to the crime or the punishment. They were sullen, silent and didn't even speak among themselves. Whenever they glanced at the wretched girl, it was with looks of the most virulent hatred and scorn. Up in the heavens, not one of the starry lamps illuminated the horrid, the fearful, and unparalleled scene. Sarah had been to a certain extent religiously educated, though a fond mother had nurtured her pride. She thought for a moment, and then murmured a prayer. It was time. Two of the men raised her and placed her in the deep hole, which was almost up to her beautiful cold neck. Then, while these two held her with the rigidity of bars of iron, the others began to shovel in the earth. Then the agonizing and maddening thought entered her brain that they were going to bury her alive. This was too much for her, and she burst forth with the most awful shrieks that female throat ever tittered. Silence. Never. I will not be murdered. Let me have a fair trial. If you are a man, you will not thus ill use a poor girl. Gag her, said a sullen ruffian. Again she gave a wild and horrible shriek. It resounded through the hills with fearful intensity. It was the agony of death. But then they gagged her. Then the men who were walking did all they could, and in a few minutes the art was up to her neck. She struggled fearfully, but it was of no avail. Hark! What noise is that? All listened. It was a trampling of horses. Mountain fly! Smothered a hell cat, some of you, shouted one of the Mormons. She had forced off her gag and had given another fearful shriek. Kill, slay, burn, shouted a maddened and infuriated voice. No quarter to the bloody hatton. Every Mormon shuddered, and abandoning pickaxes, shovels, and lanterns, they rushed to their horses, mounted, and flew. Like a whirlwind, a body of mountain men sped by in chase. But two figures halted, one of them bounded 
to the grave, and casting himself flat on the ground, gazed in agony at the pale face of the girl. Dead, dead, my life, my soul, my own darling Sarah, said a manly voice, in tones of fearful suffering. Not dead, but she has fainted, said Jessie, dismounting. Take away the earth, quick, I will support her head. The young man did, as he was told, working with the strength and vigor of a young titanic giant. In a very brief space of the, he had released her. A flask of brandy scattered over her face and pressed to her lips brought her to. Charles, dear Charles, she said, clasping him round the neck and kissing his very lips. Was that a horrid dream? No, 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 take me away. I know I am going to die, but take me home. Will you forgive me, Charlie? I am very sorry. I wouldn't do it again. But you know that now. Let me die where aunt and uncle will be there to forgive me. I couldn't help it. He wanted to marry me. Yeah, I killed him. Killed him? gasped Jessie. So out of breath, said Charles, lifting her up in his arms. But do not die. You shall not. Will not die. You will live to be my happy, dear, and honored wife. You won't let them bury me alive, said Sarah wildly. But, um, no, shrieked Charles, who saw that her head was slightly wandering. He raised her quite up now and placed her on a horse. Jessie mounted and he wept. In this way they reached the settlement, where none but women and children awaited them. The men were all out after the Mormons. At the entrance of the house, Jessie paused. Will you not go back? J. Charles and seriously, I must, but not directly. Step and see how she is. Besides, if the people must be strong enough, not a Mormon will leave the country alive. Jessie sighed and went in. They put Sarah to bed, and under the judicious care of Mrs. Spaulding, she so far recovered in the farming as to be able to converse rationally. She did not recollect all that passed except as a kind of fearful dream or nightmare. She got up to breakfast. The old man and Charles advanced to meet her with eager and sympathizing looks. How do you feel, my child? said the uncle kindly. Like an erring child, seeking the pardon of her father, said Sarah, falling on her knees before the whole family. I'll shrive you on one condition said the old man. And that, said Sarah, rising and taking a chair, it is that you become my daughter as soon as possible. Yes, Sarah, promise to be my wife, and all will be happy. If you are not afraid to take a weak, silly, and vain girl to be your handmaiden, Charles, I shall be too proud to have, have won your honest heart, she replied. Though I am not a gentleman, said the delighted lover. Don't say that again. I had enough of that yesterday. Have you heard? She said with a shudder. The man is out of danger, replied Charles. The miscreants who abducted you have fled far away, and the whole Mormon gang have left our state. Or else... No message for me? said Jesse sadly. A letter replied Charles. But why, from a mistaken sense of duty, return to such infamous bondage? I have promised. But such promises, surely you do not hold them binding. All and every promise, besides, those who love me are on the track. I know I am in no danger. Give me the letter. Jessie read it, but made no remark. She took her breakfast quietly and then wishing them all farewell, left, after a solemn promise to call if she ever passed that way. 
such is a portion of a mormon episode of everyday occurrence and which only did not end in the usual disastrous manner because the woman had both a bold and valiant heart and a sympathizing friend end of buried alive from jesse the mormon's daughter The Horned Women, a Celtic Folk Tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Taran Maximilian Defoe. The Horned Women, a Celtic Folk Tale by Lady Jane Francesca Wilde. A rich woman sat up late one night, carding and preparing wool, while all the family and servants were asleep. Suddenly, a knock was given at the door, and a voice called, Open! Open! Who is there? said the woman of the house. I am the witch of the one horn, was answered. The mistress, supposing that one of her neighbors had called and required assistance, opened the door, and a woman entered, having in her hand a pair of wool carders, and bearing a horn on her forehead, as if growing there. She sat down by the fire in silence, and begun to card the wool with violent haste. Suddenly she paused and said aloud, Where are the women? They delay too long. Then a second knock came to the door, and a voice called as before, Open! Open! The mistress felt herself constrained to rise and open to the call, and immediately a second witch entered, having two horns on her forehead, and in her hand a wheel for spinning the wool. "'Give me place,' she said. "'I am the witch of the two horns.' And she began to spin as quick as lightning. And so the knocks went on, and the call was heard, and the witches entered, until at last twelve women sat round the fire, the first with one horn, the last with twelve horns, and they carded the thread and turned their spinning wheels and wound and wove, all singing together, in an ancient rhyme, but no word did they speak to the mistress of the house. Strange to hear, and frightful to look upon, were these twelve women, with their horns and their wheels, and the mistress felt near to death, and she tried to rise, that she might call for help, but she could not move, nor could she utter a word or a cry, for the spell of the witches was upon her. Then one of them called to her in Irish, and said, Rise, woman, make us a cake. Then the mistress searched for a vessel to bring water from the well, that she might mix the meal and make the cake, but she could find none. And they said to her, Take a sieve and bring water in it. And she took the sieve and went to the well, but the water poured from it, and she could fetch none for the cake. And she sat down by the well and wept. Then a voice came by her and said, Take yellow clay and moss, and bind them together, and plaster the sieve so that it will hold. This she did, and the sieve held the water for the cake. And the voice said again, Return, and when thou comest to the north angle of the house, cry aloud three times and say, The mountain of the Finian women, and the sky over it, is all on fire. And she did so. When the witches inside heard the call, a great and terrible cry broke from their lips, and they rushed forth with wild lamentations and shrieks and fled away to Slevenamon, where was their chief abode. But the spirit of the well bade the mistress of the house to enter and prepare her home against the enchantments of the witches if they returned again. And first, to break their spells, she sprinkled the water in which she had washed her child's feet the feet water, outside the door on the threshold. Secondly, she took the cake which the witches had made in her absence, of meal mixed with blood drawn from the sleeping family. And as she broke the cake in bits, and placed a bit in the mouth of each sleeper, and they were restored, and she took the cloth they had woven and placed it half in and half out of the chest with the padlock, and lastly, 
she secured the door with a great crossbeam fastened in the jams, so that they could not enter, and having done these things, she waited. Not long were the witches in coming back, and they raged and called for vengeance. Open, open, they screamed. Open, feet water. I cannot, said the feet water. I am scattered on the ground, and my path is down to the low. Open, open, wood and tree and beam, they cried to the door. I cannot, said the door, for the beam is fixed in the jams, and I have no power to move. Open, open, cake that we have made and mingled with blood, they cried again. I cannot, said the cake, for I am broken and bruised, and my blood is on the lips of the sleeping children. Then the witches rushed through the air with great cries and fled back to Sleeve Namon, uttering strange curses on the spirit of the well, who had wished their ruin. But the woman and the house were left in peace, and a mantle dropped by one of the witches in her flight was kept hung up by the mistress as a sign of the night's awful contest, and this mantle was in possession of the same family from generation to generation for five hundred years after. End of The Horned Women A Celtic Folktale by Lady Jane Francesca Wilde Recorded by Taran Maximilian Defoe, in Los Angeles, California, September 28, 2010. The Corpse on the Grating by Hugh B. Cave This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aidan Brack The Corpse on the Grating by Hugh B. Cave It was a corpse, standing before me like some propped-up thing from the grave. It was ten o'clock on the morning of December 5th, when M.S. and I left the study of Professor Daimler. You are perhaps acquainted with M.S. His name appears constantly in the pages of the Illustrated News, in conjunction with some very technical article on psychoanalysis or with some extensive study of the human brain and its functions. He is a psychofanatic, more or less, and has spent an entire lifetime of some seventy-odd years in pulling apart human skulls for the purpose of investigation. Lovely pursuit. In the gloomy depths of the old warehouse, Dale saw a thing that drew a scream of horror to his dry lips. It was a corpse, the mould of decay on its long-dead features, and yet it was alive. For some twenty years I had mocked him, in a friendly, half-hearted fashion. I am a medical man, and my own profession is one that does not sympathise with radicals. As for Professor Daimler, the third member of our triangle, perhaps if I take a moment to outline the events of that evening, the Professor's part in what follows will be less obscure. We had called on him, M.S. and I, at his urgent request. His rooms were in a narrow, unlighted street just off the square, and Daimler himself opened the door to us. A tall, loosely built chap he was, standing in the doorway like a motionless ape, arms half extended. I've summoned you, gentlemen, he said quietly, because you two, of all London, are the only persons who know the nature of my recent experiments. I should like to acquaint you with the results. He led the way to his study, then kicked the door shut with his foot, seizing my arm as he did so. Quietly he dragged me to the table that stood against the farther wall. In the same even, unemotional tone of a man completely sure of himself, he commanded me to inspect it. For a moment, in the semi-gloom of the room, I saw nothing. At length, however, the contents of the table revealed themselves and I distinguished a motley collection of test tubes, each filled with some fluid. The tubes were attached to each other by some ingenious arrangement of thistles, and at the end of the table, where a chance blow could not brush it aside, lay a tiny phial of the resulting serum. From the appearance of the table, Daimler had evidently drawn a certain amount of gas 
from each of the smaller tubes, distilling them through acid into the minute phial at the end. Yet even now, as I stared down at the fantastic paraphernalia before me, I could sense no conclusive reason for its existence. I turned to the professor with a quiet stare of bewilderment. He smiled. The experiment is over, he said. As to its conclusion, you, Dale, as a medical man, will be sceptical. And you, turning to MS, as a scientist, you will be amazed. I, being neither physician nor scientist, am merely filled with wonder. He stepped to a long, square table-like structure in the centre of the room. Standing over it, he glanced quizzically at MS, then at me. For a period of two weeks, he went on, I have kept on the table here the body of a man who has been dead more than a month. I have tried, gentlemen, with acid combinations of my own origination, to bring that body back to life. And I have failed. But, he added quickly, noting the smile that crept across my face, that failure was in itself worth more than the average scientist's greatest achievement. You know, Dale, that heat, if a man is not truly dead, will sometimes resurrect him. In a case of epilepsy, for instance, victims have been pronounced dead only to return to life, sometimes in the grave. I say, if a man be not truly dead, but what if that man is truly dead? Does the cure alter itself in any manner? The motor of your car dies. Do you bury it? You do not. You locate the faulty part, correct it, and infuse new life. And so, gentlemen, after remedying the ruptured heart of this dead man, by operation, I proceeded to bring him back to life. I used heat. Terrific heat will sometimes originate a spark of new life in something long dead. Gentlemen, on the fourth day of my tests, following a continued application of electric and acid heat, the patient, Daimler leaned over the table and took up a cigarette. Lighting it, he dropped the match and resumed his monologue. The patient turned suddenly over and drew his arm weakly across his eyes. I rushed to his side. When I reached him, the body was once again stiff and lifeless, and it has remained so. The professor stared at us quietly, waiting for comment. I answered him, as carelessly as I could, with a shrug of my shoulders. Professor, have you ever played with the dead body of a frog? I said softly. He shook his head silently. You would find it interesting sport, I told him. Take a common dry cell battery with enough voltage to render a sharp shock. Then apply your wires to various parts of the frog's anatomy. If you are lucky and strike the right set of muscles, you will have the pleasure of seeing a dead frog leap suddenly forward. Understand he will not regain life. You have merely released his dead muscles by shock and sent him bolting. The professor did not reply. I could feel his eyes on me, and, had I turned, I should probably have found M.S. glaring at me in honest hate. These men were students of mesmerism, of spiritualism, and my commonplace contradiction was not overwelcome. You are cynical, Dale, said M.S. coldly, because you do not understand. Understand? I am a doctor, not a ghost. But M.S. had turned eagerly to the professor. Where is this body? This experiment, he demanded. Daimler shook his head. Evidently, he had acknowledged failure, and did not intend to drag his dead man before our eyes, unless he could bring that man forth alive, upright, and ready to join our conversation. I've put it away, he said distantly. There is nothing more to be done, now that our reverend doctor has insisted in making a matter-of-fact thing out of our experiment. You understand, I had not intended to go in for wholesale resurrection. Even if I had met with success, it was my belief that a dead body, like a dead piece of mechanism, can be brought to life again, provided we are intelligent enough to discover the secret. And by God, it is still my belief. That was the situation, then, when M.S. and I paced slowly back along the narrow street that contained the professor's dwelling place. My companion was strangely silent. More than once I felt his eyes upon me in an uncomfortable stare, yet he said nothing. Nothing, that is, until I had opened the conversation with some casual remark about the lunacy of the man we had just left. 
You are wrong in mocking him, Dale, M.S. replied bitterly. Daimler is a man of science. He is no child experimenting with a toy. He is a grown man who has the courage to believe in his powers. One of these days. He had intended to say that someday I should respect the professor's efforts. One of these days. The interval of time was far shorter than anything so indefinite. The first event, with its succeeding series of horrors, came within the next three minutes. We had reached a more deserted section of the square, a black, uninhabited street, extending like a shadowed band of darkness between gaunt high walls. I had noticed for some time that the stone structure beside us seemed to be unbroken by door or window, that it appeared to be a single gigantic building, black and forbidding. I mentioned the fact to M.S. The warehouse, he said simply. A lonely, godforsaken place. We shall probably see the flicker of the watchman's light in one of the upper chinks. At his words, I glanced up. True enough, the higher part of the grim structure was punctured by narrow barred openings. Safety vaults, probably. But the light, unless its tiny gleam was somewhere in the inner recesses of the warehouse, was dead. The great building was like an immense burial vault, a tomb, silent and lifeless. We had reached the most forbidding section of the narrow street, where a single arch lamp overhead cast a halo of ghastly yellow light over the pavement. At the very rim of the circle of illumination, where the shadows were deeper and more silent, I could make out the black mouldings of a heavy iron grating. The bars of metal were designed, I believe, to seal the side entrance of the great warehouse from night marauders. It was bolted in place and secured with a set of immense chains, immovable. This much I saw as my intent gaze swept the wall before me. This huge tomb of silence held for me a peculiar fascination, and as I paced along beside my gloomy companion, I stared directly ahead of me into the darkness of the street. I wish to God my eyes had been closed or blinded. He was hanging on the grating, hanging there with white twisted hands clutching the rigid bars of iron, straining to force them apart. His whole distorted body was forced against the barrier, like the form of a madman, struggling to escape from his cage. His face, the image of it still haunts me whenever I see iron bars in the darkness of a passage, was the face of a man who has died from utter stark horror. It was frozen in a silent shriek of agony, staring out at me with fiendish maliciousness, lips twisted apart, white teeth gleaming in the light, bloody eyes with a horrible glare of colourless pigment, and dead. I believe M.S. saw him at the very instant I recoiled. I felt a sudden grip on my arm, and then, as an exclamation came harshly from my companion's lips, I was pulled forward roughly. I found myself staring straight into the dead eyes of that fearful thing before me, found myself standing rigid, motionless before the corpse that hung within reach of my arm. And then, through that overwhelming sense of the horrible, came the quiet voice of my comrade, the voice of a man who looks upon death as nothing more than an opportunity for research. The fellow has been frightened to death, Dale. Frightened most horribly. Note the expression of his mouth. The evident struggle to force these bars apart and escape. Something has driven fear to his soul killed him. I remember the words vaguely. When M.S. had finished speaking, I did not reply. Not until he had stepped forward and bent over the distorted face of the thing before me did I attempt to speak. When I did, my thoughts were a jargon. What, in God's name, I cried, could have brought such horrors to a strong man? What? Loneliness, perhaps, suggested M.S. with a smile. The fellow is evidently the watchman. He is alone, in a huge deserted pit of darkness for hours at a time. His light is merely a ghostly ray of illumination, hardly enough to do more than increase the darkness. I have heard of such cases before. He shrugged his shoulders. Even as he spoke, I sensed the evasion in his words. When I replied, he hardly heard my answer, for he had suddenly stepped forward, where he could directly look into those fear-twisted eyes. Dale, he said at length, turning slowly to face me, you ask for an explanation of this horror. 
there is an explanation. It is written with an almost fearful clearness on this fellow's mind. Yet, if I tell you, you will return to your old scepticism, your damnable habit of disbelief. I looked at him quietly. I had heard M.S. claim at other times that he could read the thoughts of a dead man by the mental image that lay on that man's brain. I had laughed at him. Evidently, in the present moment, he recalled those laughs. Nevertheless, he faced me seriously. I can see two things, Dale, he said deliberately. One of them is a dark, narrow room, a room piled with indistinct boxes and crates, and with an open door bearing the black number 4167. And in that open doorway, coming forward with slow steps, alive with arms extended and a frightful face of passion, is a decayed human form. A corpse, Dale. A man who has been dead for many days, and is now alive. M.S. turned slowly, and pointed with upraised hand to the corpse on the grating. That is why, he said simply, this fellow died from horror. His words died into emptiness. For a moment I stared at him. Then, in spite of our surroundings, in spite of the late hour, the loneliness of the street, the awful thing beside us, I laughed. He turned upon me with a snarl. For the first time in my life I saw Emma's convulsed with rage. His old, lined face had suddenly become savage with intensity. You laugh at me, Dale, he thundered. By God, you make a mockery out of a science that I have spent more than my life in studying. You call yourself a medical man, and you are not fit to carry the name. I will wager you, man, that your laughter is not backed by courage. I fell away from him. Had I stood within reach, I am sure he would have struck me. Struck me! And I have been nearer to M.S. for the past ten years than any man in London. And, as I retreated from his temper, he reached forward to seize my arm. I could not help but feel impressed at his grim intentness. Look here, Dale, he said bitterly. I will wager you a hundred pounds that you will not spend the remainder of this night in the warehouse above you. I will wager a hundred pounds against your own courage that you will not back your laughter by going through what this fellow has gone through, that you will not prowl through the corridors of this great structure until you have found room 4167, and remain in that room until dawn. There was no choice. I glanced at the dead man, at the face of fear, and the clutching, twisted hands, and a cold dread filled me. But to refuse my friend's wager would have been to brand myself an empty coward. I had mocked him. Now, whatever the cost, I must stand ready to pay for that mockery. Room 4167, I replied quietly, in a voice which I made every effort to control, lest he should discover the tremor in it. Very well, I will do it. It was nearly midnight when I found myself alone, climbing a musty, winding ramp between the first and second floors of the deserted building. Not a sound except the sharp intake of my breath and the dismal creak of the wooden stairs echoed through that tomb of death. There was no light, not even the usual dim glow that is left to illuminate an unused corridor. Moreover, I had brought no means of light with me, nothing but a half-empty box of safety matches, which, by some unholy premonition, I had forced myself to save for some future moment. The stairs were black and difficult, and I mounted them slowly, groping with both hands along the rough wall. I had left M.S. some moments before. In his usual decisive manner, he had helped me to climb the iron grating, and lower myself to the sealed alleyway on the farther side. Then, leaving him without a word, for I was bitter against the triumphant tone of his parting words, I proceeded into the darkness, fumbling forward until I had discovered the open door in the lower part of the warehouse. And then the ramp, winding crazily upward, 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 seemingly without end. I was seeking blindly for that particular room which was to be my destination. Room 4167, with its high number, could hardly be on the lower floors, and so I had stumbled upward. It was at the entrance of the second floor corridor that I struck the first of my desultory supply of matches, and by its light discovered a placard nailed to the wall. The thing was yellow with age, and hardly legible. In the drab light of the match, I had difficulty in reading it, but, as far as I can remember, 
the notice went something like this. Warehouse Rules 1. No light shall be permitted in any room or corridor as a prevention against fire. 2. No person shall be admitted to rooms or corridors unless accompanied by an employee. 3. A watchman shall be on the premises from 7pm until 6am. He shall make the round of the corridors every hour during that interval, at a quarter past the hour. 4. Rooms are located by their numbers, the first figure in the room number indicating its floor location. I could read no further. The match in my fingers burned to a black thread and dropped. Then, with the burnt stump still in my hand, I groped through the darkness to the bottom of the second ramp. Room 4167, then, was on the fourth floor, the topmost floor of the structure. I must confess that the knowledge did not bring any renewed burst of courage. The top floor. Three black stair pits would lie between me and the safety of escape. There would be no escape. No human being in the throes of fear could hope to discover that tortured outlet, could hope to grope his way through Stygian gloom down a triple ramp of black stairs. And even though he succeeded in reaching the lower corridors, there was still a blind alleyway, sealed at the outer end by a high grating of iron bars. Escape! The mockery of it caused me to stop suddenly in my ascent and stand rigid, my whole body trembling violently. But outside, in the gloom of the street, M.S. was waiting, waiting with that fiendish glare of triumph that would brand me a man without courage. I could not return to face him, not though all the horrors of hell inhabited this gruesome place of mystery. And horrors must surely inhabit it, else how could one account for that fearful thing on the grazing below? But I had been through horror before. I had seen a man supposedly dead on the operating table, jerk suddenly to his feet and scream. I had seen a young girl, not long before, awake in the midst of an operation, with the knife already in her frail body. Surely, after those definite horrors, no unknown danger would send me cringing back to the man who was waiting so bitterly for me to return. Those were the thoughts pregnant in my mind as I groped slowly, cautiously, along the corridor of the upper floor, searching each closed door for the indistinct number 4167. The place was like the centre of a huge labyrinth, a spider web of black, repelling passages, leading into some central chamber of utter silence and blackness. I went forward with dragging steps, fighting back the dread that gripped me as I went farther and farther from the outlet of escape. And then, after losing myself completely in the gloom, I threw aside all thoughts of return and pushed on with a careless surface bravado and laughed aloud. So, at length, I reached that room of horror, secreted high in the deeper recesses of the deserted warehouse. The number, God grant I never see it again, was scrawled in black chalk on the door. 4167. I pushed the half-open barrier wide and entered. It was a small room, even as M.S. had forewarned me, or as the dead mind of that thing on the grate had forewarned M.S. The glow of my outthrust match revealed a great stack of dusty boxes and crates piled against the farther wall. Revealed, too, the black corridor beyond the entrance and a small upright table before me. It was the table and the stool beside it that drew my attention and brought a muffled exclamation from my lips. The thing had been thrust out of its usual place, pushed aside as if some frenzied shape had lunged against it. I could make out its former position by the marks on the dusty floor at my feet. Now it was nearer to the centre of the room, and had been wrenched sideways from its holdings. A shudder took hold of me as I looked at it. A living person, sitting on the stool before me, staring at the door, would have wrenched the table in just this manner, in his frenzy to escape from the room. The light of the match died, plunging me into a pit of gloom. I struck another, and stepped closer to the table. And there, on the floor, I found two more things that brought fear to my soul. One of them was a heavy flash lamp, a watchman's lamp, where it had evidently been dropped, been dropped in flight. But what awful terror must have gripped the fellow 
to make him forsake his only means of escape through those black passages. And the second thing, a worn copy of a leather-bound book flung open on the boards below the stool. The flash lamp, thank God, had not been shattered. I switched it on, directing its white circle of light over the room. This time, in the vivid glare, the room became even more unreal. Black walls, clumsy distorted shadows on the wall, thrown by those huge piles of wooden boxes. Shadows that were like crouching men groping toward me, and beyond, where the single door opened into a passage of Stygian darkness. That yawning entrance was thrown into hideous detail. Had any upright figure been standing there, the light would have made an unholy phosphorescent spectre out of it. I summoned enough courage to cross the room and pull the door shut. There was no way of locking it. Had I been able to fasten it, I should surely have done so. But the room was evidently an unused chamber, filled with empty refuse. This was the reason, probably, why the watchman had made use of it as a retreat during the intervals between his rounds. But I had no desire to ponder over the sordidness of my surroundings. I returned to my stool in silence, and, stooping, picked up the fallen book from the floor. Carefully I placed the lamp on the table, where its light would shine on the open page. Then, turning the cover, I began to glance through the thing which the man before me had evidently been studying, and before I had read two lines, the explanation of the whole horrible thing struck me. I stared dumbly down at the little book and laughed, laughed harshly, so that the sound of my mad cackle echoed in a thousand ghastly reverberations through the dead corridors of the building. It was a book of horror, of fantasy, a collection of weird, terrifying supernatural tales with grotesque illustrations in funereal black and white. And the very line I had turned to, the line which had probably struck terror to that unlucky devil's soul, explained MS's decayed human form, standing in the doorway with arms extended and a frightful face of passion. The description, the same description, lay before me, almost in my friend's words. Little wonder that the fellow on the grating below, after reading this orgy of horror, had suddenly gone mad with fright. Little wonder that the picture engraved on his dead mind was a picture of a corpse standing in the doorway of room 4167. I glanced at that doorway and laughed. No doubt of it, it was that awful description, in MS's untempered language, that had made me dread my surroundings, not the loneliness and silence of the corridors about me. Now, as I stared at the room, the closed door, the shadows on the wall, I could not repress a grin. But the grin was not long in duration. A six-hour siege awaited me before I could hear the sound of human voice again. Six hours of silence and gloom. I did not relish it. Thank God the fellow before me had had foresight enough to leave his book of fantasy for my amusement. I turned to the beginning of the story. A lovely beginning it was, outlining in some detail how a certain Jack Fulton, English adventurer, had suddenly found himself imprisoned by a mysterious black gang of monks or something of the sort in a forgotten cell at the monastery of El Toro. The cell, according to the passages before me, was located in the empty, haunted pits below the stone floors of the structure. Lovely setting. And the brave Fulton had been secured firmly to a huge metal ring set in the farther wall opposite the entrance. I read the description twice. At the end of it, I could not help but lift my head to stare at my own surroundings. Except for the location of the cell, I might have been in the same setting. The same darkness, same silence, same loneliness. Peculiar similarity. And then, Fulton lay quietly, without attempt to struggle. In the dark, the stillness of the vaults became unbearable, terrifying. Not a suggestion of sound, except the scraping of unseen rats. I dropped the book with a start. From the opposite end of the room in which I sat came a half-inaudible scuffling noise the sound of hidden rodents scrambling through the great pile of boxes. Imagination? I'm not so sure. At the moment, I would have sworn that the sound was a definite one, that I had heard it distinctly. Now, as I recount this tale of horror, I am not sure. 
but I am sure of this. There was no smile on my lips as I picked up the book again, with trembling fingers, and continued. The sound died into silence. For an eternity the prisoner lay rigid, staring at the open door of his cell. The opening was black, deserted, like the mouth of a deep tunnel leading to hell. And then suddenly, from the gloom beyond that opening, came an almost noiseless padded footfall. This time there was no doubt of it. The book fell from my fingers, dropped to the floor with a clatter. Yet even through the sound of its falling, I heard that fearful sound, the shuffle of a living foot. I sat motionless, staring with bloodless face at the door of room 4167. And as I stared, the sound came again, and again. The slow dread of dragging footsteps, approaching along the black corridor without. I got to my feet like an automaton, swaying heavily. Every drop of courage ebbed from my soul as I stood there, one hand clutching the table, waiting. And then, with an effort, I moved forward. My hand was outstretched to grasp the wooden handle of the door, and I did not have the courage. Like a cowed beast, I crept back to my place and slumped down on the stool, my eyes still transfixed in a mute stare of terror. I waited. For more than half an hour I waited, motionless. Not a sound stirred in the passage beyond that closed barrier. Not a suggestion of any living presence came to me. Then, leaning back against the wall with a harsh laugh, I wiped away the cold moisture that had trickled over my forehead into my eyes. It was another five minutes before I picked up the book again. You call me a fool for continuing it. A fool? I tell you, even a story of horror is more comfort than a room of grotesque shadows and silence. Even a printed page is better than grim reality. The story was one of suspense. Madness. For the next two pages, I read a cunning description of the prisoner's mental reaction. Strangely enough, it conformed precisely with my own. Fulton's head had fallen to his chest, the script read. For an endless while he did not stir, did not dare to lift his eyes. And then, after more than an hour of silent agony and suspense, the boy's head came up mechanically, came up, and suddenly jerked rigid. A horrible scream burst from his dry lips as he stared, stared like a dead man, at the black entrance to his cell. There, standing without motion in the opening, stood a shrouded figure of death. Empty eyes, glaring with awful hate, bored into his own. Great arms, bony and rotten, extended toward him. Decayed flesh. I read no more. Even as I lunged to my feet, with that mad book still gripped in my hand, I heard the door of my room grind open. I screamed, screamed in utter horror at the thing I saw there. Dead? Good God, I do not know. It was a corpse, a dead human body, standing before me like some propped-up thing from the grave, a face half eaten away, terrible in its leering grin, twisted mouth with only a suggestion of lips curled back over broken teeth, hair writhing distorted like a mass of moving bloody coils, and its arms, ghastly white, bloodless, were extended toward me with open, clutching hands. It was alive! alive. Even while I stood there, crouching against the wall, it stepped forward toward me. I saw a heavy shudder pass over it, and the sound of its scraping feet burned its way into my soul. And then, with its second step, the fearful thing stumbled to its knees. The white gleaming arms, thrown into streaks of living fire by the light of my lamp, flung violently upwards, twisting towards the ceiling. I saw the grin change to an expression of agony, of torment, and then the thing crashed upon me, dead. With a great cry of fear, I stumbled to the door. I groped out of that room of horror, stumbled along the corridor. No light. I left it behind on the table to throw a circle of white glare over the decayed, living dead intruder who had driven me mad. My return down those winding ramps to the lower floor was a nightmare of fear. I remembered that I stumbled, as I plunged through the darkness like a man gone mad. I had no thought of caution, no thought of anything except escape. And then the lower door, 
and the alley of gloom. I reached the grating, flung myself upon it, and pressed my face against the bars in a futile effort to escape, the same as the fear-tortured man who had come before me. I felt strong hands lifting me up, a dash of cool air, and then the refreshing patter of falling rain. It was the afternoon of the following day, December 6th, when M. S. sat across the table from me in my own study. I had made a rather hesitant attempt to tell him, without dramatics, and without dwelling on my own lack of courage, of the events of the previous night. "'You deserved it, Dale,' he said quietly. "'You are a medical man, nothing more, and yet you mock the beliefs of a scientist as great as Daimler. I wonder, do you still mock the professor's beliefs?' that he can bring a dead man to life? I smiled, a bit doubtfully. I will tell you something, Dale, said M.S. deliberately. He was leaning across the table, staring at me. The professor made only one mistake in his great experiment. He did not wait long enough for the effect of his strange acids to work. He acknowledged failure too soon and got rid of the body. He paused. When the professor stored his patient away, Dale, he said quietly, he stored it in room 4170 at the great warehouse. If you are acquainted with the place, you will know that room 4170 is directly across the corridor from 4167. End of the Corpse on the Grating Recording by Aidan Brack In Atlanta on September 29, 2010The Murderer by Richard Middleton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Taran Maximilian Defoe. The Murderer by Richard Middleton. He walked down to the embankment with the paving stones like velvet under his feet, and he swerved like one running. Yet still, though he meant to end his life in a few minutes, he avoided the traffic with great care, so that paternal policemen judged him newly from the country. The August sun seemed pitiless in its strength, and in his fear and wretchedness he cursed it. Better rain, mist, fog, anything but the reproachful blue of the sky and the dancing glitter of the dust. He wanted sympathy, and instead... Nature triumphed over him and emphasized his failure. The river was a sparkling tumult of gems, where he had pictured a secret immutable surface which should flow darkly over him and his wrongs. In place of a great unspeaking god, he found a crowd of dancing, laughing children. Where should he seek peace and forgetfulness? He leaned on the parapet and groaned. A train thundered by over Hungerford Bridge as if in answer. Of course, that was the way. Safer, quicker. He took a ticket at Charing Cross Station and passed the end of the platform with a strange numbness in his mind and body, as if he were already dead. Yet he walked to the extreme end because there was no one there to interfere. Presently the train appeared, making its way slowly across the bridge, and he leapt off the platform and laid his head on the rail. It blistered his cheek because the sun had made it so hot. Then the earth heaved itself up and thrust and tore him between the wheels of the carriages. When the train had passed, he rose to his feet unsteadily and stared stupidly at the mangled body lying at his feet. There was a shrill singing in his ears, which was shortly interrupted by the sound of human voices and he felt his arms caught roughly and imprisoned. Soon he made out the word, murder, angrily spoken, and found that he was held by plate layers, who were gesticulating violently and pointing at the body, but he would not speak, because though the head had become a crushed horror upon the rail, he knew that the body was his. Dimly, he was aware that porters and policemen were crowding from the station, 
and that they were lifting the body very tenderly from the rails. Then he fainted. He came to in the police station and found that his face and hair were dabbled with water. Presently, he was formally charged and warned not to say anything incriminating. He said only, it was me. But this he repeated several times. He was trying to convince himself. Then he was removed to the cells and found himself alone. He lay down and slept deeply, and the sun had set and risen before he awoke. At his trial, and after conviction, he did not speak. He seemed too dazed, but as they led him away, he broke his silence. Can a man die twice? he inquired reflectively. Can a man die twice? There is no more to chronicle. They were his last recorded words. End of The Murderer by Richard Middleton. Recorded by Taran Maximilian Defoe in Los Angeles, California, September 30th, 2010. The Ghost at the Blue Dragon by William J. Wintle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aidan Brack The Ghost of the Blue Dragon by William J. Wintle The Blue Dragon was one of the oldest and best hotels in Saltminster, and that was saying a good deal. Long before Saltminster became popular as a seaside resort, long before people got into the habit of going to the seaside for holidays or for health, the old market town had been a busy place and its inns were both numerous and good. New ones had sprung up of recent years to meet the needs of the visitors, and as these styled themselves hotels, the older ones had to fall into line and adopt the more ambitious name as well. But although the Blue Dragon now called itself a hotel, and found itself doing more and better business than ever, it had changed very little in the course of the years. It was still a delightfully old-fashioned place. The quaint old rooms remained unaltered, the old English cookery was still the same, and you would look in vain for anything foreign or newfangled. The French cook and the German waiter had never found entrance, and that was one of the reasons why the place was in such repute. You needed to book your room well in advance if you wished to stay at the Blue Dragon. Now Professor Latham wanted to stay at the Blue Dragon, for he knew a good thing when he found it. At Cambridge, where he occupied the chair of Assyrian history, he was better known for his ability as a judge of port than as a lecturer, and when he recommended an hotel, you might be quite sure that both table and cellar would prove to be above reproach. So he booked his room well in advance, and made his way to Saltminster in the middle of July to spend a quiet six weeks, and incidentally to revise the manuscript of his forthcoming book. At the Blue Dragon, he found that he had been allotted a room which met with his full approval. It was in the quietest and most retired part of the house, at the end of a long corridor and looked out upon the salt marshes that ran down to the sea. It was well away from the busier parts of the house, and was on the side remote from the road, and it was furnished in the style of our grandparents, exactly the style that Professor Latham admired and loved. But it had one drawback, which gave the newcomer a distinct shock when he saw it. There were two beds in the room. Having only one body, he had no use for two beds, nor had he the least intention of sharing his room with anyone else. But mine host quickly reassured him. The room was occasionally let to people who required an extra bed, and thus had been provided with one, but of course it would not be in use while the professor occupied the room. Mine host trusted the bed would not be in the professor's way. It was only kept furnished with the usual bedding, because a dismantled bed looked so uncomfortable. The professor assured him that he did not mind in the least if the bed was not used. It would do to put things on. So he proceeded to unpack his bag and to throw the contents about the room in the careless style that was the despair of his housekeeper at Cambridge. The spare bed was soon pretty well concealed beneath scattered articles of clothing, books, bundles of manuscript, and other things. Then he went for a walk, located the principal streets and buildings with the aid of the local map, which was always his first purchase on arriving at any strange place, noted sundry second-hand bookshops and curio shops for further investigation at leisure, and finally made his way down to the shore, gazed with disapproval at the mixed bathing, 
and then absorbed himself in the alleged history of the town as set forward in a local guidebook. Now, Professor Latham was an authority on history, and had a keen scent for fiction masquerading as fact, so he duly appreciated a detailed account of the visit of Queen Elizabeth to the town, and her stay at the Blue Dragon, at a date when she was unquestionably lying ill at the old palace at Richmond, which she was never to leave alive. But he cared less for various ghost stories, all of which seemed to be connected in one way or another with the Blue Dragon. If they were all to be believed, that famous hostelry must have been a somewhat exciting place to stay at in the olden days. The professor did not believe in ghosts. He dealt in facts, and had no use for fancies. He had never yet met with a ghost story that would stand looking into, or even telling a second time. Tales of that sort always crumbled to bits when you began to ask questions. Nobody whom he had met had ever seen a ghost, though plenty of them knew other people who had seen one, and he knew the worthlessness of second-hand evidence. Still, it was a little amusing to find that the Blue Dragon had been the scene of so many legends of this kind. It was just as well that he knew better than to trouble about such absurdities, or he might not have slept well. He would be able to tell his friends that he had stayed in a very nest of ghosts, and had proved by experience that there was nothing at all in it. He returned to the hotel in time to dress for dinner, and at once noticed that the things he had left on the spare bed had been removed and placed carefully on the table. Evidently the chambermaid had been at work in his absence, but he rather wished she would leave things alone. He put them back on the bed, and hoped that she would take the hint. Then he dressed and went down to dinner. The dinner met with his entire approval. The turbot was perfection, and the saddle of mutton was exactly as it should be. He sampled the famous 58 port, of which he had heard good accounts, and he fully endorsed the accounts. He also finished the bottle. Professor Latham knew a good thing when he met it, and he never let it go to waste. Then he smoked a leisurely cigar, drank his coffee to the accompaniment of some particularly fine old brandy, and went up to bed, on excellent terms with himself and with all the world beside. When he reached his room, he paused and reflected. Surely he put those things back on the bed before he went down to dinner, and now they are on the table again. Confound that chambermaid! But was he quite sure that he put them back? He thought so, but really that port was uncommonly fine, and the brandy was the genuine article. But did he put those things back, or did he only intend to do so? Really, it was too absurd that he could not remember a simple thing like that. Let's see. What was the date? Fifty-eight, of course, but why should the waiter meddle with his arrangements of the room? No, not the waiter. It must have been the chambermaid. Or were the things on the table after all? Why couldn't he remember a simple little thing like that? It must be the sea air. Better go to bed, and not bother any more about it. So Professor Latham threw the things back on the bed, except those that fell on the floor, and turned into the other bed. He murmured fifty-eight twice, and then slept the sleep of the man who has dined. Not for worlds would we suggest that Professor Latham was either merry, elevated, well-oiled, three sheets in the wind, or anything other than as sober as a judge after an assize dinner. Thus it can only be regarded as remarkable that his sleep should have been disturbed by persistent dreams. And it was still more remarkable that all his dreams had to do with that other bed. He dreamed that it was occupied. He dreamed that he was aroused by the sound of, well, heavy breathing, and the sound came from the other bed. He struck a match and lit the candle that stood by his bedside. When it had left off spluttering, he saw that the things he had laid on the other bed were no longer there, but a mountain seemed to have arisen in the midst of the bed. It was occupied. Now, who could have the confounded impertinence? He would have a few plain words with the landlord in the morning about this. Then he thought that he carefully got out of bed, said things to himself as his bare foot trod on a collar stud that some fool must have thrown on the floor, and made his way to the other bed to see who the intruder was. He had already noted that the man was an ugly-looking fellow, red-headed, and provided with a nose whose colour suggested that water disagreed with him, probably some drunken roisterer who had come home late and had mistaken the room. He would enlighten him on the subject. He took the candle to the bedside of the intruder, turned back the sheet to reveal the face more completely, and saw himself. Then he seized himself by the shoulder and shook himself, with the result that himself woke up and hit him in the eye. A tremendous tussle followed. Himself jumped out of bed and knocked him down, 
but he got up again and tripped himself up and got the head of himself into chancery. When himself got free, it was clear that both of him were in a distinctly nasty temper. A stand-up fight followed, resulting in considerable damage to both himself and him. But finally he knocked himself down with a crash that shook the universe and woke up Professor Latham. The professor was quite annoyed. He usually slept well and was rarely troubled by dreams. He struck a light to see the time and then noticed that all the things he had thrown on the other bed were now lying in a heap on the floor. Now this was beyond a joke. It could not be the chambermaid this time. Was it possible that when he threw the things on the bed overnight, his aim was not quite straight? The thought was not an agreeable one to a man like himself of strictly sober habits. Anyway, the things could not lie on the floor, so he got out and once more put them on the other bed. Then he turned in and dozed and dreamed until the morning. And his dreams were still occupied with that second bed, which seemed fated to destroy his rest. When he rose next morning, the first thing that met his eye was that troublesome bed, and what he saw made him rub his eyes and wonder if he were awake or asleep. The things he had put on it during the night were now once more scattered about the floor. But this was not all. The bed had apparently been slept in. The bedclothes were thrown back, as if someone had just risen, and there was a depression in the middle of the bed and on the pillow which could only be accounted for by someone having slept there. But the thing was simply impossible. Professor Latham went straight to the door and found that it was locked as he had left it overnight. No one could have come in. Who then slept in that other bed? It was an uncomfortable kind of question. There seemed to be only three possible explanations of the affair. He might have risen in his sleep and changed into the other bed. But if so, he must have changed back again, for he was in the right bed when he woke up. He was not addicted to walking in his sleep, and the thing seemed very improbable. Or the bed might have been disturbed without anyone sleeping in it. But if so, who disturbed it? No one could have done it but himself, so this did not help matters much. The third possible explanation was that someone other than himself had really been lying in that bed at some time during the night, but had gone before he woke up. But if so, it must have been someone who could enter a locked room and leave it again without making any sign. This was an unpleasant kind of suggestion, and he did not dwell on it. As we have said, he did not believe in ghosts, and besides, who ever heard of a ghost sleeping in a bed, or anywhere else for the matter of that? He thought and thought, and the more he thought, the less he liked it. Mysteries were not in his line, and he did not want to be mixed up in any. So he dismissed the matter from his mind, with a private resolve to avoid the fifty-eight port at dinner, and went downstairs to breakfast. On his way he met the chambermaid, and learned from her that she had not moved any things off the bed in his room. After breakfast he went up to his room in search of a book that he intended to take with him and read out of doors, and was just going to enter when he heard someone talking in the room. He paused and listened. Yes, there was certainly someone in there, and he seemed out of temper. What he was saying Professor Latham could not hear, but the tone of the voice was distinctly unamiable, and the oddest thing about it was that it sounded just like his own voice, as he had once heard it in a gramophone. But whoever the intruder might be, he had no right in that room, and the professor entered with the full intention of telling him so in unmistakable terms. He went in with a frown on his brow, but this changed at once to a stare of astonishment. The room was empty but apparently someone had recently been there, for the very book he had come for had been thrown into the fireplace, and his pet cigar case was lying beside it. Yet the door of the room had been locked till he opened it. No one could have entered the room, except the chambermaid, who was provided with a master key, but inquiry proved that she had been in another part of the house, since Professor Latham went down to breakfast. It was, of course, possible that some thief might have provided himself with a skeleton key, but there was nothing to suggest any attempt at robbery. Nothing had been interfered with, except the articles that were thrown into the fireplace. Besides, the professor had heard the voice of the intruder immediately before entering the room. The landlord was called, and he listened to the story with a patient smile. His explanation was a very simple one, but it did not convey much consolation to his guest. "'My dear sir,' he said, "'in an old house like this, full of long passages and odd corners communicating with one another,' All kinds of small sounds get carried along, and mixed up. 
so that the echo of a voice or sound in one part of the house seems to come from another. If we were to take any notice of all the slight sounds that one hears when all is quiet at night, we should begin to think that every room in the place was haunted. All those silly tales about this house in the local guidebook have no doubt been started in this way. We simply take no notice of them. But this did not explain the removal of the things from the bed, nor the disturbance of the bedclothes, nor the throwing of the book and cigar case into the fireplace, and it did not impress Professor Latham much. So he shrugged his shoulders, took up his book, and started for his walk. And then another queer thing happened. Passing a photographer's shop, he was startled to see in the window an excellent portrait of himself. As he had never been to the place before, and had never in his life been photographed with his hat on his head, as this portrait represented him, he was considerably astonished. He went into the shop and remarked, I see you have in your window a photograph of Professor Latham of Cambridge. May I ask where it was taken? I fear you are mistaken, sir, said the photographer. We do not know the name, and have certainly not taken any gentleman giving that name. Would you mind pointing out the portrait? The bewildered professor indicated the photograph, and received the explanation that it was of a gentleman who had stayed at the Blue Dragon two years before, and who had declined to give any name. But it is a very good portrait of yourself, said the photographer. Possibly it is yours, and you have forgotten the occurrence. Professor Latham could only assure him that he had never been in Saltminster before, and had certainly not sat for that portrait. It could only be regarded as a very curious and extraordinary coincidence. He wondered if he possessed a double. Then another odd thing happened. In the course of his walk, he met a man who raised his hat and said, Let me take the opportunity of apologising for my clumsiness and colliding with you in the hotel last night. It was caused by catching my foot in the edge of the carpet. The professor assured him that he was mistaken. No one had collided with him. It must have been someone else. But the man persisted that it was he whom he had knocked against just outside the door of room number 39, which was that which Professor Latham was occupying. These mistakes were very strange, but a still more curious mistake awaited him on his return to the hotel. On entering his room, he found the chambermaid putting an extra blanket on the spare bed. He asked what this meant, as the bed was not to be used, and was told that he himself had asked her to do it, as he felt cold in the night. The professor denied this, and pointed out that he slept in the other bed. The maid said that both of the beds had been slept in, which she did not understand, and that she was quite sure she had seen him about half an hour previously, coming out of the room, and that he had been very particular to explain which bed was to have the extra blanket. The bewildered professor could not make it out at all. Had all the world gone mad in Saltminster, or was he in the throes of a nightmare, and would presently wake up and find it all a dream? And then came another shock. He presently went to the mirror to brush his hair, and over his shoulder he distinctly saw the exact double of himself going out through the door of the room. He turned quickly, and was just in time to see the door close. He ran across the room and flung the door open, but no one was visible in the corridor. Yet he had been so quick, and the corridor was so long, that no one could have got away in the time. A few minutes later he went down to lunch. As he entered the dining room, he noticed that the waiter looked at him with some surprise. Then the man asked if he had changed his mind about lunching. The professor asked what he meant, and was informed that as he went out of the house a few minutes before, he had said in answer to the waiter's inquiry that he would not be in to lunch. Things were getting complicated. Evidently someone was being mistaken for him. This might be accounted for by personal resemblance. What about the incidents in the bedroom? And these things were not happening after dinner, so that the blame could not be laid at the door of the 58 port. The rest of the day was uneventful. Professor Latham dined with as much satisfaction as on the day before, but he drank a lighter wine than port. He had a game at billiards after dinner, he avoided the old brandy, and he retired to rest in good time. The sea air had made him sleepy, and he hoped to make amends for the restlessness of the previous night. On the whole he slept soundly, but twice in the night he was disturbed by dreams that he heard someone breathing heavily in the room. On thinking the matter over afterwards, he was not quite sure whether he dreamed this, or actually heard it when half awake. He was inclined to think that the latter was the case, for in the morning he found to his disgust that the spare bed had evidently been slept in again. And there was a fresh development. On a chair beside the spare bed lay a piece of paper, torn out of the professor's pocket-book as it proved, 
and on this had been scribbled some verses of a musical song of a particularly ribald and vulgar character, and the handwriting was that of Professor Latham. He could not deny it, though the song was quite unknown to him, and was of a kind he would never think of either writing or repeating. He could not get away from the fact that the handwriting was his own. He began to feel thankful that he had not left his checkbook about. But during the day, things took a still more unpleasant turn. The landlord sought an interview with him, and after some hesitation, told him he must ask him to find other accommodation. He indignantly inquired the reason, and was told that a gentleman who attempted to kiss the chambermaid on the stairs was not the kind of patron that was desired at the Blue Dragon. Imagine the feelings of Professor Latham, who was the last man in the world to do such a thing. But the chambermaid persisted in her story, in spite of his denials and assurances that it must have been someone else, and the unfortunate man had to agree to leave the next day. By this time he had had more than enough at Saltminster, and decided to return to Cambridge rather than seek other accommodation in the place. But the delay till the next day was to prove very nearly fatal to him. That same evening, as he went up to bed, he distinctly heard muttered laughter in his room just before he opened the door to go in, and he found that the clothes of the spare bed had been turned back as if someone was about to get into it. He also noticed that one of his razors had been taken out of its case and was lying open on the dressing table. He put it back, and it was as well for him that he did so. He was undressed and was about to get into bed when he turned to the window to see what kind of weather it was. The moon was shining brightly, and he stood there for a minute or two with the window open. Then he suddenly found himself caught in the grip of someone behind him, and at the same moment an accidental glance at the mirror showed him the face of his antagonist over his shoulder. It was his own face. He saw at once that it was to be a struggle for life. The horror that had him in its grip was evidently trying to throw him out through the window. For some minutes the issue was uncertain. Twice he was pressed against the window sill and was almost over, but each time by a supreme effort he managed to get back into the room. Dressing table and chairs were overturned in the struggle, and no doubt a great noise was thus made, but he was unconscious of everything but the struggle for life. But the noise was the saving of Professor Latham. It attracted the notice of the other guests, who came out of their rooms to see what it was. Then followed a loud knocking at his door, and at the same moment he found himself alone. He left Saltminster the next morning, and he has expressed no opinion on ghost stories since, nor has he ever been known to recommend the Blue Dragon as a nice quiet place for a holiday. End of the Ghost at the Blue Dragon Recording by Aidan Brack Atlanta the 4th of October, 2010. The Black Dog This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley The Black Dog, A Night of Spectral Terror By Stephen Crane there was a ceaseless rumble in the air, as the heavy raindrops battered upon the laurel thickets and the matted moss and haggard rocks beneath. Four water-soaked men made their difficult ways through the drenched forest. The little man stopped and shook an angry finger at where night was stealthily following them. "'Cursed be fate and her children and her children's children! We are everlastingly lost!' he cried. The panting procession halted under some dripping, drooping hemlocks, and swore in wrathful astonishment. "'It will rain for forty days and forty nights,' said the pudgy man, moaningly, "'and I feel like a wet loaf of bread now. We shall never find our way out of this wilderness until I am made into a porridge.' In desperation they started again to drag their listless bodies through the watery bushes. After a time the clouds withdrew from above them, and great winds came from concealment, and went sweeping and swirling among the trees. Night also came very near, and menaced the wanderers with darkness. The little man had determination in his legs. He scrambled among the thickets, and made desperate attempts to find a path or road. As he climbed a hillock, he espied a small clearing, upon which sat desolation and a venerable house, wept over by wind-waved pines. "'Oh!' he cried. "'Here's a house!' 
His companions straggled painfully after him as he fought the thickets between him and the cabin. At their approach the wind frenziedly opposed them and skirled madly in the trees. The little man boldly confronted the weird glances from the crannies of the cabin and rapped on the door. A score of timbers answered with groans, and within something fell to the floor with a clang. Oh, said the little man. He stepped back a few paces. Somebody in a distant part started and walked across the floor toward the door with an ominous step. A slate-coloured man appeared. He was dressed in a ragged shirt and trousers, the latter stuffed into his boots. Large tears were falling from his eyes. "'How do you do, my friend?' said the little man affably. "'My old uncle, Jim Crocker, he's sick to death,' replied the slate-coloured person. "'Oh,' said the little man, "'is that so?' The latter's clothing clung desperately to him, and water sogged in his boots. He stood patiently on one foot for a time. "'Can you put us up here until tomorrow? he asked finally. "'Yes,' said the slate-coloured man. The party passed into a little unwashed room, inhabited by a stove, a stairway, a few precarious chairs, and a misshapen table. "'I'll fry you some pork and make you some coffee,' said the slate-coloured man to his guests. "'Go ahead, old boy,' cried the little man cheerfully, from where he sat on the table, smoking his pipe and dangling his legs. "'My old uncle, Jim Crocker, he's sick to death,' said the slate-coloured man. "'Think he'll die?' asked the pudgy man gently. "'No. No? He won't die. He's an old man, but he won't die yet. The black dog ain't been around yet.' "'The black dog?' said the little man feebly. He struggled with himself for a moment. "'What's the black dog?' he asked at last. "'He's a spirit,' said the slate-coloured man, in a voice of sombre hue. "'Oh, he is? Well?' "'He haunts these parts, he does.' "'and when people are going to die, he comes and sits and howls.' "'Oh,' said the little man. "'He looked out of the window and saw night making a million shadows. "'The little man moved his legs nervously. "'I don't believe in these things,' said he, addressing the slate-coloured man, "'who was scuffling with a side of pork. "'What things?' came incoherently from the combatant. "'Oh, these uh, phantoms and ghosts and what not. "'All right, I say.' "'That's because you have merely a stomach and no soul,' grunted the pudgy man. "'Oh, old pudgkins,' replied the little man, his back curved with passion. A tempest of wrath was in the pudgy man's eye. The final epithet used by the little man was a carefully studied insult, always brought forth at a crisis. They quarrelled. "'All right, pudgkins, bring on your phantom,' cried the little man in conclusion. His stout companion's wrath was too huge for words. The little man smiled triumphantly. He had staked his opponent's reputation. The visitors sat silent. The slate-coloured man moved about in a small personal atmosphere of gloom. Suddenly a strange cry came to their ears from somewhere. It was a low, trembling call, which made the little man quake privately in his shoes. The slate-coloured man bounded at the stairway and disappeared with a flash of legs through a hole in the ceiling. The party below heard two voices in conversation, one belonging to the slate-coloured man, and the other in the quavering tones of age. Directly the slate-coloured man reappeared from above and said, "'The old man is took bad for his supper.' He hurriedly prepared a mixture with hot water, salt, and beef. Beef tea, it might be called. He disappeared again. Once more the party below heard vaguely, talking over their heads. The voice of age arose to a shriek. "'Open the window, fool! Do you think I can live in the smell of your soup?' Mutterings by the slate-coloured man and the creaking of the window were heard. The slate-coloured man stumbled down the stairs and said with intense gloom, "'The black dog will be along soon.' The little man started, and the pudgy man sneered at him. They ate a supper and then sat waiting." The pudgy man listened so palpably that the little man wished to kill him. The wood-fire became excited and sputtered frantically. Without, a thousand spirits of the winds had become entangled in the pine-branches and were lowly pleading to be loosened. 
the slate-coloured man tiptoed across the room and lit a timid candle. The men sat waiting. The phantom dog lay cuddled to a round bundle, asleep down the roadway against the windward side of an old shanty. The spectre's master had moved to Pike County, but the dog lingered, as a friend might linger at the tomb of a friend. His fur was like a suit of old clothes. His jowls hung and flopped, exposing his teeth. Yellow famine was in his eyes. The wind-rocked shanty groaned and muttered, but the dog slept. Suddenly, however, he got up and shambled to the roadway. He cast a long glance from his hungry, despairing eyes in the direction of the venerable house. The breeze came full to his nostrils. He threw back his head and gave a long, low howl, and started intently up the road. Maybe he smelled a dead man. The group around the fire in the venerable house were listening and waiting. The atmosphere of the room was tense. The slate-coloured man's face was twitching, and his drabbed hands were gripped together. The little man was continually looking behind his chair. Upon the countenance of the pudgy man appeared conceit for an approaching triumph over the little man, mingled with apprehension for his own safety. Five pipes glowed as rivals of a timid candle. Profound silence drooped heavily over them. Finally the slate-coloured man spoke. "'My old uncle, Jim Crocker, he's sick to death.' The four men started, and then shrank back in their chairs. "'Damn it!' replied the little man vaguely. Again there was a long silence. Suddenly it was broken by a wild cry from the room above. It was a shriek that struck upon them with appalling swiftness, like a flash of lightning. The walls whirled and the floor rumbled. It brought the men together with a rush. They huddled in a heap and stared at the white terror in each other's faces. The slate-coloured man grasped the candle and flared it above his head. The black dog! he howled and plunged at the stairway. The maddened four men followed frantically, for it is better to be in the presence of the awful than only within hearing. Their ears still quivering with the shriek, they bounded through the hole in the ceiling and into the sick room. With quilts drawn closely to his shrunken breast for a shield, his bony hand gripping the cover, an old man lay with glazing eyes fixed on the open window. His throat gurgled, and a froth appeared at his mouth. From the outer darkness came a strange, unnatural wail, burdened with weight of death, and each note filled with foreboding. It was the song of the spectral dog. God! screamed the little man. He ran to the open window. He could see nothing at first save the pine trees, engaged in a furious combat, tossing back and forth and struggling. The moon was peeping cautiously over the rims of some black clouds, but the chant of the phantom guided the little man's eyes, and he at length perceived its shadowy form on the ground under the window. He fell away gasping at the sight. The pudgy man crouched in a corner, chattering insanely. The slate-coloured man, in his fear, crooked his legs and looked like a hideous Chinese idol. The man upon the bed was turned to stone, save the froth which pulsated. In the final struggle, terror will fight the inevitable. The little man roared maniacal curses, and, rushing again to the window, began to throw various articles at the spectre. A mug, a plate, a knife, a fork, all crashed or clanged on the ground. But the song of the spectre continued. The bowl of beef tea followed. As it struck the ground, the phantom ceased its cry. The men in the chamber sank limply against the walls, with the unearthly wail still ringing in their ears, and the fear unfaded from their eyes. They waited again. The little man felt his nerves vibrate. Destruction was better than another wait. He grasped a candle, and going to the window held it over his head and looked out. Oh, he said. His companions crawled to the window and peered out with him. He's eating the beef tea, said the slate-coloured man, faintly. The damned dog was hungry, said the pudgy man. There's your phantom, said the little man to the pudgy man. On the bed the old man lay dead. Without, the spectre was wagging its tail. End of the Black Dog
A Vampire, a tale by John William Polidori. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Vampire, a tale by John William Polidori. It happened that in the midst of the dissipations attendant upon a London winter, there appeared at the various parties of the leaders of the town a nobleman, more remarkable for his singularities than his rank. He gazed upon the mirth around him as if he could not participate therein. Apparently the light laughter of the fair only attracted his attention that he might by a look quell it and throw fear into those breasts where thoughtlessness reigned. Those who felt this sensation of awe could not explain whence it arose. Some attributed it to the dead gray eye, which fixing upon the object's face did not seem to penetrate, and at one glance to pierce through to the inward workings of the heart, but fell upon the cheek with a leaden ray that weighed upon the skin it could not pass. His peculiarities caused him to be invited to every house. All wished to see him, and those who had been accustomed to violent excitement, and now felt the weight of ennui, were pleased at having something in their presence capable of engaging their attention. In spite of the deadly hue of his face, which never gazed a warmer tint either from the blush of modesty or from the strong emotion of passion, though its form and outline were beautiful, many of the female hunters after notoriety attempted to win his attentions, and gain at least some marks of what they might term affection. Lady Mercer, who had been the mockery of every monster shown in drawing-rooms since her marriage, threw herself in his way, and did all but put on the dress of a mountebank to attract his notice though in vain. When she stood before him, though his eyes were apparently fixed upon hers, still it seemed as if they were unperceived. Even her unappalled impudence was baffled, and she left the field. But though the common adulteress could not influence even the guidance of his eyes, it was not that the female sex was indifferent to him. Yet such was the apparent caution with which he spoke to the virtuous wife and innocent daughter, that few knew he ever addressed himself to females. He had, however, the reputation of a winning tongue, and whether it was that it even overcame the dread of his singular character, or that they were moved by his apparent hatred of vice, he was as often among those females who form the boast of their sex from their domestic virtues, as among those who sally it by their vices. About the same time there came to London a young gentleman of the name of Aubrey. He was an orphan left with an only sister in the possession of great wealth by parents who died when he was yet in childhood, left also to himself by guardians, who thought it their duty merely to take care of his fortune, while they relinquished the more important charge of his mind to the care of mercenary subalterns, he cultivated more his imagination than his judgment. He had hence that high romantic feeling of honour and candour, which daily ruins so many milliners' apprentices. He believed all to sympathise with virtue, and thought that vice was thrown in by providence merely for the picturesque effect of the scene as we see in romances. He thought that the misery of a cottage merely consisted in the vesting of clothes, which were as warm, but which were better adapted to the painter's eye by their irregular folds and various coloured patches. He thought, in fine, that the dreams of poets were the realities of life. He was handsome, frank, and rich. For these reasons, upon his entering into the gay circles, many mothers surrounded him, striving, which should describe with least truth their languishing or romping favourites. The daughters at the same time, by their brightening countenances when he approached, and by their sparkling eyes when he opened his lips, soon led him into false notions of his talents and his merit. Attached as he was to the romance of his solitary hours, he was startled at finding that except in the tallow and wax candles that flickered, not from the presence of a ghost, but from want of snuffing, there was no foundation in real life for any of the congeries of pleasing pictures and descriptions contained in those volumes from which he had formed his study. Finding, however, some compensation in his gratified vanity, he was about to relinquish his dreams, when the extraordinary being we have above described crossed him in his career. He watched him in the very impossibility of forming an idea of the character of a man entirely absorbed in himself who gave few other signs of his observation of external objects than the tacit assent to their existence, implied by the avoidance of their contact, allowing his imagination to picture everything that flattered its propensity to extravagant ideas. He soon formed this object into the hero of a romance, and determined to observe the offspring of his fancy rather than the person before him. 
he became acquainted with him, paid him attentions, and so far advanced upon his notice that his presence was always recognized. He gradually learnt that Lord Ruthven's affairs were embarrassed, and soon found from the notes of preparation in Blank Street that he was about to travel, desirous of gaining some information respecting the singular character, who till now had only whetted his curiosity, he hinted to his guardians that it was time for him to perform the tour which for many generations has been thought necessary to enable the young to take some rapid steps in the career of vice towards putting themselves upon an equality with the aged, and not allowing them to appear as if fallen from the skies whenever scandalous intrigues are mentioned as the subjects of pleasantry or of praise, according to the degree of skill shown in carrying them on. They consented, and Aubrey, immediately mentioning his intentions to Lord Ruthven, was surprised to receive from him a proposal to join him. Flattered by such a mark of esteem from him, who apparently had nothing in common with other men, he gladly accepted it, and in a few days they had passed the circling waters. Hitherto Aubrey had had no opportunity of studying Lord Ruthven's character, and now he found that though many more of his actions were exposed to his view, the results offered different conclusions from the apparent motives to his conduct. His companion was profuse in his liberality. The idle, the vagabond, and the beggar received from his hand more than enough to relieve their immediate wants. But Aubrey could not avoid remarking that it was not upon the virtuous reduced to indigence by the misfortunes attendant even upon virtue that he bestowed his alms. They were sent from the door with hardly suppressed sneers, but when the profligate came to ask something, not to relieve his wants, but to allow him to wallow in his lust or to sink him still deeper in his iniquity, he was sent away with rich charity. This was, however, attributed by him to the greater importuity of the vicious, which generally prevails over the retiring bashfulness of the virtuous indigent. There was one circumstance upon the charity of his lordship which was still more impressed upon his mind. All those upon whom it was bestowed inevitably found that there was a curse upon it, for they were all either led to the scaffold or sunk to the lowest and most abject misery. At Brussels and other towns through which they passed, Aubrey was surprised at the apparent eagerness with which his companion sought for the centres of all fashionable vice. There he entered into all the spirit of the faro table He betted and always gambled with success, except when a known shopper was his antagonist, and then he lost even more than he gained. But it was always with the same unchanging face with which he generally watched the society around. It was not, however, so when he encountered the rash, youthful novice, or the luckless father of a numerous family. Then his very wish seemed fortune's law. This apparent abstractness of mind was laid aside, and his eye sparkled with more fire than that of the cat whilst dallying with the half-dead mouse. In every town he left the formerly affluent youth, torn from the circle he adorned, cursing, in the solitude of a dungeon, the fate that had drawn him within the reach of this fiend, whilst many a father sat frantic amidst the speaking looks of mute hungry children, without a single farthing of his late immense wealth wherewith to buy even sufficient to satisfy their present craving. Yet he took no money from the gambling table, but immediately lost, to the ruiner of many, the last gilder he had just snatched from the convulsive grasp of the innocent. This might but be the result of a certain degree of knowledge, which was not, however, capable of combating the cunning of the more experienced. Aubrey often wished to represent this to his friend, and beg him to resign that charity and pleasure which proved the ruin of all, and did not tend to his own profit but he delayed it, for each day he hoped his friend would give him some opportunity of speaking frankly and openly to him. However, this never occurred. Lord Ruthven in his carriage, and amidst the various wild and rich scenes of nature, was always the same. His eye spoke less than his lip, and though Aubrey was near the object of his curiosity, he obtained no greater gratification from it than the constant excitement of vainly wishing to break that mystery, which to his exalted imagination began to assume the appearance of something supernatural. They soon arrived at Rome, and Aubrey for a time lost sight of his companion. He left him in daily attendance upon the morning circle of an Italian countess, whilst he went in search of the memorials of another almost deserted city. Whilst he was thus engaged, letters arrived from England, which he opened with eager impatience. The first was from his sister, breathing nothing but affection. The others were from his guardians. The latter astonished him. If it had been before entered into his imagination that there was an evil power resident in his companion, these seemed to give him almost sufficient reason for the belief. His guardians assisted upon his immediately leaving his friend, and urged that his character was dreadfully vicious, 
for that the possession of irresistible powers of seduction rendered his licentious habits more dangerous to society it had been discovered that his contempt for the adulteress had not originated in hatred of her character but that he had required to enhance his gratification that his victim the partner of his guilt should be hurled from the pinnacle of unsullied virtue down to the lowest abyss of infamy and degradation in fine that all those females whom he had sought apparently on account of their virtue had since his departure thrown even the mask aside and had not scrupled to expose the whole deformity of their vices to the public gaze aubrey determined upon leaving one whose character had not yet shown a single bright point on which to rest the eye he resolved to invent some plausible pretext for abandoning him altogether purposing in the meanwhile to watch him more closely and to let no slight circumstances pass by unnoticed he entered into the same circle and soon perceived that his lordship was endeavouring to work upon the inexperience of the daughter of the lady whose house he chiefly frequented in italy it is seldom that an unmarried female is met with in society he was therefore obliged to carry on his plans in secret but aubrey's eyes followed him in Hollis's windings and soon discovered that an assignation had been appointed which would most likely end in the ruin of an innocent though thoughtless girl losing no time he entered the apartment of lord ruthven and abruptly asked him his intentions with respect to the lady informing him at the same time that he was aware of his being about to meet her that very night lord ruthven answered that his intentions were such as he supposed all would have upon such an occasion and upon being pressed whether he intended to marry her merely laughed aubrey retired and immediately writing a note to say that from that moment he must decline accompanying his lordship in the remainder of their proposed tour he ordered his servant to seek other apartments and calling upon the mother of the lady informed her of all he knew not only with regard to her daughter but also concerning the character of his lordship the assignation was prevented lord ruthven next day merely sent his servant to notify his complete assent to a separation but did not hint any suspicion of his plans having been foiled by aubrey's interposition having left rome aubrey directed his steps towards greece and crossing the peninsula soon found himself at athens he then fixed his residence in the house of a greek and soon occupied himself in tracing the faded records of ancient glory upon monuments that apparently ashamed of chronicling the deeds of freemen only before slaves had hidden themselves beneath the sheltering soil of many-coloured lichen under the same roof as himself existed a being so beautiful and delicate that she might have formed the model for a painter wishing to portray on the canvas the promised hope of the faithful in mahomet's paradise save that her eyes spoke too much mind for any one to think she could belong to those who had no souls as she danced upon the plain or tripped along the mountain side one would have thought the gazelle a poor type of her beauties for who would have exchanged her eye apparently the eye of animated nature for that sleepy luxurious look of the animal suited but to the taste of an epicure the light step of ianthe often accompanied aubrey in his search after antiquities and often with the unconscious girl engaged in the pursuit of a cashmere butterfly showed the whole beauty of her form floating as it were upon the wind to the eager gaze of him who forgot the letters he had just deciphered upon an almost effaced tablet in the contemplation of her sylph-like figure often would her tresses falling as she flitted around exhibit in the sun's ray such delicate brilliant and swiftly fading hues as might well excuse the forgetfulness of the antiquary who let escape from his mind the very object he had before thought of vital importance to the proper interpretation of a passage in pausanias but why attempt to describe charms which all feel but none can appreciate it was innocence youth and beauty unaffected by crowded drawing-rooms and stifling balls whilst he drew those remains of which he wished to preserve a memorial for his future hours she would stand by and watch the magic effects of his pencil in tracing the scenes of her native place she would then describe to him the circling dance upon the open plain would paint to him in all the glowing colours of youthful memory the marriage pomp she remembered viewing in her infancy and then turning to subjects that had evidently made a greater impression upon her mind would tell him all the supernatural tales of her nurse her earnestness and apparent belief of what she narrated excited the interest even of aubrey and often as she told him the tale of the living vampire who had passed years amidst his friends and dearest ties forced every year by feeding upon the life of a lovely female to prolong his existence for the ensuing months his blood would run cold whilst he attempted to laugh her out of such idle and horrible fantasies 
but Ianthe cited to him the names of old men who had at last detected one living among themselves, after several of their near relatives and children had been found marked with the stamp of the fiend's appetite. And when she found him so incredulous, she begged of him to believe her, for it had been remarked that those who had dared to question their existence always had some proof given, which obliged them, with grief and heartbreaking, to confess it was true. She detailed to him the traditional appearance of these monsters, and his horror was increased by hearing a pretty accurate description of Lord Ruthven. He, however, still persisted in persuading her that there could be no truth in her fears, though at the same time he wondered at the many coincidences which had all tended to excite a belief in the supernatural power of Lord Ruthven. Aubrey began to attach himself more and more to Ianthe, her innocence so contrasted with all the affected virtues of the women among whom he had sought for his vision of romance, won his heart, and while he ridiculed the idea of a young man of English habits marrying an uneducated Greek girl, still he found himself more and more attached to the almost fairy form before him. He would tear himself at times from her, and forming a plan for some antiquarian research, he would depart, determined not to return until his object was attained but he always found it impossible to fix his attention upon the ruins around him, whilst in his mind he retained an image that seemed alone the rightful possessor of his thoughts. Ianthe was unconscious of his love, and was ever the same frank infantile being he had first known. She always seemed to part from him with reluctance, but it was because she had no longer any one with whom she could visit her favourite haunts, whilst her guardian was occupied in sketching or uncovering some fragment which had yet escaped the destructive hand of time. She had appealed to her parents on the subject of vampires, and they both, with several present, affirmed their existence, pale with horror at the very name. Soon after, Aubrey determined to proceed upon one of his excursions, which was to detain him for a few hours. When they heard the name of the place, they all at once begged of him not to return at night, as he must necessarily pass through a wood, where no Greek would ever remain after the day had closed, upon any consideration. They described it as the resort of the vampires in their nocturnal orgies, and denounced the most heavy evils as impending upon him who dared to cross their path. Aubrey made light of their representations, and tried to laugh them out of the idea. But when he saw them shudder at his daring thus to mock a superior infernal power, the very name of which apparently made their blood freeze, he was silent. Next morning Aubrey set off his excursion unattended. He was surprised to observe the melancholy face of his host, and was concerned to find that his words, mocking the belief of those horrible fiends, had inspired them with such terror. When he was about to depart, Ianthe came to the side of his horse, and earnestly begged of him to return, ere night allowed the power of these beings to be put in action. He promised. He was, however, so occupied in his research, that he did not perceive that daylight would soon end, and that in the horizon there was one of those specks which, in the warmer climates, so rapidly gather into a tremendous mass, and pour all their rage upon the devoted country. He at last, however, mounted his horse, determined to make up by speed for his delay. But it was too late. Twilight in these southern climates is almost unknown. Immediately the sun sets, night begins. And ere he had advanced far, the power of the storm, its echoing thunders had scarcely an interval of rest. Its thick heavy rain forced its way through the canopying foliage, whilst the blue forked lightning seemed to fall and radiate at his very feet. Suddenly his horse took fright, and he was carried with dreadful rapidity through the entangled forest. The animal at last, through fatigue, stopped, and he found by the glare of lightning that he was in the neighbourhood of a hovel that hardly lifted itself upon the masses of dead leaves and brushwood which surrounded it. Dismounting he approached, hoping to find someone to guide him to the town, or at least trusting to obtain shelter from the pelting of the storm. As he approached, the thunders, for a moment silent, allowed him to hear the dreadful shrieks of a woman mingling with the stifled exultant mockery of a laugh, continued in one almost unbroken sound. He was startled. But roused by the thunder which again rolled over his head, he with a sudden effort forced open the door of the hut. He found himself in utter darkness. The sound, however, guided him. He was apparently unperceived, for though he called, still the sounds continued, and no notice was taken of him. He found himself in contact with someone, whom he immediately seized, when a voice cried, "'Again baffled!' to which a loud laugh succeeded, and he felt himself grappled by one whose strength seemed superhuman. Determined to sell his life as dearly as he could, he struggled. But it was in vain. He was lifted from his feet and hurled with enormous force against the ground. His enemy threw himself upon him, 
and kneeling upon his breast, had placed his hands upon his throat, when the glare of many torches penetrating through the hole that gave light in the day disturbed him. He instantly rose, and leaving his prey, rushed through the door, and in a moment the crashing of the branches, as he broke through the wood, was no longer heard. The storm was still now, and Aubrey, incapable of moving, was soon heard by those without. They entered, the light of the torches fell upon the mud walls, and the thatch loaded on every individual straw with heavy flakes of soot. At the desire of Aubrey they searched for her, who had attracted him by her cries. He was again left in darkness. But what was his horror, when the light of the torches once more burst upon him, to perceive the airy form of his fair conductress brought in a lifeless corpse? He shut his eyes, hoping that it was but a vision arising from his disturbed imagination, but he again saw the same form, when he unclosed them, stretched by his side. There was no color upon her cheek, not even upon her lip. Yet there was a stillness about her face that seemed almost as attaching as the life that once dwelt there. Upon her neck and breast was blood, and upon her throat were the marks of teeth having opened the vein. To this the men pointed, crying, simultaneously struck with horror, A vampire! A vampire! A litter was quickly formed, and Aubrey was laid by the side of her, who had lately been to him the object of so many bright and fairy visions, now fallen with the flower of life that had died within her. He knew not what his thoughts were. His mind was benumbed, and seemed to shun reflection, and take refuge in vacancy. He held almost unconsciously in his hand a naked dagger, of a particular construction, which had been found in the hut. They were soon met by different parties who had been engaged in the search of her whom a mother had missed. Their lamentable cries as they approached the city forewarned the parents of some dreadful catastrophe. To describe their grief would be impossible, but when they ascertained the cause of their child's death, they looked at Aubrey and pointed to the corpse. They were inconsolable, both died broken-hearted. Aubrey, being put to bed, was seized with the most violent fever, and was often delirious. In these intervals he would call upon Lord Ruthven and upon Ianthe, by some unaccountable combination he seemed to beg of his former companion to spare the being he loved. At other times he would imprecate maledictions upon his head, and curse him as her destroyer. Lord Ruthven chanced at this time to arrive at Athens, and from whatever motive, upon hearing of the state of Aubrey, immediately placed himself in the same house and became his constant attendant. When the latter recovered from his delirium, he was horrified and startled at the sight of him whose image he had now combined with that of a vampire. But Lord Ruthven, by his kind words, implying almost repentance for the fault that had caused their separation, and still more by the attention, anxiety, and care which he showed, soon reconciled him to his presence. His lordship seemed quite changed. He no longer appeared that apathetic being who had so astonished Aubrey, but as soon as his convalescence began to be rapid, he again gradually retired into the same state of mind, and Aubrey perceived no difference from the former man, except that at times he was surprised to meet his gaze fixed intently upon him, with a smile of malicious exultation playing upon his lips. He knew not why, but this smile haunted him. During the last stage of the invalid's recovery, Lord Ruthven was apparently engaged in watching the tideless waves raised by the cooling breeze, or in the marking progress of those orbs circling like our world the moveless sun. Indeed, he appeared to wish to avoid the eyes of all. Aubrey's mind by this shock was much weakened and that elasticity of spirit which had once so distinguished him now seemed to have fled for ever. He was now as much a lover of solitude and silence as Lord Ruthven, but much as he wished for solitude, his mind could not find it in the neighbourhood of Athens. If he sought it amidst the ruins he had formerly frequented, Ianthe's form stood by his side. If he sought it in the woods, her light step would appear wandering amidst the underwood in quest of the modest violet. Then subtly turning round would show, to his wild imagination, her pale face and wounded throat, with a meek smile upon her lips. He determined to fly, scenes every feature of which created such bitter associations in his mind. He proposed to Lord Ruthven, to whom he held himself bound by the tender care he had taken of him during his illness, that they should visit those parts of Greece neither had yet seen. They travelled in every direction, and sought every spot to which a recollection could be attached. But though they thus hastened from place to place, yet they seemed not to heed what they gazed upon, they heard much of robbers, but they gradually began to slight these reports, which they imagined were only the invention of individuals, whose interest it was to excite the generosity of those whom they defended from pretended dangers. In consequence of thus neglecting the advice of the inhabitants, on one occasion they travelled, with only a few guards, more to serve as guides than as defence. 
Upon entering, however, a narrow defile at the bottom of which was the bed of a torrent, with large masses of rock brought down from the neighboring precipices, they had reason to repent their negligence. For scarcely were the whole of the party engaged in the narrow pass when they were startled by the whistling of bullets close to their heads, and by the echoed report of several guns. In an instant, their guards had left them, and placing themselves behind rocks, had begun to fire in the direction whence the report came. Lord Ruthven and Aubrey, imitating their example, retired for a moment behind the sheltering turn of the defile, but ashamed of being thus detained by a foe, who with insulting shouts bade them advance, and being exposed to unresisting slaughter, if any of the robbers should climb above and take them in the rear, they determined at once to rush forward in search of the enemy. Hardly had they lost the shelter of the rock, when Lord Ruthven received a shot in the shoulder, which brought him to the ground. Aubrey hastened to assistance, and no longer heeding the contest of his own peril, was soon surprised by seeing the robbers' faces around him, his guards having, upon Lord Ruthven's being wounded, immediately thrown up their arms and surrendered. By promises of great reward, Aubrey soon induced them to convey his wounded friend to a neighbouring cabin, and having agreed upon a ransom, he was no more disturbed by their presence they being content merely to guard the entrance till their comrade should return with the promised sum for which he had an order lord ruthven's strength rapidly decreased and two days mortification ensued and death seemed advancing with hasty steps his conduct and appearance had not changed he seemed as unconscious of pain as he had been of the objects about him but towards the close of the last evening his mind became apparently uneasy and his eyes often fixed upon aubrey who was induced to offer his assistance with more than usual earnestness. "'Assist me. You may save me. You may do more than that. I mean not my life. I heed the death of my existence as little as that of the passing day. But you may save my honour, your friend's honour. "'How? Tell me I would do anything,' replied Aubrey. "'I need but little. My life ebbs apace. I cannot explain the whole. But if you would conceal all you know of me, my honour were free from stain in the world's mouth. And if my death were unknown for some time in England, I—' but life it shall not be known swear cried the dying man raising himself with exultant violence Sw swear by all your soul reveres by all your nature fears swear that for a year and a day you will not impart your knowledge of my crimes or death to any living being in any way whatever may happen or whatever you may see his eyes seemed bursting from their sockets i swear said aubrey he sunk laughing upon his pillow and breathed no more Aubrey retired to rest, but did not sleep. The many circumstances attending his acquaintance with this man rose upon his mind, and he knew not why. When he remembered his oath, a cold shivering came over him, as if from the presentiment of something horrible awaiting him. Rising early in the morning, he was about to enter the hovel in which he had left the corpse, when a robber met him, and informed him that it was no longer there, having been conveyed by himself and comrades upon his retiring to the pinnacle of a neighbouring mount according to a promise they had given his lordship that it should be exposed to the first cold ray of the moon that rose after his death aubrey astonished and taking several of the men determined to go and bury it upon the spot where it lay but when he had mounted to the summit he found no trace of either the corpse or the clothes though the robbers swore they pointed out the identical rock on which they had lain the body for a time his mind was bewildered in conjectures but at last he returned convinced that they had buried the corpse for the sake of the clothes weary of a country in which he had met with such terrible misfortunes and in which all apparently conspired to heighten that superstitious melancholy that had seized upon his mind he resolved to leave it and soon arrived at smyrna while waiting for a vessel to convey him to otranto or to naples he occupied himself in arranging those effects he had with him belonging to lord ruthven amongst other things there was a case containing several weapons of offence more or less adapted to ensure the death of the victim there were several daggers and atagans. Whilst turning them over and examining their curious forms, what was his surprise at finding a sheath apparently ornamented in the same style as the dagger discovered in the fatal hut? He shuddered. Hastening to gain further proof, he found the weapon, and his horror may be imagined when he discovered that it fitted, though peculiarly shaped, the sheath he held in his hand. His eyes seemed to need no further certainty. They seemed gazing to be bound to the dagger, yet still he wished to disbelieve, but the particular form, the same varying tints upon the haft and the sheath, were alike in splendour on both, and left no room for doubt. There were also drops of blood on each. He left Smyrna, and on his way home at Rome, his first inquiries were concerning the lady he had attempted to snatch from Lord Ruthven's seductive arts. 
her parents were in distress their fortune ruined and she had not been heard of since the departure of his lordship aubrey's mind became almost broken under so many repeated horrors he was afraid that this lady had fallen a victim to the destroyer of ianthe he became morose and silent and his only occupation consisted in urging the speed of the postilions as if he were going to save the life of some one he held dear he arrived at calais a breeze which seemed obedient to his will soon wafted him to the english shores and he hastened to the mansion of his father's and there for a moment appeared to lose in the embraces and caresses of his sister all memories of the past if she before by her infantine caresses had gained his affection now that the woman began to appear she was still more attaching as a companion miss aubrey had not that winning grace which gains the gaze and applause of the drawing-room assemblies there was none of that light brilliancy which only exists in the heated atmosphere of a crowded apartment her blue eye was never lit up by the levity of the mind beneath there was a melancholy charm about it which did not seem to arise from misfortune but from some feeling within that appeared to indicate a soul conscious of a brighter realm her step was not that light footing which strays wherever a butterfly or a colour may attract it was sedate and pensive when alone her face was never brightened by the smile of joy but when her brother breathed to her his affection and would in her presence forget those griefs she knew destroyed his rest who would have exchanged her smile for that of the voluptuary it seemed as if those eyes that face were then playing in the light of their own native sphere she was yet only eighteen and had not been presented to the world it having been thought by her guardians more fit that her presentation should be delayed until her brother's return from the continent when he might be her protector it was now therefore resolved that the next drawing-room which was fast approaching should be the epoch of her entry into the busy scene aubrey would rather have remained in the mansion of his father's and fed upon the melancholy which overpowered him he could not feel interest about the frivolities of fashionable strangers when his mind had been so torn by the events he had witnessed but he determined to sacrifice his own comfort to the protection of his sister they soon arrived in town and prepared for the next day which had been announced as a drawing-room the crowd was excessive a drawing-room had not been held for a long time and all who were anxious to bask in the smile of royalty hastened thither aubrey was there with his sister while he was standing in a corner by himself heedless of all around him engaged in the remembrance that the first time he had seen lord ruthven was in that very place he felt himself suddenly seized by the arm and a voice he recognized too well sounded in his ear remember your oath he had hardly courage to turn fearful of seeing a spectre that would blast him when he perceived at a little distance the same figure which had attracted his notice on this spot upon his first entry into society he gazed till his limbs almost refusing to bear their weight he was obliged to take the arm of a friend and forcing a passage through the crowd he threw himself into his carriage and was driven home he paced the room with his hurried steps and fixed his hands upon his head as if he were afraid his thoughts were bursting from his brain lord ruthven again before him circumstances started up in dreadful array the dagger his oath he roused himself he could not believe it possible the dead rise again he thought his imagination had conjured up the image his mind was resting upon it was impossible that it could be real he determined therefore to go again into society for though he attempted to ask concerning lord ruthven the name hung upon his lips and he could not succeed in gaining information he went a few nights after with his sister to the assembly of a near relation leaving her under the protection of a matron he retired into a recess and there gave himself up to his own devouring thoughts perceiving at last that many were leaving he roused himself and entering another room found his sister surrounded by several apparently in earnest conversation he attempted to pass and get near her when one whom he requested to move turned round and revealed to him those features he most abhorred he sprang forward seized his sister's arms and with hurried step forced her towards the street at the door he found himself impeded by the crowd of servants who were waiting for their lords and while he was engaged in passing them he again heard that voice whisper close to him remember your oath he did not dare to turn but hurrying his sister soon reached home aubrey became almost distracted if before his mind had been absorbed by one subject how much more completely was it engrossed now that the certainty of the monster's living again pressed upon his thoughts his sister's attentions were now unheeded and it was in vain that she entreated him to explain to her what had caused his abrupt conduct he only uttered a few words and those terrified her the more he thought the more he was bewildered his oath startled him was he then to allow this monster to roam bearing ruin upon his breath amidst all he held dear and not avert its progress his very sister might have been touched by him 
but even if he were to break his oath and disclose his suspicions who would believe him he thought of employing his own hand to free the world from such a wretch but death he remembered had already been mocked for days he remained in this state shut up in his room he saw no one and eat only when his sister came who with eyes streaming with tears besought him for her sake to support nature at last no longer capable of bearing stillness and solitude he left his house roamed from street to street anxious to fly that image which haunted him his dress became neglected and he wandered as often exposed to the noonday sun as to the midnight damps he was no longer to be recognized at first he returned with the evening to the house but at last he laid him down to rest wherever fatigue overtook him his sister anxious for his safety employed people to follow him but they were soon distanced by him who fled from a pursuer swifter than any from thought his conduct however suddenly changed struck with the idea that he left by his absence the whole of his friends with a fiend amongst them of whose presence they were unconscious he determined to enter again into society and watch him closely anxious to forewarn in spite of his oath all whom lord ruthven approached with intimacy but when he entered into a room his haggard and suspicious looks were so striking his inward shuddering so visible that his sister was at last obliged to beg him to abstain from seeking for her sake a society which affected him so strongly when however remonstrance proved unavailing the guardians thought proper to interpose and fearing that his mind was becoming alienated they thought it was high time to resume again that trust which had been before imposed upon them by aubrey's parents desirous of saving him from the injuries and sufferings he had daily encountered in his wanderings and of preventing him from exposing to the general eye those marks of what they considered folly they engaged a physician to reside in the house and take constant care of him he hardly appeared to notice it so completely was his mind absorbed by one terrible subject his incoherence became at last so great that he was confined to his chamber there he would often lie for days incapable of being roused he had become emaciated his eyes had attained a glassy lustre the only sign of affection and recollection remaining displayed itself upon the entry of his sister then he would sometimes start and seizing her hands with looks that severely afflicted her he would desire her not to touch him oh do not touch him if your love for me is aught do not go near him when however she inquired to whom he referred his only answer was true true and again he sank into a state whence not even she could rouse him this lasted many months gradually however as the year was passing his incoherences became less frequent and his mind threw off a portion of its gloom whilst his guardians observed that several times in the day he would count upon his fingers a definite number and then smile the time had nearly elapsed when upon the last day of the year one of his guardians entering his room began to converse with his physician upon the melancholy circumstance of aubrey's being in so awful a situation when his sister was going next day to be married instantly aubrey's attention was attracted he asked anxiously to whom glad of this mark of returning intellect of which they feared he had been deprived they mentioned the name of the earl of marsden thinking this was a young earl whom he had met with in society aubrey seemed pleased and astonished them still more by his expressing his intention to be present at the nuptials and desiring to see his sister they answered not but in a few minutes his sister was with him he was apparently again capable of being affected by the influence of her lovely smile for he pressed her to his breast and kissed her cheek wet with tears flowing at the thought of her brother's being once more alive to the feelings of affection he began to speak with all his wonted warmth and to congratulate her upon her marriage with a person so distinguished for rank in every accomplishment when he suddenly perceived a locket upon her breast opening it what was his surprise at beholding the features of the monster who had so long influenced his life he seized the portrait in a paroxysm of rage and trampled it under foot upon her asking him why he thus destroyed the resemblance of her future husband he looked as if he did not understand her then seizing her hands and gazing on her with a frantic expression of countenance he bade her swear that she would never wed this monster for he but he could not advance it seemed as if that voice again bade him remember his oath he turned suddenly round thinking lord ruthven was near him but saw no one in the meantime the guardians and physician who had heard the whole and thought this was but a return of his disorder entered and forcing him from miss aubrey desired her to leave him he fell upon his knees to them he implored he begged of them to delay but for one day they attributing this to be the insanity they imagined had taken possession of his mind endeavoured to pacify him and retired lord ruthven had called the morning after the drawing-room and had been refused with every one else 
when he heard of aubrey's ill health he readily understood himself to be the cause of it but when he learned that he was deemed insane his exultation and pleasure could hardly be concealed from those among whom he had gained this information he hastened to the house of his former companion and by constant attendance and the pretence of great affection for the brother and interest in his fate he gradually won the ear of miss aubrey who could resist his power his tongue had dangers and toils to recount could speak of himself as of an individual having no sympathy with any being on the crowded earth save with her to whom he addressed himself could tell her how since he knew her his existence had begun to seem worthy of preservation if it were merely that he might listen to her soothing accents in fine he knew so well how to use the serpent's art or such was the will of fate that he gained her affections the title of the elder branch falling at length to him he obtained an important embassy which served as an excuse for hastening the marriage in spite of her brother's deranged state which was to take place the very day before his departure for the continent aubrey when he was left by the physician and his guardians attempted to bribe the servants but in vain he asked for a pen and paper it was given him he wrote a letter to his sister conjuring her as she valued her own happiness her own honour and the honour of those now in the grave who once held her in their arms as their hope and the hope of their house to delay but for a few hours that marriage on which he denounced the most heavy curses the servants promised they would deliver it but giving it to the physician he thought it better not to harass any more the mind of miss aubrey by which he considered the ravings of a maniac night passed on without rest to the busy inmates of the house and aubrey heard with a horror that may more easily be conceived than described the notes of busy preparation morning came and the sound of carriages broke upon his ear aubrey grew frantic the curiosity of the servants at last overcame their vigilance they gradually stole away leaving him in the custody of an helpless old woman he seized the opportunity with one bound was out of the room and in a moment found himself in the apartment where all were nearly assembled lord ruthven was first to perceive him he immediately approached and taking his arm by force hurried him from the room speechless with rage when on the staircase lord ruthven whispered in his ear remember your oath and know if not my bride to-day your sister is dishonoured women are frail so saying he pushed himself towards his attendants who roused by the old woman had come in search of him aubrey could no longer support himself his rage not finding vent had broken a blood vessel and he was conveyed to bed this was not mentioned to his sister who was not present when he entered as the physician was afraid of agitating her the marriage was solemnized and the bride and bridegroom left london aubrey's weakness increased the effusion of blood produced symptoms of the near approach of death he desired his sister's guardians might be called and when the midnight hour had struck he related composedly what the reader has perused he died immediately after the guardians hastened to protect miss aubrey but when they arrived it was too late lord ruthven had disappeared and aubrey's sister had glutted the thirst of a vampire end of the vampire by john polidori Debt to is a journey by Stephen T. Rogers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Om One Two Three. Debt to is a journey by Stephen T. Rogers. Samson stood in the circle of light, listening to his heaving breath echo off the dark alley walls. If getting there was half the fun, he hoped that he never arrived, since the only people having fun was them. There was glee in the way they leaped out at him from doorways, lunged at him from behind the leafless trees, laughed him from all sides. Only the cones of light was he safe, but he could not simply stand here indefinitely. As soon as Samson caught his breath, he needed to raise for the cone of light mid-block, and then the cone of light at the next corner. He needed to get from this end of the alley to the dead one, and he needed to do it quickly, he needed to get there before they grew comfortable within the cones of light. Samson's breath had nearly returned to normal. Stepping back to the far edge of the light, he sprinted forward, 
hearing them rush at him as he raced to that middle light. He felt hands on his clothes, breath on the back of his neck, giggles that left spit in his ears. Reaching the cone of light, Samson put on the brakes before he ran out the other side into the waiting darkness. He pulled in great lungfuls of air again and again. Never had so many of them touched him before. Either they were getting faster, or he was getting slower. Samson studied the pale faces that danced within the far reaches of his night vision. If only they were all someone specific, like his father, he could try to write this off as a dream. But they were not, and this was not. He wiped sweat from his forehead. Time was short. The next cone of light was waiting. They were waiting for him to trip before he gained the sanctuary there. Taking one last deep breath, Samson took a step back and dropped to a runner's pose. He could do this. Driving his toes into the pavement, Samson sprinted towards the cone of light. Someone touched an elbow. A hand waved in front of his face. Don't stop. Keep running towards the light. There was a tug at his heel. Samson reached the cone of light and came to a halt, turning to face lift as he gasped for air. There was another alley with a light half away and at the opposite end. How many alleys had he run now? Cone of light to cone of light. Emerging only to turn left and see another alley filled to overflowing with a long stretch of darkness, bracketed by lights with one in the middle. He must have run dozens of these stretches now, just ahead of those who would bring him down. And then he would turn left and find another alley awaiting. Samson shook his head. He couldn't keep doing this. He was slowing, he knew it, and it was only a matter of time until he slipped or tripped and flipped through the darkness. Then they would be on him. Much better to stand here in the cone of light, wait until dawn. They couldn't touch him here. The light died. Plunged into darkness, Samson froze until he felt a hand on his shoulder. Then he was off towards that light mid alley. Then he was off and running his lungs out. The hand stayed on his shoulder most of the way, but then finally disappeared as he reached the cone of light. He huffed and he puffed and he touched the spot where he had been touched. The area was hot. He sniffed his fingertips and was reminded of Exalat gone bad. There was a giggle just behind him and his pan. He had staggered close to the edge. They couldn't penetrate the cone of light, but Samson couldn't stay here. He had to keep moving. Focus. He was halfway there. The mouth of the alley was safe, battered in cold white light. He had made this run a dozen times, a hundred. He could do it again. Fainting movement the way he had come, he quickly reversed direction and ran towards the cone of light. The ploy must have worked, because he reached the light without feeling them once. He had heard them, yes, and saw movement out of the corner of his eye, but he had gained the light without being touched. Samson turned left, and there were next two lights, the next two stretches of darkness, the next two mad dashes. And what if at the end of the alley he turned left to see one Exactly identical. Crouching, Samson massaged his right ankle. There was no point in thinking ahead. He needed to concentrate on his goal. Reach the first light and then reach the second light. Worry about what was around the corner when he got there. Samson shuddered, feeling them gather around his place of safety. He had to break out before they formed an impenetrable wall. Taking a series of deep breaths, Samson shot forward, racing for that light. Again he felt them grab at him, pull at his clothes, caress a leg lifted behind. 
run like the wind he was almost there almost safe the light died samson felt his step falter and then forced himself on the ragged gasps of air burning his lungs a muscle jumped and still he ran ran because he had no choice there was a whisper in his left ear hot breath that tickled and then he was in the light dropping to the ground samson heaved his pulse pounding across his temples he did it he made it he was here he was safe they hadn't stopped him they had tried but they had failed he had won slowly standing samson turned to the left saw the alley with the two light calling him on the two long wails of darkness hiding the creatures that hadn't tired of this game he wiped an arm across his eyes licked the lips long dry samson had beat them run an entire alley he could beat them again and again and maybe again or maybe that time they would win he looked up at the light that was protecting him, squinting but still wanting to soak in as much of light as possible. There was salvation in the light, and he hoped a bit might shine through him if he was able to store enough. The light died. As Samson drove forward towards the middle light, that cone of light died too, and then the one at the end of the alley. This time he had to run the full alley turn left and hope that there was a light waiting for him around him in the rushing darkness he heard the hum of them as he raced through the blackness they poked and they prodded and they beat their time samson lost his footing but regained his balance before he fell he knew if he hit the ground that they would be on him and he would never rise again Samson closed his eyes, and he ran, ran his heart out, as if he could hope to win, knowing full well that this night was only beginning. End of That Too is a Journey by Stephen D. Rogers The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Wald The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why, Will, will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was a sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly, I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold, and so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man, and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now at this point you fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, and what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of the door and opened it, oh so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening, so far that I could see him as he lay upon the bed. Ha! Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh, so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed. And so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. 
Every morning when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone, and inquiring how he has passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed, to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness, for the shutters were close fastened through fear of robbers, and so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening. The old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour I did not move a muscle, and in the meantime I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or grief. Oh, no, it was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor, or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found all in vain, all in vain because death, in approaching him, had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a simple dim ray like the thread of the spider shot from out the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the sense? Now I say, there come to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury, as the beating of a drum stimulates a soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say louder, every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous. So I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, only once. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart 
and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatsoever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had cut it all, ha ha. When I made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what I had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears, but still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distant. It continued and became more distant. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness until at length I found the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much like a sound a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles, in a high key and with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men. But the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards. But the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no, they heard. They suspected. They knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark! Louder, 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 louder! Villains, I shrieked. Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here. It is the beating of his hideous heart. End of the Telltale Heart The Secret of McCarger's Gulch by Ambrose Bierce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Winston Tharp. The Secret of McCarger's Gulch by Ambrose Bierce. Northwesterly from Indian Hill, about nine miles as the crow flies, is McCarger's Gulch. It is not much of a gulch, a mere depression between two wooded ridges of inconsiderable height. From its mouth up to its head, for gulches like rivers have an anatomy of their own, the distance does not exceed two miles, and the width at bottom is only one place more than a dozen yards. For most of the distance on either side of the little brook which drains it in winter and goes dry in the early spring, there is no level ground at all. The steep slopes of the hills, covered with an almost impenetrable growth of manzanita and chamasol, are parted by nothing but the width of the watercourse. No one but an occasional enterprising hunter of the vicinity ever goes into McCarger's Gulch, and five miles away it is unknown even by name. 
Within that distance, in any direction, are far more conspicuous topographical features without names, and one might try in vain to ascertain by local inquiry the origin of the name of this one. About midway between the head and the mouth of McCarger's Gulch, the hill on the right as you ascend is cloven by another gulch, a short, dry one, and at the junction of the two is a level space of two or three acres, and there a few years ago stood an old board house containing one small room. How the component parts of the house, few and simple as they were, had been assembled at that almost inaccessible point is a problem in the solution of which there would be greater satisfaction than advantage. Possibly the creek bed is a reformed road. It is certain that the gulch was at one time pretty thoroughly prospected by miners, who must have had some means of getting in with at least pack animals carrying tools and supplies. Their profits, apparently, were not such as would have justified any considerable outlay to connect McCarger's Gulch with any center of a civilization enjoying the distinction of a sawmill. The house, however, was there, most of it. It lacked a door and a window frame, and the chimney of mud and stones had fallen into an unlovely heap overgrown with rank weeds. Such humble furniture as there may once have been, and much of the lower weatherboarding, had served as fuel in the campfires of hunters, as had also probably the curbing of an old well, which at the time I write of existed in the form of a rather wide but not very deep depression nearby. One afternoon in the summer of 1874 I passed up McCarker's Gulch from the narrow valley into which it opens by following the dry bed of the brook. I was quail shooting, and had made a bag of about a dozen birds by the time I had reached the house described, of whose existence I was until then unaware. After rather carelessly inspecting the ruin, I resumed my sport, and having fairly good success, prolonged it until near sunset, when it occurred to me that I was a long way from any human habitation, too far to reach one by nightfall. But in my game bag was food, and the old house would afford shelter, if shelter were needed on a warm and dewless night in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, where one may sleep in comfort on the pine needles without covering. I am fond of solitude and love the night, so my resolution to camp out was soon taken, and by the time it was dark I had made my bed of boughs and grasses in a corner of the room and was roasting a quail at a fire that I had kindled on the hearth. The smoke escaped out of the ruined chimney, the light illuminated the room with a kindly glow, and as I ate my simple meal of plain bird and drank the remains of a bottle of red wine which had served me all the afternoon in place of the water, which the region does not supply, I experienced a sense of comfort which better fare and accommodations do not always give. Nevertheless, there was something lacking. I had a sense of comfort, but not of security. I detected myself staring more frequently at the open doorway and blank window than I could find warrant for doing. Outside these apertures all was black, and I was unable to repress a certain feeling of apprehension, as my fancy pictured the outer world and filled it with unfriendly entities, natural and supernatural, chief among which, in their respective classes, were the grizzly bear, which I knew was occasionally still seen in that region, and the ghost, which I had reason to think was not. Unfortunately, our feelings do not always respect the law of probabilities, and to me that evening the possible and the impossible were equally disquieting. Everyone who has had experience in the matter must have observed that one confronts the actual and imaginary perils of the night with far less apprehension in the open air than in a house with an open doorway. I felt this now as I lay on my leafy couch in a corner of the room next to the chimney and permitted my fire to die out. So strong became my sense of the presence of something malign and menacing in the place that I found myself almost unable to withdraw my eyes from the opening as in the deepening darkness it became more and more indistinct. And when the last little flame flickered and went out, I grasped the shotgun which I had laid at my side and actually turned the muzzle in the direction of the now invisible entrance, my thumb on one of the hammers ready to cock the piece, my breath suspended, my muscles rigid and tense. But later I laid down the weapon with a sense of shame and mortification. What did I fear, and why, I, to whom the night had been a more familiar face than that of man? I, in whom that element of hereditary superstition, from which none of us is altogether free, had given to solitude and darkness and silence only a more alluring interest and charm. I was unable to comprehend my folly, and, losing in the conjecture the thing conjectured of, I fell asleep. And then, 
I dreamed. I was in a great city in a foreign land, a city whose people were of my own race, with minor differences of speech and costume, yet precisely what these were I could not say. My sense of them was indistinct. The city was dominated by a great castle upon an overlooking height, whose name I knew but could not speak. I walked through many streets, some broad and straight with high modern buildings, some narrow, gloomy, and tortuous. Between the gables of quaint old houses whose overhanging stories, elaborately ornamented with carvings in wood and stone, almost met above my head. I sought someone who I had never seen, yet knew that I should recognize when found. My quest was not aimless and fortuitous, it had a definite method. I turned from one street into another without hesitation, and threaded a maze of intricate passages, devoid of the fear of losing my way. Presently I stopped before a low door in a plain stone house which might have been the dwelling of an artisan of the better sort, and without announcing myself entered. The room, rather sparsely furnished and lighted by a single window with small diamond-shaped panes, had but two occupants, a man and a woman. They took no notice of my intrusion, a circumstance which, in a manner of dreams, appeared entirely natural. They were not conversing. They sat apart, unoccupied and sullen. The woman was young and rather stout, with fine, large eyes and a certain grave beauty. My memory of her expression is exceedingly vivid, but in dreams one does not always observe the details of faces. About her shoulders was a plaid shawl. The man was older, dark, with an evil face, made more forbidding by a long scar extending from near the left temple diagonally downward into the black mustache, though in my dreams it seemed rather to haunt the face as a thing apart, I can express it no otherwise, than to belong to it. The moment that I found the man and woman I knew them to be husband and wife. What followed I remember indistinctly, always confused and inconsistent, made so, I think, by gleams of consciousness. It was as if two pictures, the scene of my dream and my actual surroundings, had been blended, one overlying the other, until the former, gradually fading, disappeared, and I was broad awake in the deserted cabin, entirely and tranquilly conscious of my situation. My foolish fear was gone, and opening my eyes I saw that my fire, not altogether burned out, had revived by the falling of a stick and was again lighting the room. I had probably slept only a few minutes, but my commonplace dream had somehow so strongly impressed me that I was no longer drowsy, and after a while I rose, pushed the embers of my fire together, and lighting my pipe, proceeded in a rather ludicrously methodical way to meditate upon my vision. It would have puzzled me then to say in what respect it was worth attention. In the first moment of serious thought that I gave to the matter, I recognized the city of my dream as Edinburgh, where I had never been. So if the dream was a memory, it was a memory of pictures and description. The recognition somehow deeply impressed me. It was as if something in my mind insisted rebelliously against will and reason on the importance of all this, and that faculty, whatever it was, asserted also a control of my speech. Surely, I said aloud, quite involuntarily, the MacGregors must have come here from Edinburgh. At the moment, neither the substance of this remark nor the fact of my making it surprised me in the least. It seemed entirely natural that I should know the name of my dream folk and something of their history. But the absurdity of it all soon dawned upon me. I laughed aloud, knocked the ashes from my pipe, and again stretched myself upon my bed of boughs and grass, where I lay staring absently into my failing fire, with no further thought of either my dream or my surroundings. Suddenly the single remaining flame crouched for a moment, then springing upward lifted itself clear of its embers and expired in air. The darkness was absolute. At that instant, almost it seemed before the gleam of the blaze had faded from my eyes, there was a dull, dead sound, as of some heavy body falling upon the floor, which shook beneath me as I lay. I sprang to a sitting posture, and groped at my side for my gun. My notion was that some wild beast had leaped in through the open window. While the flimsy structure was still shaking from the impact, I heard the sound of blows, the scuffling of feet upon the floor, and then, it seemed to come from almost within reach of my hand, the sharp shrieking of a woman in mortal agony. So horrible a cry I had never heard nor conceived. It utterly unnerved me. I was conscious for a moment of nothing but my own terror. 
Fortunately, my hand now found the weapon of which it was in search, and the familiar touch somewhat restored me. I leaped to my feet, straining my eyes to pierce the darkness. The violent sounds had ceased, but more terrible than these I heard at what seemed long intervals the faint, intermittent gasping of some living, dying thing. As my eyes grew accustomed to the dim light of the coals in the fireplace, I saw first the shapes of the door and window, looking blacker than the black of the walls. Next the distinction between wall and floor became discernible, and at last I was sensible to the form and full expanse of the floor from end to end and side to side. Nothing was visible, and the silence was unbroken. With a hand that shook a little, the other still grasping my gun, I restored my fire, and made a critical examination of the place. There was nowhere any sign that the cabin had been entered. My own tracks were visible in the dust covering the floor, but there were no others. I relit my pipe, provided fresh fuel by ripping a thin board or two from the inside of the house. I did not care to go into the darkness out of doors, and passed the rest of the night smoking and thinking and feeding my fire. Not for added years of life, would I have permitted that little flame to expire again? Some years afterward I met in Sacramento a man named Morgan, to whom I had a note of introduction from a friend in San Francisco. Dining with him one evening at his home, I observed various trophies upon the wall, indicating that he was fond of shooting. It turned out that he was, and in relating some of his feats he had mentioned having been in the region of my adventure. Mr. Morgan, I asked abruptly, do you know a place up there called McCarger's Gulch? I have good reason to, he replied. It was I who gave to the newspapers last year the accounts of the finding of the skeleton there. I had not heard of it. The accounts had been published, it appeared, while I was absent in the East. By the way, said Morgan, the name of the gulch is a corruption. It should have been called McGregor's. My dear, he added, speaking to his wife, Mr. Elderson has upset his wine. That was hardly accurate. I had simply dropped it, glass and all. There was an old shanty once in the gulch, Morgan resumed, when the ruin brought by my awkwardness had been repaired. But just previously to my visit it had been blown down, or rather blown away, for its debris was scattered all about, the very floor being parted, plank from plank. Between two of the sleepers still in position, I and my companion observed the remnant of a plaid shawl, and examining it, found that it was wrapped around the shoulders of the body of a woman, of whom little remained besides the bones, partly covered with fragments of clothing and brown dry skin. But we will spare Mrs. Morgan, he added with a smile. The lady had indeed exhibited signs of disgust rather than sympathy. It is necessary to say, however, he went on, that the skull was fractured in several places as by blows of some blunt instrument, and that instrument itself, a pick-handle, still stained with blood, lay under the boards nearby. Mr. Borgen turned to his wife. Pardon me, my dear, he said with affected solemnity, for mentioning these disagreeable particulars, the natural though regrettable incidents of a conjugal quarrel, resulting doubtless from the luckless wife's insubordination. "'I ought to be able to overlook it,' the lady replied with composure. "'You have so many times asked me to in those very words.' I thought he seemed to be rather glad to go on with his story. "'From these and other circumstances,' he said, "'the coroner's jury found that the deceased, Janet McGregor, came to her death from blows inflicted by some person to the jury unknown. But it was added that the evidence pointed strongly to her husband, Thomas McGregor, as the guilty person. But Thomas McGregor has never been found nor heard of. It was learned that the couple came from Edinburgh, but not, my dear, do you not observe Mr. Elderson's bone plate has water in it? I had deposited a chicken bone in my finger bowl. In a little cupboard I found a photograph of McGregor, but it did not lead to his capture. Will you let me see it? I said. The picture showed a dark man with an evil face made more forbidding by a long scar extending from near the temple diagonally downward into the black mustache. "'By the way, Mr. Elderson,' said my affable host, 
May I know why you asked about McCarger's Gulch? Uh, I lost a mule there once, I replied, and the mischance has quite upset me. My dear, said Mr. Morgan, with the mechanical intonation of an interpreter translating, the loss of Mr. Elderson's mule has peppered his coffee. End of the Secret of McCarger's Gulch The Iron Shroud by William Mudford This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Iron Shroud by William Mudford The castle of the Prince of Tolfi was built on the summit of the towering and precipitous rock of Scylla, and commanded a magnificent view of Sicily in all its grandeur. Here, during the wars of the Middle Ages, when the fertile plains of Italy were devastated by hostile factions, those prisoners were confined, for whose ransom a costly price was demanded. Here, too, in a dungeon, excavated deep in the solid rock, the miserable victim was immured, whom revenge pursued, the dark, fierce, and unpitying revenge of an Italian heart. Vivenzio, the noble and the generous, the fearless in battle, and the pride of Naples in her sunny hours of peace, the young, the brave, the proud, Vivenzio fell beneath this subtle and remorseful spirit. He was the prisoner of Tolfi, and he languished in that rock-encircled dungeon which stood alone, and whose portals never opened twice upon a living captive. It had the semblance of a vast cage, for the roof and floor and sides were of iron, solidly wrought and spaciously constructed. High above there ran a range of seven grated windows, guarded with massy bars of the same metal, which admitted light and air. Save these and the tall folding doors beneath them, which occupied the centre, no chink or chasm or projection broke the smooth black surface of the walls. An iron bedstead, littered with straw, stood in one corner, and beside it a vessel with water and a coarse dish filled with coarser food. Even the intrepid soul of Vivenzio shrunk with dismay as he entered this abode and heard the ponderous doors triple locked by the silent ruffians who conducted him to it. Their silence seemed prophetic of his fate, of the living grave that had been prepared for him. His menaces and his entreaties, his indignant appeals for justice, and his impatient questioning of their intentions, were alike vain. They listened but spoke not, fit ministers of a crime that should have no tongue. How dismal was the sound of their retiring steps, and as their faint echoes died along the winding passages, a fearful presage grew within him that never more the face or voice or tread of man would greet his senses. He had seen human beings for the last time, and he had looked his last upon the bright sky, and upon the smiling earth, and upon a beautiful world he loved, and whose minion he had been. Here he was to end his life, a life he had just begun to revel in. And by what means? By secret poison, or by murderous assault? No, for then it had been needless to bring him thither. Famine, perhaps, a thousand deaths in one. It was terrible to think of it, but it was yet more terrible to picture long, long years of captivity in a solitude so appalling, a loneliness so dreary, that thought, for want of fellowship, would lose itself in madness or stagnate into idiocy. He could not hope to escape unless he had the power, with his bare hands, of rending asunder the solid iron walls of his prison. He could not hope for liberty from the relentless mercies of his enemy, his instant death, under any form of refined cruelty, was not the object of Tolfi, for he might have inflicted it, and he had not. It was too evident, therefore, he was reserved for some premeditated scheme of subtle vengeance. And what vengeance could transcend in fiendish malice either the slow death of famine, or the still slower one of solitary incarceration, till the last lingering spark of life expired, or till reason fled and nothing should remain to perish, but the brute functions of the body. It was evening when Vivenzio entered his dungeon, and the approaching shades of night wrapped it in total darkness, as he paced up and down, revolving in his mind these horrible forebodings. No tolling bell from the castle, or from any neighboring church or convent, struck upon his ear to tell him how the hours passed. Frequently he would stop and listen for some sound that might betoken the vicinity of man, but the solitude of the desert, the silence of the tomb, 
are not so still and deep as the oppressive desolation by which he was encompassed his heart sunk within him and he threw himself dejectedly upon his couch of straw here sleep gradually obliterated the consciousness of misery and bland dreams wafted his delighted spirit to scenes which were once glowing realities for him in whose ravishing illusions he soon lost the remembrance that he was tolfi's prisoner when he awoke it was daylight but how long he had slept he knew not it might be early morning or it might be sultry noon for he could not measure time by no other note of its progress than light and darkness he had been so happy in his sleep amid friends who loved him and the sweeter endearments of those who loved him as friends could not that in the first moments of waking his startled mind seemed to admit the knowledge of his situation as if it had burst upon it for the first time fresh in all its appalling horrors he gazed round with an air of doubt and amazement and took up a handful of the straw upon which he lay as though he would ask himself what it meant but memory too faithful to her office soon unveiled the melancholy past while reason shuddering at the task flashed before his eyes the tremendous future the contrast overpowered him he remained for some time lamenting like a truth the bright visions that had vanished and recoiling from the present which clung to him as a poisoned garment when he grew more calm he surveyed his gloomy dungeons alas the stronger light of day only served to confirm what the gloomy indistinctness of the preceding evening had partially disclosed the utter impossibility of escape as however his eyes wandered round and round and from place to place he noticed two circumstances which excited his surprise and curiosity the one he thought might be fancy but the other was positive his pitcher of water and the dish which contained his food had been removed from his side while he slept and now stood near the door were he even inclined to doubt this by supposing he had mistaken the spot where he saw them overnight he could not for the pitcher now in his dungeon was neither of the same form nor colour as the other while the food was changed for some other of better quality he had been visited therefore during the night but how had the person obtained entrance could he have slept so soundly that the unlocking and opening of those ponderous portals were effected without waking him he would have said this was not possible but that in doing so he must admit a greater difficulty an entrance by any other means of which he was convinced there existed none it was not intended then that he should be left to perish from hunger but the secret and mysterious mode of supplying him with food seemed to indicate he was to have no opportunity of communicating with a human being the other circumstance which had attracted his notice was the disappearance as he believed of one of the seven grated windows that ran along the top of his prison he felt confident that he had observed and counted them for he was rather surprised at their number and there was something peculiar in their form as well as in the manner of their arrangement at unequal distances it was so much easier however to suppose he was mistaken than that a portion of the solid iron which formed the walls could have escaped from its position that he soon dismissed the thought from his mind vivenzio partook of the food that was before him without apprehension it might be poisoned but if it were he knew he could not escape death should such be the design of tolfi and the quickest death would be the speediest release the day passed wearily and gloomily though not without a faint hope that by keeping watch at night he might observe when the person came again to bring him food which he supposed he would do in the same way as before the mere thought of being approached by a living creature and the opportunity it might present of learning the doom prepared or preparing for him imparted some comfort besides if he came alone might he not in a furious onset overpower him or he might be accessible to pity or the influence of some munificent rewards as he could bestow if once more at liberty and master of himself say he were armed the worst that could befall if nor bribe nor prayers nor force prevailed was a faithful blow which though dealt in a damned cause might work a desired end there was no chance so desperate but it looked lovely in vivenzio's eyes compared with the idea of being totally abandoned the night came and vivenzio watched morning came and vivenzio was confounded he must have slumbered without knowing it sleep must have stolen over him when exhausted by fatigue and in that interval of feverish repose he had been baffled for there stood his replenished pitcher of water and there his day's meal nor was this all casting his looks toward the windows of his dungeon he counted but five here was no deception and he was not convinced there had been none the day before but what did all this portend into what strange and mysterious den had he been cast he gazed till his eyes ached 
he could discover nothing to explain the mystery. That it was so, he knew. Why it was so, he racked his imagination in vain to conjecture. He examined the doors. A simple circumstance convinced him they had not been opened. A wisp of straw which he had carelessly thrown against them the preceding day, as he paced to and fro, remained where he had cast it, though it must have been displaced by the slightest motion of either of the doors. This was evidence that could not be disputed, and it followed there must be some secret machinery in the walls by which a person could enter. He inspected them closely. They appeared to him one solid and compact mass of iron, or joined, if joined they were, with such nice art that no mark of division was perceptible. Again and again he surveyed them, in the floor, in the roof, in the range of visionary windows, as he was now almost tempted to consider them. He could discover nothing, absolutely nothing, to relieve his doubts or satisfy his curiosity. Sometimes he fancied that altogether the dungeon had a more contracted appearance, that it looked smaller. But this he ascribed to fancy and the impression naturally produced upon his mind by the undeniable disappearance of two of the windows. With intense anxiety, Vivenzio looked forward to the return of night, and as it approached he resolved that no treacherous sleep should again betray him. Instead of seeking his bed of straw, he continued to walk up and down his dungeon, till daylight, straining his eyes in every direction through the darkness, to watch for any appearances that might explain these mysteries. While thus engaged, and as nearly as he could judge, by the time that afterwards elapsed before the morning came in, about two o'clock, there was a slight tremulous motion of the floors. He stooped. The motion lasted nearly a minute, but it was so extremely gentle that he almost doubted whether it was real or only imaginary. He listened. Not a sound could be heard. Presently, however, he felt a rush of cold air blow upon him, and dashing towards the quarter whence it seemed to proceed, he stumbled over something which he judged to be the water ewer. The rush of cold air was no longer perceptible, and as Vivenzio stretched out his hands he found himself close to the walls. He remained motionless for a considerable time, but nothing occurred during the remainder of the night to excite his attention, though he continued to watch with unabated vigilance. The first approaches of the morning were visible through the grated windows, breaking with faint divisions of light the darkness that still pervaded every other part, long before Vivenzio was enabled to distinguish any object in his dungeon. Instinctively and fearfully he turned his eyes, hot and inflamed with watching towards them. There were four. He could see only four. But it might be that some intervening object prevented the fifth from becoming perceptible, and he waited impatiently to ascertain if it were so. As the light strengthened, however, and penetrated every corner of the cell, other objects of amazement struck his sight. On the ground lay the broken fragments of the pitcher he had used the day before, and at a small distance from them, nearer to the wall, stood the one he had noticed the first night. It was filled with water, and beside it was his food. He was now certain that by some mechanical contrivance an opening was obtained through the iron wall, and that through this opening the current of air had found entrance. But how noiseless! For had a feather almost waved at that time, he must have heard it. Again he examined that part of the wall, but both to sight and touch it appeared one even and uniform surface, while to repeated and violent blows there was no reverberating sound indicative of hollowness. This perplexing mystery had for a time withdrawn his thoughts from the windows, but now, directing his eyes again towards them, he saw that the fifth had disappeared in the same manner as the preceding two, without the least distinguishable alteration of external appearances. The remaining four looked as the seven had originally looked, that is, occupying, at irregular distances, the top of the wall on that side of the dungeon. The tall folding door, too, still seemed to stand beneath in the centre of these four, as it had at first stood in the centre of the seven. But he could no longer doubt what on the preceding day he fancied might be the effect of visual deception. The dungeon was smaller. The roof had lowered and the opposite ends had contracted the intermediate distance by a space equal, he thought, to that over which the three windows had extended. He was bewildered in vain imaginings to account for these things. Some frightful purpose, some devilish torture of mind or body, some unheard of device for producing exquisite misery, lurked, he was sure, in what had taken place. Oppressed with this belief, and distracted more by the dreadful uncertainty of whatever fate impended than he could be dismayed, he thought, 
by the knowledge of the worst he sat ruminating hour after hour yielding his fears in succession to every haggard fancy at last a horrible suspicion flashed suddenly across his mind and he started up with a frantic air yes he exclaimed looking wildly round his dungeon and shuddering as he spoke it yes it must be so i see it i feel the maddening truth like scorching flames upon my brain eternal god support me it must be so yes yes that is to be my fate yon roof will descend these walls will hem me round and slowly slowly crush me in their iron arms lord god look down upon me and in mercy strike me with instant death o fiend o devil is this your revenge he dashed upon the ground in agony tears burst from him and the sweat stood in large drops upon his face he sobbed aloud he tore his hair he rolled about like one suffering intolerable anguish of body and would have bitten the iron floor beneath him he breathed fearful curses upon tolfi and the next moment passionate prayers to heaven for immediate death then the violence of his grief became exhausted and he lay still weeping as a child would weep the twilight of departing day shed its gloom around him ere he arose from that posture of utter and hopeless sorrow he had taken no food not one drop of water had cooled the fever of his parched lips sleep had not visited his eyes for six and thirty hours he was faint with hunger weary with watching and with the excess of his emotions he tasted of his food he drank with avidity of the water and reeling like a drunken man to his straw cast himself upon it to brood again over the appalling image that had fastened itself upon his almost frenzied thoughts he slept but his slumbers were not tranquil he resisted as long as he could their approach and when at last enfeebled nature yielded to their influence he found no oblivion from his cares terrible dreams haunted him ghastly visions harrowed up his imagination he shouted and screamed as if he already felt the dungeon's ponderous roof descending on him he breathed hard and thick as though writhing between its iron walls then would he spring up stare wildly about him stretch forth his hands to be sure he yet had space enough to live and muttering some incoherent words sink down again to pass through the same fierce vicissitudes of delirious sleep the morning of the fourth day dawned upon vivenzio but it was high noon before his mind shook off its stupor or he awoke to a full consciousness of his situation and what a fixed energy of despair sat upon his pale features as he cast his eyes upwards and gazed upon the three windows that now alone remained the three they were no more and they seemed to number his own allotted days slowly and calmly he next surveyed the top and sides and comprehended all the meaning of the diminished height of the former as well as of the gradual approximation of the latter the contracted dimensions of his mysterious prison were now too gross and palpable to be the juggle of his heated imagination still lost in wonder at the means vivenzio could put no cheat upon his reason as to the end by what horrible ingenuity it was contrived that walls and roof and windows should thus silently and imperceptibly without noise and without motion almost fold as it were within each other he knew not he only knew that they did so and he vainly strove to persuade himself it was the intention of the contriver to rack the miserable wretch who might be immured there with anticipation merely of a fate from which in the very crisis of his agony he was to be reprieved gladly would he have clung even to this possibility if his heart would have led him but he felt a dreadful assurance of its fallacy and what matchless inhumanity it was to doom the sufferer to such lingering torments to lead him day by day to so appalling a death unsupported by the consolations of religion unvisited by any human being abandoned to himself deserted of all and denied even the sad privilege of knowing that his cruel destiny would awaken pity alone he was to perish alone he was to wait a slow coming torture whose most exquisite pangs would be inflicted by that very solitude and that tardy coming it is not death i fear he exclaimed but the death i must prepare for methinks too i could meet even that all horrible and revolting as it is if it might overtake me now but where shall i find fortitude to tarry till it come how can i outlive the three long days and nights i have to live there is no power within me to bid the hideous spectre hence none to make it familiar to my thoughts or myself patient of its errand my thoughts rather will flee from me and i grow mad in looking at it oh for a deep sleep to fall upon me that so in death's likeness i might embrace death itself and drink no more of the cup that is presented to me than my fainting spirit has already tasted 
in the midst of these lamentations vivenzio noticed that his accustomed meal with the pitcher of water had been conveyed as before into his dungeon but this circumstance no longer excited his surprise his mind was overwhelmed with others of a far greater magnitude it suggested however a feeble hope of deliverance and there is no hope so feeble as not to yield some support to a heart bending under despair he resolved to watch during the ensuing night for the signs he had before observed and should he again feel the gentle tremulous motion of the floor or the current of air to seize that moment for giving audible expression to his misery some person must be near him and within reach of his voice at the instant when his food was supplied some one perhaps susceptible of pity or if not to be told even that his apprehensions were just and that his fate was to be what he foreboded would be preferable to a suspense which hung upon the possibility of his worst fears being visionary the night came and as the hour approached when vivenzio imagined he might expect the signs he stood fixed and silent as a statue he feared to breathe almost lest he might lose any sound which would warn him of their coming while thus listening with every faculty of mind and body strained to an agony of attention it occurred to him he should be more sensible of the motion probably if he stretched himself along the iron floor he accordingly laid himself softly down and had not been long in that position when yes he was certain of it the floor moved under him he sprang up and in a voice suffocated nearly with emotion called aloud he paused the motion ceased he felt no stream of air all was hushed no voice answered to his he burst into tears and as he sank to the ground in renewed anguish exclaimed oh my god my god you alone have power to save me now or strengthen me for the trial you permit another morning dawned upon the wretched captive and the fatal index of his doom met his eyes two windows and two days and all would be over fresh food fresh water the mysterious visit had been paid though he had implored it in vain but how awfully was his prayer answered in what he now saw the roof of the dungeon was within a foot of his head the two ends were so near that in six paces he trod the space between them vivenzio shuddered as he gazed and as his steps traversed the narrow area but his feelings no longer vented themselves in frantic wailings with folded arms and clenched teeth with eyes that were bloodshot from much watching and fixed with a vacant glare upon the ground with a hard quick breathing and a hurried walk he strode backwards and forwards silent musing for several hours what mind shall conceive what tongue utter or what pen describe the dark and terrible character of his thoughts like the fate that moulded them they had no similitude in the wide range of this world's agony for man suddenly he stopped and his eyes were riveted upon that part of the wall which was over his bed of straw words are inscribed there a human language traced by a human hand he rushes towards them but his blood freezes as he reads i ludovico sforza tempted by the gold of the prince of tolfi spent three years in contriving and executing this accursed triumph of art when it was completed the perfidious tolfi more devil than man who conducted me thither one morning to be witness as he said of its first perfection doomed me to be the first victim of my own pernicious skill lest as he declared i should divulge the secret or repeat the effort of my ingenuity may god pardon him as i hope he will me that ministered to his unhallowed purpose miserable wretch whoe'er thou art that readest these lines fall on thy knees and invoke as i have done his sustaining mercy who alone can nerve thee to meet the vengeance of tolfi armed with his tremendous engine which in a few hours must crush you as it will the needy wretch who made it a deep groan burst from vivenzio he stood like one transfixed with dilated eyes expanded nostrils and quivering lips gazing at this fatal inscription it was as if a voice from the sepulchre had sounded in his ears prepare hope forsook him there was his sentence recorded in those dismal words the future stood unveiled before him ghastly and appalling his brain already feels the descending aura his bones seem to crack and crumble in the mighty grasp of the iron walls unknowing what it is he does he fumbles in his garment for some weapon of self-destruction he clenches his throat in his convulsive grip as though he would strangle himself at once he stares upon the walls and his warring spirit demands will they not anticipate their office if i dash my head against them an hysterical laugh chokes him as he exclaims why should i he was but a man who died first in their fierce embrace and i should be less than man not to do as much 
the evening sun was descending and vivenzio beheld its golden beams streaming through one of the windows what a thrill of joy shot through his soul at the sight it was a precious link that united him for the moment with the world beyond there was ecstasy in the thought as he gazed long and earnestly it seemed as if the windows had lowered sufficiently for him to reach them with one bound he was beneath them with one wild spring he clung to the bars whether it was so contrived purposely to madden with delight the wretch who looked he knew not but at the extremity of a long vista cut through the solid rocks the ocean the sky the setting sun olive groves shady walks and in the farthest distance delicious glimpses of magnificent sicily burst upon his sight how exquisite was the cool breeze as it swept across his cheek loaded with fragrance he inhaled it as though it were the breath of continued life and there was a freshness in the landscape and in the rippling of the calm green sea that fell upon his withering heart like dew upon the parched earth how he gazed and panted and still clung to his hold sometimes hanging by one hand sometimes by the other and then grasping the bars with both as loath to quit the smiling paradise outstretched before him till exhausted and his hands swollen and benumbed he dropped helpless down and lay stunned for a considerable time by the fall when he recovered the glorious vision had vanished he was in darkness he doubted whether it was not a dream that had passed before his sleeping fancy but gradually his scattered thoughts returned and with them came remembrance yes he had looked once again upon the gorgeous splendour of nature once again his eyes had trembled beneath their veiled lids at the sun's radiance and sought repose in the soft verdure of the olive tree or the gentle swell of undulating waves oh that he were a mariner exposed upon those waves to the worst fury of storm and tempest or a very wretch loathsome with disease plague-stricken and his body one leprous contagion from crown to sole hunted forth to gasp out the remnant of infectious life beneath those verdant trees so he might shun the destiny upon whose edge he tottered vain thoughts like these would steal over his mind from time to time in spite of himself but they scarcely moved it from that stupor into which it had sunk and which kept him during the whole night like one who had been drugged with opium he was equally insensible to the calls of hunger and of thirst though the third day was now commencing since even a drop of water had passed his lips he remained on the ground sometimes sitting sometimes lying at intervals sleeping heavily and when not sleeping silently brooding over what was to come or talking aloud in disordered speech of his wrongs of his friends of his home and of those he loved with a confused mingling of all in this pitiable condition the sixth and last morning dawned upon vivenzio if dawn it might be called the dim obscure light which faintly struggled through the one solitary window of the dungeon he could hardly be said to notice the melancholy token and yet he did notice it for as he raised his eyes and saw the portentous sign there was a slight convulsive distortion of his countenance but what did attract his notice and at the sight of which his agitation was excessive was the change his iron bed had undergone it was a bed no longer it stood before him the visible semblance of a funeral couch or bier when he beheld this he started from the ground and in raising himself suddenly struck his head against the roof which was now so low that he could no longer stand upright god's will be done was all he said as he crouched his body and placed his hand upon the bier for such it was the iron bedstead had been so contrived by the mechanical art of ludovico sforza that as the advancing walls came in to contract with its head and feet a pressure was produced upon the concealed springs which when they made to play set in motion a very simple though ingeniously contrived machinery that effected the transformation the object was of course to heighten in the closing scene of this horrible drama all the feelings of despair and anguish which the preceding ones had aroused for the same reason the last window was so made as to admit only a shadowy kind of gloom rather than light that the wretched captive might be surrounded as it were with every seeming preparation for approaching death vivenzio seated himself on his bier then he knelt and prayed fervently and sometimes tears would gush from him the air seemed thick and he breathed with difficulty or it might be that he fancied it was so from the hot and narrow limits of his dungeon which were now so diminished that he could neither stand up nor lie down at his full length but his wasted spirits and oppressed mind no longer struggled within him he was past hope and fear shook him no more happy if thus revenge had struck its final blow for he would have fallen beneath it almost unconscious of a pang but such a lethargy of the soul 
after such an excitement of its fiercest passions, had entered into the diabolical calculation of Tolfi, and the fell artificer of his designs had imagined a counteracting device. The tolling of an enormous bell struck upon the ears of Avenzio. He started. It beat but once. The sound was so close and stunning that it seemed to shatter his very brain, while it echoed through the rocky passages like reverberating peals of thunder. This was followed by a sudden crash of the roof and walls, as if they were about to fall upon him and close around him at once. Vivenzio screamed, and instinctively spread forth his arms, as though he had a giant strength to hold them back. They had moved nearer to him, and were now motionless. Vivenzio looked up and saw the roof almost touching his head, even as he sat cowering beneath it, and he felt that a farther contraction of it, but a few inches only, must commence the frightful operation. Roused as he had been, he now gasped for breath. His body shook violently. He was bent nearly double. His hands rested upon either wall, and his feet were drawn under him to avoid the pressure in front. Thus he remained for more than an hour, when that deafening bell beat again, and again there came the crash of horrid death. But the concussion was now so great that it struck Vivenzio down. As he lay gathered up in lessened bulk, the bell beat loud and frequent. Crash succeeded crash, and on and on and on came the mysterious engine of death, till Vivenzio's smothered groans were heard no more. He was horribly crushed by the ponderous roof and collapsing sides, and the flattened byre was his iron shroud. End of the Iron Shroud by William Mudford The Burial of the Rats by Bram Stoker this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Burial of the Rats by Bram Stoker Leaving Paris by the Orleans Road, cross the Enceinte, and turning to the right, you find yourself in a somewhat wild and not at all savory district. Right and left, before and behind, on every side rise great heaps of dust and waste, accumulated by the process of time. Paris has its night as well as its day life, and the sojourner who enters his hotel in the Rue de Rivoli or the Rue Saint Honore, late at night or leaves it early in the morning, can guess, in coming near Montrouge, if he has not done so already, the purpose of those great wagons that look like boilers on wheels, which he finds halting everywhere as he passes. Every city has its peculiar institutions created out of its own needs, and one of the most notable institutions of Paris is its rag-picking population. In the early morning, and Parisian life commences at an early hour, may be seen in most streets standing on the pathway opposite every court and alley, and between every few houses, as still in some American cities, even in parts of New York, large wooden boxes into which the domestics or tenement holders empty the accumulated dust of the past day. Round these boxes gather and pass on, when the work is done, to fresh fields of labor and pastures new, squalid, hungry-looking men and women the implements of whose craft consist of a coarse bag or basket slung over the shoulder, and a little rake with which they turn over and probe and examine in the minutest manner the dust-bins. They pick up and deposit in their baskets, by aid of their rakes, whatever they may find, with the same facility as a Chinaman uses his chopsticks. Paris is a city of centralization and centralization and classification are closely allied. In the early times, when centralization is becoming a fact, its forerunner is classification. All things which are similar or analogous become grouped together, and from the grouping of groups rises one whole or central point. We see radiating many long arms with innumerable tentaculi, and in the center rises a gigantic head with a comprehensive brain and keen eyes to look on every side, and ears sensitive to hear, and a voracious mouth to swallow. Other cities resemble all the birds and beasts and fishes whose appetites and digestions are normal. 
Paris alone is the analogal apotheosis of the octopus. Product of centralization carried to an ad absurdum, it fairly represents the devilfish, and in no respects is the resemblance more curious than in the similarity of the digestive apparatus. Those intelligent tourists, who, having surrendered their individuality into the hands of Messrs. Cook or Gazet, do Paris in three days, are often puzzled to know how it is that the dinner which in London would cost about six shillings can be had for three francs in a café in the Palais Royal. They need have no more wonder if they will but consider the classification which is a theoretic specialty of the Parisian life, and adopt all round the fact from which the chiffonier has his genesis. The Paris of 1850 was not like the Paris of to-day, and those who see the Paris of Napoleon and Baron Haussmann can hardly realize the existence of the state of things forty-five years ago. Amongst other things, however, which have not changed are those districts where the waste is gathered. Dust is dust all the world over, in every age, and the family likeness of dust heaps is perfect. The traveller, therefore, who visits the environs of Montrouge can go back in fancy without difficulty to the year 1850. In this year I was making a prolonged stay in Paris. I was very much in love with a young lady who, though she returned my passion, so far yielded to the wishes of her parents that she had promised not to see me or to correspond with me for a year. I, too, had been compelled to accede to these conditions under a vague hope of parental approval. During the term of probation I had promised to remain out of the country and not to write to my dear one until the expiration of the year. Naturally, the time went heavily with me. There was no one of my own family or circle who could tell me of Alice, and none of her own folk had, I am sorry to say, sufficient generosity to send me even an occasional word of comfort regarding her health and well-being. I spent six months wandering about Europe, but as I could find no satisfactory distraction in travel, I determined to come to Paris, where, at least, I could be within easy hail of London in case any good fortune should call me thither before the appointed time. That hope deferred maketh the heart sick was never better exemplified than in my case, for, in addition to the perpetual longing to see the face I loved, there was always with me a harrowing anxiety lest some accident should prevent me showing Alice in due time that I had, throughout the long period of probation, been faithful to her trust and my own love. Thus every adventure which I undertook had a fierce pleasure of its own, for it was fraught with possible consequences greater than it would have ordinarily borne. Like all travellers, I exhausted the places of most interest in the first month of my stay, and was driven in the second month to look for amusement whithersoever I might. Having made sundry journeys to the better-known suburbs, I began to see that there was a terra incognita, in so far as the guide-book was concerned, in the social wilderness lying between these attractive points. Accordingly, I began to systematize my researches and each day took up the thread of my exploration at the place where I had on the previous day dropped it. In process of time my wanderings led me near Montrouge, and I saw that hereabouts lay the ultima thule of special exploration, a country as little known as that round the source of the White Nile. And so I determined to investigate philosophically the chiffonier, his habitat, his life, and his means of life. The job was an unsavory one, difficult of the accomplishment, and with little hope of adequate reward. However, despite reason, obstinacy prevailed, and I entered into my new investigation with a keener energy than I could have summoned to aid me in any investigation leading to any end, valuable or worthy. One day, late in a fine afternoon, toward the end of September, I entered the Holy of Holies, of the City of Dust. The place was evidently the recognized abode of a number of chiffoniers, 
for some sort of arrangement was manifested in the formation of the dust heaps near the road. I passed amongst these heaps, which stood like orderly sentries, determined to penetrate further and trace dust to its ultimate location. As I passed along, I saw behind the dust heaps of a few forms that flitted to and fro, evidently watching with interest the advent of any stranger to such a place. The district was like a small Switzerland, and as I went forward, my tortuous course shut out the path behind me. Presently I got into what seemed a small city or community of chiffoniers. There were a number of shanties or huts, such as may be met with in the remote parts of the Bog of Allen, rude places with wattled walls plastered with mud and roofs of rude thatch made from stable refuse such places as one would not like to enter for any consideration, and which, even in water-colour, could only look picturesque if judiciously treated. In the midst of these huts was one of the strangest adaptations, I cannot say habitations, I had ever seen. An immense old wardrobe, the colossal remnant of some boudoir of Charles the Seventh or Henry the Second, had been converted into a dwelling-house. The double doors lay open, so that the entire menage was open to public view. In the open half of the wardrobe was a common sitting-room of some four feet by six, in which sat, smoking their pipes round a charcoal brazier, no fewer than six old soldiers of the First Republic, with their uniforms torn and worn threadbare. Evidently they were of the mauvais sujet class their blear eyes and limp jaws told plainly of a common love of absinthe, and their eyes had that haggard, worn look which stamps the drunkard at his worst, and that look of slumbering ferocity which follows hard in the wake of drink. The other side stood as of old, with its shelves intact, save that they were cut to half their depth, and in each shelf, of which there were six, was a bed made with rags and straw. The half-dozen of worthies who inhabited this structure looked at me curiously as I passed, and when I looked back, after going a little way, I saw their heads together in a whispered conference. I did not like the look of this at all, for the place was very lonely, and the men looked very, very villainous. However, I did not see any cause for fear, and went on my way, penetrating further and further into the Sahara. The way was tortuous to a degree, and from going round in a series of semicircles, as one goes in skating with the Dutch roll, I got rather confused with regard to the points of the compass. When I had penetrated a little way, I saw, as I turned the corner of a half-made heap, sitting on a heap of straw, an old soldier with a threadbare coat. Hello, I said to myself. The First Republic is well represented here in its soldiery." As I passed him, the old man never even looked up at me, but gazed on the ground with stolid persistency. Again I remarked to myself, "'See what a life of rude warfare can do! This old man's curiosity is a thing of the past!' When I had gone a few steps, however, I looked back suddenly and saw that the curiosity was not dead for the veteran had raised his head and was regarding me with a very queer expression. He seemed to me to look very like one of the six worthies in the press. When he saw me looking he dropped his head, and without thinking further of him I went on my way, satisfied that there was a strange likeness between these old warriors. Presently I met another old soldier in a similar manner. He, too, did not notice me whilst I was passing. By this time it was getting late in the afternoon, and I began to think of retracing my steps. Accordingly I turned to go back, but could see a number of tracks leading between different mounds, and could not ascertain which of them I should take. In my perplexity I wanted to see someone of whom to ask the way, but could see no one. I determined to go on a few mounds further, and so try to see someone, not a veteran. I gained my object, for after going a couple of hundred yards 
I saw before me a single shanty such as I had seen before, with, however, the difference that this was not one for living in, but merely a roof with three walls open in front. From the evidences which the neighborhood exhibited I took it to be a place for sorting. Within it was an old woman, wrinkled and bent with age. I approached her to ask the way. She rose as I came close, and I asked her my way. She immediately commenced a conversation. And it occurred to me that here in the very center of the kingdom of dust was the place to gather details of the history of Parisian rag-picking, particularly as I could do so from the lips of one who looked like the oldest inhabitant. I began my inquiries, and the old woman gave me most interesting answers. She had been one of the Setuses who sat daily before the guillotine and had taken an active part among the women who signalized themselves by their violence in the Revolution. While we were talking, she said suddenly, "'But monsieur must be tired standing,' and dusted a rickety old stool for me to sit down. I hardly liked to do so for many reasons, but the poor old woman was so civil that I did not like to run the risk of hurting her by refusing. And, moreover, the conversation of one who had been at the taking of the Bastille was so interesting that I sat down, and so our conversation went on. While we were talking, an old man, older and more bent and wrinkled even than the woman, appeared from behind the shanty. "'Here is Pierre,' said she. "'Monsieur can hear stories now if he wishes, for Pierre was in everything, from the Bastille to Waterloo." The old man took another stool at my request, and we plunged into a sea of revolutionary reminiscences. This old man, albeit clothed like a scarecrow, was like any one of the six veterans. I was now sitting in the center of the low hut with the woman on my left hand and the man on my right, each of them being somewhat in front of me. The place was full of all sorts of curious objects of lumber, and of many things that I wished far away. In one corner was a heap of rags which seemed to move from the number of vermin it contained, and in the other a heap of bones whose odor was something shocking. Every now and then, glancing at the heaps, I could see the gleaming eyes of some of the rats which infested the place. These loathsome objects were bad enough but what looked even more dreadful was an old butcher's axe with an iron handle stained with clots of blood leaning up against the wall on the right-hand side. Still, these things did not give me much concern. The talk of the two old people was so fascinating that I stayed on and on, till the evening came and the dust heaps threw dark shadows over the veils between them. After a time I began to grow uneasy. I could not tell how or why, but somehow I did not feel satisfied. Uneasiness is an instinct and means warning. The psychic faculties are often the sentries of the intellect, and when they sound alarm the reason begins to act, although perhaps not consciously. This was so with me. I began to bethink me where I was and by what surrounded and to wonder how I should fare in case I should be attacked. And then the thought suddenly burst upon me, although without any overt cause, that I was in danger. Prudence whispered, Be still, and make no sign. And so I was still, and made no sign, for I knew that four cunning eyes were on me. Four eyes, if not more! My God! What a horrible thought! The whole shanty might be surrounded on three sides with villains. I might be in the midst of a band of such desperadoes as only half a century of periodic revolution can produce. With a sense of danger my intellect and observation quickened, and I grew more watchful than was my wont. I noticed that the old woman's eyes were constantly wandering toward my hands. I looked at them, too. I saw the cause my rings. On my left little finger I had a large signet, and on the right a good diamond. I thought that if there was any danger my first care was to avert suspicion. Accordingly, 
I began to work the conversation round to rag-picking, to the drains, of the things found there, and so, by easy stages, to jewels. Then, seizing a favourable opportunity, I asked the old woman if she knew anything of such things. She answered that she did, a little. I held out my right hand, and, showing her the diamond, asked her what she thought of that. She answered that her eyes were bad, and she stooped over my hand. I said as nonchalantly as I could, "'Pardon me, you will see better thus,' and, taking it off, handed it to her. An unholy light came into her withered old face as she touched it. She stole one glance at me swift and keen as a flash of lightning. She bent over the ring for a moment, her face quite concealed as though examining it. The old man looked straight out of the front of the shanty before him, at the same time fumbling in his pockets and producing a screw of tobacco in a paper and a pipe, which he proceeded to fill. I took advantage of the pause, and the momentary rest from the searching eyes on my face, to look carefully round the place, now dim and shadowy in the gloaming. There still lay all the heaps of varied reeking foulness. There the terrible blood-stained axe, leaning against the wall in the right-hand corner, and everywhere, despite the gloom, the baleful glitter of the eyes of the rats. I could see them even through some of the chinks of the boards at the back low down close to the ground. But stay! These latter eyes seemed more than usually large and bright and baleful. For an instant my heart stood still, and I felt in that whirling condition of mind in which one feels a sort of spiritual drunkenness, and as though the body is only maintained erect in that there is no time for it to fall before recovery. Then, in another second, I was calm, coldly calm, with all my energies in full vigour, with a self-control which I felt to be perfect, and with all my feeling and instincts alert. Now I knew the full extent of my danger. I was watched and surrounded by desperate people. I could not even guess at how many of them were lying there on the ground behind the shanty, waiting for the moment to strike. I knew that I was big and strong, and they knew it too. They knew also, as I did, that I was an Englishman and would make a fight for it. And so we waited. I had, I felt, gained an advantage in the last few seconds, for I knew my danger and understood the situation. Now, I thought, is the test of my courage, the enduring test. The fighting test may come later. The old woman raised her head and said to me in a satisfied kind of way, "'A very fine ring, indeed, a beautiful ring. Oh, me, I once had such rings, plenty of them, and bracelets and the rings. Oh, for in those fine days I led the town a dance, but they have forgotten me now, they forgotten me.' They? Why, they never heard of me. Perhaps their grandfathers remember me, some of them. And she laughed a harsh, croaking laugh. And then I am bound to say that she astonished me, for she handed me back the ring with a certain suggestion of old-fashioned grace which was not without its pathos. The old man eyed her with a sort of sudden ferocity half rising from his stool, and said to me suddenly and hoarsely, "'Let me see.' I was about to hand the ring, when the old woman said, "'No, no, do not give it to Pierre. Pierre is eccentric. He loses things, and such a pretty ring.' "'Cut,' said the old man savagely. Suddenly the old woman said, rather more loudly than was necessary, "'Wait!' I shall tell you something about a ring." There was something in the sound other voice that jarred upon me. Perhaps it was my hypersensitiveness, wrought up as I was to such a pitch of nervous excitement, but I seemed to think that she was not addressing me. As I stole a glance round the place, I saw the eyes of the rats in the bone-heaps, 
but I missed the eyes along the back. But even as I looked I saw them again appear. The old woman's wait had given me a respite from attack, and the men had sunk back to their reclining position. I once lost a ring, a beautiful diamond hoop that had belonged to a queen, and which was given to me by a farmer of the taxes, who afterwards cut his throat because I sent him away. I thought it must have been stolen and taxed my people, but I could get no trace. The police came and suggested that it had found its way to the drain. We descended, I in my fine clothes, for I would not trust them with my beautiful ring. I know more of the drain since then, and of the rats too, but I shall never forget the horror of that place, alive with brazing eyes, a wall of them just outside the light of our torches. Well, we got beneath my house, we searched the outlet of the drain, and there, in the field, found my ring, and we came out. But we found something else else before we came. As we were coming toward the opening, a lot of sewer rats, human ones this time, came toward us. They told the police that one of their number had gone into the drain, but had not returned. He had gone in only shortly before we had, and, if lost, could hardly be far off. They asked help to seek him, so we turned back. They tried to prevent me going, but I insisted. It was a new excitement, and I had not recovered my ring. Not far did we go till we came on something. There was but little water, and the bottom of the drain was raised with brick, rubbish, and much matter of the kind. He had made a fight for it, even when his torch had gone out, but they were too many for him. They had not been long about it. The bones were still warm, but they were picked clean. They had not been long about it. The bones were still warm, but they were picked clean. They had even eaten their own dead ones, and there were bones of rats as well as of the men. They took it cool enough, those are there, the human ones, and joked of their comrade when they found him dead, though they would have helped him living. Bah! What matters it, life or death? And had you no fear? I asked her. Fear? she said with a laugh. Me have fear? Ask Pierre. But I was young ere then, and as I came through that horrible drain with its wall of greedy eyes, always moving with the circle of the light from the torches, I did not feel easy. I kept on before the men, though. It was a way I have. I never let the men get it before me. All I want is a chance and a means. And they ate him up, took every trace away except the bones, and no one knew it, nor no sound of him was ever heard. Here she broke into a chuckling fit of the ghastliest merriment which it was ever my lot to hear and see. A great poetess describes her heroine singing, Oh, to see or hear her singing, scarce I know which is the divinest. And I can apply the same idea to the old crone, in all save the divinity, for I scarce could tell which was the most hellish, the harsh, malicious, satisfied, cruel laugh, or the leering grin, and the horrible square opening of the mouth like a tragic mask, and the yellow gleam of the few discolored teeth in the shapeless gums. In that laugh, and with that grin and the chuckling satisfaction, I knew as well as if it had been spoken to me in words of thunder that my murder was settled, and the murderers only bided the proper time for its accomplishment. I could read between the lines of her gruesome story the commands to her accomplices. "'Wait,' she seemed to say, "'bide your time. I shall strike the first blow. Find the weapon for me, and I shall make the opportunity. 
he shall not escape. Keep him quiet, and then no one will be wiser. There will be no outcry, and the rats will do their work." It was growing darker and darker. The night was coming. I stole a glance round the shanty, still all the same. The bloody axe in the corner, the heaps of filth, and the eyes on the bone heaps and in the crannies of the floor. Pierre had been still ostensibly filling his pipe. He now struck a light and began to puff away at it. The old woman said, "'Dear heart, how dark it is! Pierre, like a good lad, light the lamp!' Pierre got up and with the lighted match in his hand touched the wick of a lamp which hung at one side of the entrance to the shanty, and which had a reflector that threw the light all over the place. It was evidently that which was used for their sorting at night. "'Not that, stupid! Not that! The lantern!' she called out to him. He immediately blew it out, saying, "'All right, mother, I'll find it!' And he hustled about the left corner of the room, the old woman saying through the darkness, "'The lantern! The lantern! Oh, that is the light that is most useful to us poor folks! The lantern was the friend of the revolution! It is the friend of the chiffonier! It helps us when all else fails!' Hardly had she said the word when there was a kind of creaking of the whole place, and something was steadily dragged over the roof. Again I seemed to read between the lines of her words. I knew the lesson of the lantern. One of you get on the roof with a noose and strangle him as he passes out if we fail within. As I looked out of the opening I saw the loop of a rope outlined black against the lurid sky. I was now indeed beset. Pierre was not long in finding the lantern. I kept my eyes fixed through the darkness on the old woman. Pierre struck his light, and by its flash I saw the old woman raise from the ground beside her, where it had mysteriously appeared, and then hide in the folds other gown, a long sharp knife or dagger. It seemed to be like a butcher's sharpening iron, fine to a keen point. The lantern was lit. "'Bring it here, Pierre,' she said. "'Place it in the doorway, where we can see it. See how nice it is. It shuts out the darkness from us. It is just right.' Just right for her, and her purposes, it threw all its light on my face, leaving in gloom the faces of both Pierre and the woman, who sat outside of me on each side. I felt that the time of action was approaching, and I knew now that the first signal and movement would come from the woman, so I watched her. I was all unarmed, but I had made up my mind what to do. At the first movement I would seize the butcher's axe in the right-hand corner and fight my way out. At least I would die hard. I stole a glance round to fix its exact locality so that I could not fail to seize it at the first effort, for then, if ever, time and accuracy would be precious. Good God! It was gone! All the horror of the situation burst upon me, but the bitterest thought of all was that if the issue of the terrible position should be against me, Alice would infallibly suffer. Either she would believe me false, and any lover, or any one who has ever been one, can imagine the bitterness of the thought, or else she would go on loving long after I had been lost to her and to the world, so that her life would be broken and embittered, shattered with disappointment and despair. The very magnitude of the pain braced me up and nerved me to bear the dread scrutiny of the plotters. I think I did not betray myself. The old woman was watching me as a cat does a mouse. She had her right hand hidden in the folds of her gown, clutching, I knew, that long, cruel-looking dagger. Had she seen any disappointment in my face, she would, I felt, have known that the moment had come, and would have sprung on me like a tigress, certain of taking me unprepared. I looked out into the night, and there I saw new cause for danger. 
before and around the hut were, at a little distance, some shadowy forms. They were quite still, but I knew that they were all alert and on guard. Small chance for me now in that direction. Again I stole a glance round the place. In moments of great excitement and of great danger, which is excitement, the mind works very quickly, and the keenness of the faculties which depend on the mind grows in proportion. I now felt this. In an instant I took in the whole situation. I saw that the axe had been taken through a small hole made in one of the rotten boards. How rotten they must be to allow of such a thing being done without a particle of noise! The hut was a regular murder trap, and was guarded all around. A garroter lay on the roof ready to entangle me with his noose if I should escape the dagger of the old hag. In front the way was guarded by I know not how many watchers. And at the back was a row of desperate men. I had seen their eyes still through the crack in the boards of the floor when last I looked, as they lay prone waiting for the signal to start erect. If it was to be ever, now for it. As nonchalantly as I could, I turned slightly on my stool so as to get my right leg well under me. Then, with a sudden jump, turning my head and guarding it with my hands, and with the fighting instinct of the knights of old, I breathed my lady's name and hurled myself against the back wall of the hut. Watching as they were, the suddenness of my movement surprised both Pierre and the old woman. As I crashed through the rotten timbers, I saw the old woman rise with a leap like a tiger, and heard her low gasp of baffled rage. My feet lit on something that moved, and as I jumped away I knew that I had stepped on the back of one of the row of men lying on their faces outside the hut. I was torn with nails and splinters, but otherwise unhurt. Breathless, I rushed up the mound in front of me, hearing as I went the dull crash of the shanty as it collapsed into a mass. It was a nightmare climb. The mound, though but low, was awfully steep, and with each step I took the mass of dust and cinders tore down with me and gave way under my feet. The dust rose and choked me. It was sickening, fetid, awful. But my climb was, I felt, for life or death, and I struggled on. The seconds seemed hours, but the few moments I had in starting, combined with my youth and strength, gave me a great advantage and though several forms struggled after me in deadly silence, which was more dreadful than any sound, I easily reached the top. Since then I have climbed the cone of Vesuvius, and as I struggled up that dreary steep amid the sulphurous fumes and memory of that awful night at Montrouge, came back to me so vividly that I almost grew faint. The mound was one of the tallest in the region of dust, and as I struggled to the top, panting for breath and with my heart beating like a sledgehammer, I saw away to my left the dull red gleam of the sky, and nearer still the flash of lights. Thank God! I knew where I was now, and where lay the road to Paris. For two or three seconds I paused and looked back. My pursuers were still well behind me, but struggling up resolutely and in deadly silence. Beyond, the shanty was a wreck, a mass of timber and moving forms. I could see it well, for flames were already bursting out. The rags and straw had evidently caught fire from the lantern. Still silence there, not a sound. These old wretches could die game anyhow. I had no time for more than a passing glance, for as I cast an eye round the mound preparatory to making my descent, I saw several dark forms brushing round on either side to cut me off on my way. It was now a race for life. They were trying to head me on my way to Paris, and with the instinct of the moment I dashed down to the right-hand side. I was just in time, for, though I came as it seemed to me down the steep in a few steps, the wary old men who were watching me turned back and one, as I rushed by into the opening between the two mounds in front, 
almost struck me a blow with that terrible butcher's axe. There could surely not be two such weapons about. Then began a really horrible chase. I easily ran ahead of the old men, and even when some younger ones and a few women joined in the hunt, I easily distanced them. But I did not know the way, and I could not even guide myself by the light in the sky, for I was running away from it. I had heard that, unless of conscious purpose, hunted men turn always to the left, and so I found it now, and so, I suppose, knew also my pursuers, who were more animals than men, and with cunning or instinct had found out such secrets for themselves. For on finishing a quick spurt, after which I intended to take a moment's breathing space, I suddenly saw ahead of me two or three forms swiftly passing behind a mound to the right. I was in the spider's web now, indeed. But with the thought of this new danger came the resource of the hunted, and so I darted down the next turning to the right. I continued in this direction for some hundred yards, and then, making a turn to the left again, felt certain that I had, at any rate, avoided the danger of being surrounded. But not of pursuit. For on came the rabble after me, steady, dogged, relentless, and still in grim silence. In the greater darkness the mound seemed now to be somewhat smaller than before, although, for the night was closing, they looked bigger in proportion. I was now well ahead of my pursuers, so I made a dart up the mound in front. Oh, joy of joys! I was close to the edge of this inferno of dust-heaps. Away behind me the red light of Paris in the sky, and towering up behind rose the heights of Montmartre, a dim light, with here and there brilliant points like stars. Restored to vigor in a moment, I ran over the few remaining mounds of decreasing size, and found myself on the level land beyond. Even then, however, the prospect was not inviting. All before me was dark and dismal, and I had evidently come on one of those dank, low-lying waste places which are found here and there in the neighborhood of great cities. Places of waste and desolation, where the space is required for the ultimate agglomeration of all that is noxious, and the ground is so poor as to create no desire of occupancy even in the lowest squatter. With eyes accustomed to the gloom of the evening, and away now from the shadows of those dreadful dust-heaps, I could see much more easily than I could a little while ago. It might have been, of course, that the glare in the sky of the lights of Paris, though the city was some miles away, was reflected here. Howsoever it was, I saw well enough to take bearings for certainly some little distance around me. In front was a bleak, flat waste that seemed almost dead level, with here and there the dark shimmering of stagnant pools. Seemingly far off on the right, amid a small cluster of scattered lights, rose a dark mass of Fort Montrouge, and away to the left, in the dim distance, pointed with stray gleams from cottage windows, the lights in the sky show the locality of Bicetre. A moment's thought decided me to take to the right and to try to reach Montrouge. There at least would be some sort of safety, and I might possibly long before come on some of the crossroads which I knew. Somewhere, not far off, must lie the strategic road made to connect the outlying chain of forts circling the city. Then I looked back. Coming over the mounds, and outlined black against the glare of the Parisian horizon, I saw several moving figures, and still away to the right several more deploying out between me and my destination. They evidently meant to cut me off in this direction, and so my choice became constricted. It lay now between going straight ahead or turning to the left. Stooping to the ground, so as to get the advantage of the horizon as a line of sight, I looked carefully in this direction, but could detect no sign of my enemies. I argued that, as they had not guarded, or were not trying to guard that point, there was evidently danger to me there already. So I made up my mind to go straight on before me. 
It was not an inviting prospect, and as I went on the reality grew worse. The ground became soft and oozy, and now and again gave way beneath me in a sickening kind of way. I seemed somehow to be going down, for I saw round me places seemingly more elevated than where I was, and this in a place which from a little way back seemed dead level. I looked around, but could see none of my pursuers. This was strange, for all along these birds of the night had followed me through the darkness as well as though it was broad daylight. How I blamed myself for coming out in my light-colored tourist suit of tweed! The silence, and my not being able to see my enemies, whilst I felt that they were watching me, grew appalling, and in the hope of someone not of this ghastly crew hearing me, I raised my voice and shouted several times. There was not the slightest response, not even an echo rewarded my efforts. For a while I stood stock still and kept my eyes in one direction. On one of the rising places around me I saw something dark move along, then another, and another. This was to my left, and seemingly moving to head me off. I thought that again I might, with my skill as a runner, elude my enemies at this game, and so, with all my speed, darted forward. Splash! My feet had given way in a mass of slimy rubbish, and I had fallen headlong into a reeking, stagnant pool. The water and the mud in which my arms sank up to the elbows was filthy and nauseous beyond description and in the suddenness of my fall I had actually swallowed some of the filthy stuff, which nearly choked me, and made me gasp for breath. Never shall I forget the moments during which I stood trying to recover myself, almost fainting from the fetid odor of the filthy pool, whose white mist rose ghost-like around. Worst of all, with the acute despair of the hunted animal, when he sees the pursuing pack closing on him, I saw before my eyes, whilst I stood helpless, the dark forms of my pursuers moving swiftly to surround me. It is curious how our minds work on odd matters, even when the energies of thought are seemingly concentrated on some terrible and pressing need. I was in momentary peril of my life. My safety depended on my action, and my choice of alternatives coming now with almost every step I took. And yet I could not but think of the strange, dogged persistency of these old men. Their silent resolution, their steadfast, grim persistency, even in such a cause, commanded, as well as fear, even a measure of respect. What must they have been in the vigor of their youth? I could understand now that whirlwind rush on the bridge of Arcola, that scornful exclamation of the old guard at Waterloo. Unconscious celebration has its own pleasures, even at such moments. But, fortunately, it does not in any way clash with the thought from which action springs. I realized at a glance that so far I was defeated in my object. My enemies as yet had won. They had succeeded in surrounding me on three sides, and were bent on driving me off to the left hand, where there was already some danger for me, for they had left no guard. I accepted the alternative. It was a case of Hobson's choice and run. I had to keep to the lower ground, for my pursuers were on the higher places. However, though the ooze and broken ground impeded me, my youth and training made me able to hold my ground, and by keeping a diagonal line I not only kept them from gaining on me, but even began to distance them. This gave me new heart, and strength, and by this time habitual training was beginning to tell, and my second wind had come. Before me the ground rose slightly. I rushed up the slope, and found before me a waste of watery slime with a low dike or bank looking black and grim beyond. I felt that if I could but reach that dike in safety I could there, with solid ground under my feet and some kind of path to guide me, 
find with comparative ease a way out of my troubles. After a glance right and left, and seeing no one near, I kept my eyes for a few minutes to their rightful work of aiding my feet, whilst I crossed the swamp. It was rough, hard work, but there was little danger, merely toil, and a short time took me to the dike. I rushed up the slope exulting, but here again I met a new shock. On either side of me rose a number of crouching figures. From right and left they rushed at me. Each body held a rope. The cordon was nearly complete. I could pass on neither side, and the end was near. There was only one chance, and I took it. I hurled myself across the dike, and escaping out of the very clutches of my foes, threw myself into the stream. At any other time I should have thought that water foul and filthy, but now it was as welcome as the most crystal stream to the parched traveller. It was a highway of safety. My pursuers rushed after me. Had only one of them held the rope, it would have been all up with me, for he could have entangled me before I had time to swim a stroke. But the many hands holding it embarrassed and delayed them, and when the rope struck the water I heard the splash well behind me. A few minutes' hard swimming took me across the stream. Refreshed with the immersion and encouraged by the escape, I climbed the dike in comparative gaiety of spirits. From the top I looked back. Through the darkness I saw my assailants scattering up and down along the dike. The pursuit was evidently not ended, and again I had to choose my course. Beyond the dike where I stood was a wild, swampy space very similar to that which I had crossed. I determined to shun such a place, and thought for a moment whether I would take up or down the dike. I thought I heard the sound, the muffled sound of oars, so I listened, and then shouted. No response but the sound ceased. My enemies had evidently got a boat of some kind. As they were on the upside of me I took the down path and began to run. As I passed to the left of where I had entered the water I heard several splashes, soft and stealthy, like the sound a rat makes as he plunges into the stream, but vastly greater. And as I looked I saw the dark sheen of the water broken by the ripples of several advancing heads. Some of my enemies were swimming the stream also. And now behind me, up the stream, the silence was broken by the quick rattle and creak of oars. My enemies were in hot pursuit. I put my best leg foremost and ran on. After a break of a couple of minutes I looked back and by a gleam of light through the ragged clouds I saw several dark forms climbing the bank behind me. The wind had now begun to rise, and the water beside me was ruffled and beginning to break in tiny waves on the bank. I had to keep my eyes pretty well on the ground before me, lest I should stumble, for I knew that to stumble was death. After a few minutes I looked back behind me. On the dike were only a few dark figures but crossing the waste, swampy ground were many more. What new danger this portended I did not know, could only guess. Then as I ran it seemed to me that my track kept ever sloping away to the right. I looked up ahead and saw that the river was much wider than before, and that the dike on which I stood fell quite away, and beyond it was another stream on whose near bank I saw some of the dark forms now across the marsh. I was on an island of some kind. My situation was now indeed terrible, for my enemies had hemmed me in on every side. Behind came the quickening roll of the oars, as though my pursuers knew that the end was close. Around me on every side was desolation. There was not a roof or light, as far as I could see. Far off to the right rose some dark mass, but what it was I knew not. For a moment I paused to think what I should do, not for more, for my pursuers were drawing closer. Then my mind was made up, 
I slipped down the bank and took to the water. I struck out straight ahead, so as to gain the current by clearing the backwater of the island, for such I presume it was, when I had passed into the stream. I waited till a cloud came driving across the moon and leaving all in darkness. Then I took off my hat and laid it softly on the water, floating with the stream, and a second after dived to the right and struck out under water with all my might. I was, I suppose, half a minute under water, and when I rose came up as softly as I could, and turning looked back. There went my light brown hat floating merrily away. Close behind it came a rickety old boat, driven furiously by a pair of oars. The moon was still partly obscured by the drifting clouds, but in the partial light I could see a man in the bows holding aloft ready to strike what appeared to me to be that same dreadful pole-axe which I had before escaped. As I looked the boat drew closer, closer, and the man struck savagely. The hat disappeared. The man fell forward, almost out of the boat. His comrades dragged him in, but without the axe, and then as I turned with all my energies bent on reaching the further bank, I heard the fierce whirr of the muttered, Sacre! which marked the anger of my baffled pursuers. That was the first sound I had heard from human lips during all this dreadful chase, and, full as it was of menace and danger to me, it was a welcome sound, for it broke that awful silence which shrouded and appalled me. It was as though an overt sign that my opponents were men and not ghosts, and that with them I had, at least, the chance of a man, though but one against many. But now that the spell of silence was broken, the sounds came thick and fast. From boat to shore, and back from shore to boat, came quick question and answer, all in the fiercest whispers. I looked back, a fatal thing to do, for in the instant someone caught sight of my face, which showed white on the dark water, and shouted. Hands pointed to me, and in a moment or two the boat was under way, and following hard after me. I had but a little way to go, but quicker and quicker came the boat after me. A few more strokes, and I would be on shore, but I felt the oncoming of the boat, and expected each second to feel the crash of an oar or other weapon on my head. Had I not seen that dreadful axe disappear in the water, I do not think that I could have won the shore. I heard the muttered curses of those not rowing, and the labored breath of the rowers. With one supreme effort for life or liberty, I touched the bank and sprang up it. There was not a single second to spare, for hard behind me the boat grounded and several dark forms sprang after me. I gained the top of the dike and, keeping to the left, ran on again. The boat put off and followed down the stream. Seeing this, I feared danger in this direction, and quickly turning, ran down the dike on the other side and after passing a short stretch of marshy ground gained a wild, open, flat country, and sped on. Still behind me came on my relentless pursuers. Far away, below me, I saw the same dark mass as before, but now grown closer and greater. My heart gave a great thrill of delight, for I knew that it must be the fortress of Bicetra, and with new courage I ran on. I had heard that between each and all of the protecting forts of Paris there are strategic ways, deep sunk roads, where soldiers marching should be sheltered from an enemy. I knew that if I could gain this road I would be safe, but in the darkness I could not see any sign of it, so in blind hope of striking it I ran on. Presently I came to the edge of a deep cut and found that down below me ran a road guarded on each side by a ditch of water, fenced on either side by a straight high wall. Getting fainter and dizzier I ran on. The ground got more broken, more and more still, till I staggered and fell and rose again, and ran on in the blind anguish of the hunted. Again the thought of Alice nerved me. I would not be lost and wreck her life 
I would fight and struggle for life to the bitter end. With a great effort I caught the top of the wall. As, scrambling like a catamount, I drew myself up, I actually felt a hand touch the sole of my foot. I was now on a sort of causeway, and before me I saw a dim light. Blind and dizzy, I ran on, staggered and fell, rising, covered with dust and blood. Halt, la! The words sounded like a voice from heaven. A blaze of light seemed to enwrap me, and I shouted with joy. Que le va! The rattle of musketry, the flash of steel before my eyes. Instinctively, I stopped, though close behind me came a rush of my pursuers. Another word or two, and out from a gateway poured, as it seemed to me, a tide of red and blue, as the guard turned out. All around seemed blazing with light, and the flash of steel, the clink and rattle of arms, and the loud, harsh voices of command. As I fell forward, utterly exhausted, a soldier caught me. I looked back in dreadful expectation and saw the mass of dark forms disappearing into the night. Then I must have fainted. When I recovered my senses, I was in the guard-room. They gave me a brandy, and after a while I was able to tell them something of what had passed. Then a commissary of police appeared, apparently out of the empty air, as is the way of the Parisian police officer. He listened attentively, and then had a moment's consultation with the officer in command. Apparently they were agreed, for they asked me if I were ready now to come with them. "'Where to?' I asked, rising to go. "'Back to the dust heaps. We shall, perhaps, catch them yet.' "'I shall try,' said I. He eyed me for a moment keenly, and said suddenly, would you like to wait a while, or till to-morrow, young Englishman?" This touched me to the quick, as perhaps he intended, and I jumped to my feet. "'Come now,' I said, "'now, now! An Englishman is always ready for his duty!' The commissary was a good fellow, as well as a shrewd one. He slapped my shoulder kindly. "'Brave garçon,' he said, "'forgive me but I knew what you would do most good. The guard is ready. Come!" And so, passing right through the guard-room and through a long vaulted passage, we were out into the night. A few of the men in front had powerful lanterns. Through courtyards and down a sloping way we passed out through a low archway to a sunken road, the same that I had seen in my flight. The order was given to get at the double, and with a quick, springing stride, half run, half walk, the soldiers went swiftly along. I felt my strength renewed again. Such is the difference between hunter and hunted. A very short distance took us to a low-lying pontoon bridge across the stream, and evidently very little higher up than I had struck it. Some effort had evidently been made to damage it, for the ropes had all been cut and one of the chains had been broken. I heard the officer say to the commissary, "'We are just in time. A few more minutes, and they would have destroyed the bridge. Forward, quicker still!' And on we went. Again we reached a pontoon on the winding stream. As we came up, we heard the hollow boom of the metal drums as the efforts to destroy the bridge was again renewed. A word of command was given, and several men raised their rifles. "'Fire!' a volley rang out. There was a muffled cry, and the dark forms disappeared. But the evil was done, and we saw the far end of the pontoon swing into the stream. This was a serious delay, and it was nearly an hour before we had renewed ropes and restored the bridge sufficiently to allow us to cross. We renewed the chase. Quicker! quicker we went toward the dust heaps. After a time we came to a place that I knew. There were the remains of a fire, a few smoldering wood ashes still cast a red glow, but the bulk of the ashes were cold. I knew the site of the hut and the hill behind it up which I had rushed, 
and in the flickering glow the eyes of the rats still shone with a sort of phosphorescence. The commissary spoke a word to the officer, and he cried, Halt! The soldiers were ordered to spread around and watch, and then we commenced to examine the ruins. The commissary himself began to lift away the charred boards and rubbish. These the soldiers took and piled together. Presently he started back, then bent down, and rising beckoned me. See, he said. It was a gruesome sight. There lay a skeleton face downwards, a woman by the lines, an old woman by the coarse fibre of the bone. Between the ribs rose a long spike-like dagger made from a butcher's sharpening knife, its keen point buried in the spine. "'You will observe,' said the commissary to the officer, and to me as he took out his notebook, "'that the woman must have fallen on her dagger. The rats are many here. See, their eyes glistening among that heap of bones. And you will also notice—' I shuddered as he placed his hand on the skeleton. That but little time was lost by them, for the bones are scarcely cold. There was no other sign of any one near, living or dead. And so, deploying again into line, the soldiers passed on. Presently we came to the hut made of the old wardrobe. We approached. In five of the six compartments was an old man sleeping sleeping so soundly that even the glare of the lanterns did not wake them. Old and grim and grizzled they looked, with their gaunt, wrinkled, bronzed faces and their white mustaches. The officer called out harshly and loudly a word of command, and in an instant each one of them was on his feet before us and standing at attention. "'What do you hear?' "'We sleep,' was the answer. "'Where are the other chiffoniers?' asked the commissary. "'Gone to work.' "'And you?' "'We are on guard.' "'Peste!' laughed the officer grimly, as he looked at the old men one after the other in the face, and added with cool, deliberate cruelty, "'Asleep on duty. Is this the manner of the old guard? No wonder, then, a Waterloo!' By the gleam of the lantern I saw the grim old faces grow deadly pale, and almost shuddered at the look in the eyes of the old men as the laugh of the soldiers echoed the grim pleasantry of the officer. I felt in that moment that I was in some measure avenged. For a moment they looked as if they would throw themselves on the taunter, but years of their life had schooled them and they remained still. "'You are but five said the commissary. Where is the sixth? The answer came with a grim chuckle. E is there, and the speaker pointed to the bottom of the wardrobe. He died last night. You won't find much of him. The burial of the rats is quick. The commissary stooped and looked in. Then he turned to the officer and said calmly, We may as well go back. No trace here now, nothing to prove that man was the one wounded by your soldier's bullets. Probably they murdered him to cover up the trace. See, again he stooped and placed his hands on the skeleton. The rats wear quickly, and they are many. These bones are warm. I shuddered, and so did many more of those around me. Farm, said the officer and so in marching order, with the lanterns swinging in front and the manacled veterans in the midst, with steady tramp we took ourselves out of the dust heaps and turned backward to the fortress of Bicetra. My year of probation has long since ended, and Alice is my wife. But when I look back upon that trying twelve-month, one of the most vivid incidents that memory recalls is that associated with my visit to the city of dust. The End of The Burial of the Rats by Bram Stoker